Hey, can I welcome you to the meeting of the uh, Fogel Council's Planning Committee held this morning in the municipal chambers? And uh, can I ask if there are any apologies? Thank you, convener. No apologies have been submitted. Okay, that's, that's good. Can I formally welcome the uh, Councillor Goldie and Councillor Noah to the, the, the planning committee? Uh, the uh, oh, both of us is, is, is constructors is uh, the two that replace uh, Councillor Bissa and the uh, Councillor Bissa and the uh, Councillor Coombs. And the, no problem. The uh, Councillor Coombs and Councillor Bissett were very good contributors to, to the debate, and uh, I'm sure you'll do, do this as well, uh, Mr Goldie and also Mr Nemo. The uh, item 4 is the, uh, sorry, the item C is declaration of interest. Is there any declarations of interest? None intimated. Yeah, item four is the minutes of the meeting of the committee held on the 17th of March 2020. The uh, I've got a fuller statement to make uh, with regards to the uh, previous discussion in relation to the, uh, the manual works application has been submitted. I'll make that come that item on the agenda. Can we agree a minute? Great. Yes, hand up, Mr. Lightwood. Yeah, can I could have a quick question on P71. Uh, this was agreed and minded to grant planning permission in principle subject to certain conditions. I just wonder where we are with these conditions. We haven't seen anything come through the determined list that the, the, the application has been finally granted. Uh, Bernard? You can just bear with me, convener. I'm just getting my papers up in front of me. For instance, in relation to the application at uh, Brayface Road at Bank Knock, um, that's still outstanding. It's not been uh, a decision hasn't been issued yet, uh, so those matters are still to be resolved. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, can we move on to item five? There's a convener. This this application is um, for the erection of a outbuilding and hard standing at Garvold House, Fankerton Denny, uh, for Mr. and Mrs. M. Masterton. Uh -huh. The, uh, is this one of the applications we have a delegation for? There's a number of applications that we have. Yeah, convener, we've got um, Mr. Forster's on the call and Mrs. Bond, they're both the objectors. They've got, they are neighbours and they have, uh, one of them had laptop issues, so they're going to share the same laptop. So Mr. Forster um, is first and then Mrs. Bond. And we also have Andrew Benny, who's the agent for the applicant for this item. He's on the call as well with his client, um, Mr. Masterton. Okay, well, it's, it's normal practice to, to hear the, the objectors first, if the committee agrees. Yeah, uh, Councillor Can I maybe just raise a, a general point before we, we go any further? Uh, that includes item five, which we're discussing at the at the moment. But I, I noticed from a number of the, the applications that there's no community council involvement. Now, I'm just obviously conscious of the predicament we're in with uh, having to deal with everything online. Were the community councils consulted by email? Uh, I know that all the information would be put on the council website, but if it was done by email to the community council chairs or secretaries, do we have read receipts? For these emails so that we know that it was actually received because there's no response to five of these applications from community councils. I'm just conscious that there's something about a problem. That's a fair point. The uh anyone got an answer? Rina, can I come in on that point? So it's Bernard Whittle. Um, just to yeah. clarify that um the community councils all do receive notification 
of the, the list of applications. And it's then uh, the onus is on the community councils to advise us whether they wish to be consulted on applications. Um, I would say it's not unusual uh, that very often we don't receive comments back from community councils on applications. Um, you'll see that this application has been in a wee while. Um, and obviously, if there had been concerns raised, I would have anticipated that uh, the community council would have been in touch to, to raise uh, that issue that they weren't aware of applications. And certainly that's not, not something I'm aware of as a, as a general issue. Uh, so, in short, uh, yes, community councils are made aware of applications and the onus is, is on them uh, to, to advise whether they wish to uh, consult or comment or seek further information. Thanks for that, Bernard. But are they consulted by email in the circumstances? They are. As, as prior to, to lockdown, in fact, um, community councils were consulted electronically. Do we get read receipts for these emails? Uh, I, I'm not aware that we do, no. Okay, thank uh, you. But obviously, they do provide contact details, and uh, it's for them to, to make sure that their, their contact details are, are kept up to date. Thanks, Bernard. Thanks, Convener. Okay, thank you. The uh, item six by five is the election of the building. Uh, is the committee happy to hear the delegation that's been with? Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, we have, sorry, the, uh, wait in the wings. Mr. Thornton. Yeah, Thornton. Thornton. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's right, convener. And just to let you know, Mr. Forster has sent me uh, some information. He would like me to email out. Um, I'll await instructions from you whether yeah. you agree for me to do that. Okay, it's Mr. Forster and Ms. Who's the second objector? It's Mrs. Bond, convener. Vaughan. <coughs> Mr. Forster and Mrs. Vaughan, the can you hear me? Hello, Mr. Forster, Ms. Vaughan, can you hear me? I think Mr. Forster's on mute. Sorry, I didn't realise that was like that. It's okay, it catches us all. Mr. Forster? Yes. The, uh, yourself and, and uh, your, your fellow objector, uh -huh. you have. Ten minutes is the main objector. Uh, your, your, your colleague will have nine. Uh, sorry, five minutes. Uh, the uh, so you want to nominate between yourselves who's going to be the the, the senior uh, objector, main objector. Sorry, I don't understand. Can you explain that? Okay, normally for a delegation, for one delegation, they, they get ten minutes uh, to state a case and then. There's 10 minutes of questions from the members of the committee. Right. Uh, if there's more than one objector, then we uh, have uh, an issue of selection of who the main objector is. And he gets 10 minutes or she gets 10 minutes, with the, the subsequent objectors getting five. So it's purely a, a question of the balance in, in terms of the debate. Okay. So that, that would be me. Okay, thank you. You have the floor. Uh, Karen has information and uh, photos, and can she be permi permitted to, to send them? Boris, uh, I think you're about to say you, you can hear. I can't, very, very dull hearing. Could you maybe get closer to, to the microphone and uh... Yeah, say again, Mr. Foster. Sorry, uh, Karen has information and in, uh, photos uh, she's got ready to send. Can uh -huh. she send them, please? Yes, Karen. Yes, convener, I'll um, just do that. Um, I'll also send them on to you as well, Mr. Bennett, because obviously the agent hasn't seen these as well. 
Um, there's two documents and two photographs and the other documents, just a CV of the person who wrote a report. I don't know if the committee might want five minutes to read these. Yeah, well, if we get them up on the screen, then we can decide that. I've sent them by way of email convener. I can share mm -hmm. uh, share some of them on screen if that's easier, but it's possibly easier to just read the, the emails. Uh, um, uh, David, could I say that uh, I have neither my council phone nor my laptop with me? Uh, and really, I would need to see them on the screen. There's no way that I could uh, readily see them. Fair enough. The, uh, it's possible to get them up on screen, Carmel. Uh, yeah, can be. I'll need to show them one at a time. If Mr. Forster can maybe tell me which one he wants that he's referring to, because there's obviously. Uh, it's the Badger one. Sorry, Mr. Forster. The Badger. Badger. Oh, right. Okay. Yep. I'm it's sorry. I don't know what's wrong with the microphone. It's okay. You just. Is Darren, can I ask if it could be emailed as well so that the councillors can look at them at their, their leisure, as it were? Yeah, it has been. That's it been emailed out to everyone. That's brilliant. Thank you. Is this the one, Mr. Forster, you wish on the screen? I kind of see it on the screen. And Karen, it's Ian. That at the moment, all I can see is your home screen. All right, okay. <laughs> Is that Ian? That's yeah. a document now by Ironside Farrer. No, sorry, that's not it. It's the email I sent this morning, which okay, is okay. Just bear with me. Okay. 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 Sorry, just to clarify, am I on the ten minutes at the moment, or the? Sorry, who was that last part? Of? I'm saying, am I now being timed? Uh, no, I think we've got a discussion here. Right, well, thank you. Just bear with me, convener. I just got this email this morning. I'm just going to change it into a document so you're not trying to read it from my uh, email. Okay. It will just take a second or two. Ian, can you read that? Okay. No. It's, it's very small, Karen, although I think the correct approach is to screen share at the moment in the interest of openness and transparency so that all parties are aware of what the document is. So we'll manage to put it on one screen. That That's significantly clearer, Karen. Thank you. Mr. Foster, you said you had some photographs contained within uh, the submission. Karen has them. Sorry? Karen has them. Karen has them? Yes. Karen? Yeah, yeah I, can, I can share those convener, but I can, I can only share 
one screen at a time. So I'll need to let right. everybody read the one that's on the screen before I share the photograph. Right. I'm not sure if most people are reading from their email. If whoever's reading this screen can let me know if they need me to scroll down. Oh, you, you've, you've got Councillor Nicholl, for example, who's, who's taking it off the agenda. Um, yeah, and... David, if it assists and um, you perhaps could bear with me for five minutes, I could go and open my laptop. Um, if it's providing. Uh, oh, do you want to, to do that, Malcolm? Yeah, yeah. It'll be it, useful for, for future uh, right, okay. applications as well. Right, okay. Convener, it would have been helpful also if this information had been provided prior to the, the meeting because there's screens of stuff here coming up on the screen that we're being expected to read through and we're just want, we're not able to do that. No, but what I would expect Mr Foster to do is to, to speak to the, 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 the photographs and the article that he's, he's written and the, the and and you know members can, can, can learn that way. Particularly if there's any questions the members have. Convener, I think it's a very good point that Councillor Nimmo brings up. If we had this information, we could have scrutinised it before we came this morning, and it would be more uh, beneficial to everybody, including the objectors and the applicants. Sorry, can yeah, I, I don't just disagree. Say, sorry, can I just say that it was impossible to get it to you before now? I only saw the badger survey yesterday afternoon. Uh, I didn't have any way of knowing what was in it until yesterday afternoon. Fair point. <laughs> Can we have a photograph? Have the photographs? Yeah, can we have no problem? I'll put those up. If we went up, we'll wait and cancel the nickel. That's not worse. Right. This is a first photograph convener. Oh, hang on there for for the uh, cancel echo. Yeah, I'm just steaming it up, David. Okay, with David, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, with you now. Okay. Mr. Foster. Yes. Do you want to speak to your, your submission? Yes, thank you. Uh, can I just say that the, the first photograph on the screen is actually sheds owned by the applicants. And you'll note the design features, the roller door and the metal siding. Um, but what I really want to speak about first is badges, if that's okay. <coughs> uh, so, can you show the the thing that I showed, uh, I sent, which Karen, right? Okay, I'll try and summarise this as best I can. I hope that everyone can hear me. I received a copy of the badger survey yesterday afternoon, and in that survey, it said that a survey had been completed and it showed that there was no evidence of badger activity or foraging in the development site. I knew this to be untrue, so what I did is I contacted Scottish Badgers and this suggested that they send uh, a registered badger worker who is Fiona Wishart, who was actually employed as a countryside ranger by Falkirk Council. Now, bear in mind this is one o'clock yesterday afternoon. So Fiona was good enough to come out. She spent a couple of hours here at really short notice. And she sat as she inspected the site and the surrounding area. And she's actually allowed me to take notes of her comments. She's on leave from this afternoon. 
uh, sorry, from yesterday afternoon. So she's on leave for a week. But she was happy for me to take notes of her comments and uh, use them today. So if you don't mind, I'll read her comments first. Right. What I've actually got in the report is Karen is an annual, uh, sorry, Fiona is an annual leave for the last, from the last evening, but she's happy to dictate these comments. Her comments are, the field is a prime foraging site for badgers and other animals. There are well-established and recently used paths from sets to the field. There are large numbers of paths covering the entrances and entrances to the field. The area of the development site has countless snuffle holes and is literally covered in them. It is obviously a well-used feeding area for badgers that is constantly used. There are many large holes in the site where badgers are recently dug due to the dry spell, which makes worms and insects go further down. Fiona is familiar with the area, the area, and that the badgers here are limited as to where they can forage uh, by the deep gorges of the River Karen and the Garval Burn. Just to confirm again, what she's basically saying is that this area shows high levels of badger foraging and activity, and it's an important part of their foraging territory. The, the badger survey, on the other hand, says, and I'll quote, there were also no signs of badger foraging within the application site, although evidence of badger foraging was identified approximately 100 meters away. Based on these findings, we can clearly state that badgers are not an ecological constraint for the development. In the Council's assessment of the public representations, it says, a badger survey accompanies the application and concludes that badgers are not a constraint to the development. This shows that the Council is relying on what is said in the survey and there's, there's an, what is relying on the survey that so there's no reason to refuse planning permission on the basis of the badges. If that's the case and the, the council is relying on the survey to say that there's no constraints for badges in the, the, that, the approval of the plan, if there's activity proven to be in the area, then the, the, re the reverse is obvious, that if badges are present, the plan should be refused, the application should be refused. Can I just actually read another part? I, I hadn't anticipated reading all this and I'm really quite nervous, so if you just try and bear with me for a minute. That the survey does not contain any of the following from information listed in Nature Scott's standing advice for budget consultants. It doesn't have the name or experience of the surveyors. It doesn't have the survey methods. It doesn't can include the date, time, and weather conditions. It doesn't say whether it in included any information gathered by the local record office. It doesn't have a map showing badger habitats and sent entrances to sets. And it doesn't indicate that where there are well-used paths in group territories. What I'm basically trying to say is that this survey is not fit for purpose. It's incompetent and it doesn't follow the guidelines laid down by Nature Scotland for badger surveys. Because of that, the council cannot rely on this survey to actually make a decision as to whether this area is suitable, is actually necessary for badgers. As I say, Fiona came out and she has actually said She's qualified to do badger uh, surveys. She's qualified as a level two badger worker. And she has, meant, she has confirmed yesterday that this is used very much and is very important to the badgers. Uh, so basically what I'm saying is that just on that alone, the fact that the survey is in incompetent and incomplete, it should be rejected. Um, sorry. I'd like to question the purpose of the shed. 
There's been two applications made for the shed and hard standing. For nine months, the applicants maintained that the shed was for horses and for classic cars. Five weeks ago, this application was amended. And, oh, sorry, I should also mention a caravan. It was classic cars and a caravan. That has been amended five weeks ago. One week later, after the amendments, it was recommended for approval. We weren't told, told about these amendments. We weren't even told the previous application was removed, uh, had been withdrawn. So in 10 months, for 10 months, the applicants have been maintaining that they needed this shed with a roller door and it was needed for cars and various things. That's now been amended to us almost fully about horses. They're going to keep feed for horses and whatever. The photograph that I put up shows two sheds that the applicants own already and they run businesses from. These sheds have metal sidings. They're exactly the same in terms of design as the shed they've applied for. Both of these sheds have roller doors. It seems to me that what has been suggested here is not genuinely for the purpose it's been requested for. And I, I really would like the council to come out. If, you know, sometimes, sometimes things have got to be sacrificed. Nature, trees, countryside have got to be sacrificed because it benefits a lot of people. Sometimes things have, you know, you've got to sacrifice countryside for things like hospitals, schools, that kind of thing, where many people benefit. In this situation, what we're talking about is badges being affected, ecology mm -hmm. being affected, biodiversity being affected, the landscape being affected. All of this is being affected for something that only benefits two people. There's 400 people over here, and we've lived here for 20 years, and we love the place as it is. We want to keep it as it is in terms of its ecology, its landscape. And I'm sorry if I sound a wee bit passionate. It's just I feel really strongly about this. I understand that, Mr. Foster. Mr. Foster. The, uh, I, I would really it. like, sorry, I would really like the committee to come here. I think it's absolutely vital to come here. Not for me. I'm 62 nearly. I'll not be around in 10 years' time. But there's people living in Denny, there's people living in Falkirk, there were 10, 12. They can come here and see this for the rest of their lives. And what we're doing is just going to throw it all away. You can. I also said we have two septic tanks in this field. There's two septic tanks. No one has told us how this is going to work in terms of the septic tanks being moved. Mr. Foster, sorry. I think perhaps Mrs. Vaughan could, could pick up on these points. Um, yeah, that's a uh, good twenty minutes you've had. Thank you. Appreciate a lot of time was spent on uh, the the IT issues, but uh, if you wind up, uh, appreciate that. Right. Okay. Hello there. Hi. Hello, Mrs. Vaughan. Thanks for um, coming out the opportunity to add some extra information. Um, the Marston, Dr. Mary Deborah Marston's report for the time up, uh, was sent to Karen. Uh, do the committee have access to that? Karen? Sorry, Mrs. Bond, which report was that? Uh, from Dr. Mary Deborah Marston, that was the report. Yeah, that's, yeah, that has been sent out to the committee. Great, just, great. Um, can I quickly just add, I know I've only got five minutes, so could I just quickly focus on some of the important points that Dr. Mar um, Marsden made? She's a senior equestrian consultant and has a PhD as well as a Bachelor of Science degree in agricultural science, management on animal behaviour and so on. She has a, a two-page CV and a full report should the committee wish to read it. Uh, Quickly focusing on some of the points that she made were that machinery using fuel should not be stored in the same building as stables for horses as it is a fire hazard. And the applicants were seeking 24 square metres for this purpose. Highly combustible materials such as hay should not be stored in the same building either for obvious reasons of fire safety 
and they were requesting 30 square metres. Um, any local fire officer would confirm this as well as Dr Marston's advice and Scottish Government guidelines. She also said that steel sheetings are poorly insulated and allow condensation and would not provide any natural ventilation. Timber cladding would be the preferable option. Uh, no allowance on this building seems to have been made for windows, air vents, grills or slats on the proposed plan. Hay or other forage dampened by persistent conditions, uh, condensation or insufficient ventilation will overheat and spontaneously combust. There is provision for a large single roller door. Leaving this open without sufficient air outlets would not, in Dr. Marson's opinion, provide sufficient ventilation for horse health. Um, she also remarks that the roller door is actually an unusual choice of door because it's impractical. Um, it's difficult to open and close fully while holding a horse. The rattle can be frightening and cause a horse to spook, leading to an accident. Um, in conclusion, she says, we put the paper here, that's basically end up, sorry. The summary, as she said, is the Scottish Government Code of Practice for the Welfare of Equidae states that welfare aspects should be considered when constructing or altering buildings to provide housing. The main considerations are the safety and comfort of the animals, ease of access, adequate drainage and ventilation. If poorly designed, stabling can contribute to the rapid spread of disease, causing injury and significant fire risks. And she deems the proposed building unsuitable for the keeping of horses, particularly in respect of insufficient ventilation and fire risks, which contravenes the Scottish Government Code of Practice for the welfare of equidae in a variety of ways. Now, I know the applicant has stated that she has owned horses for a number of years, but technically um, her horses, due to her Mrs Masterton's work commitments, have been in long-term livery bed and breakfast for a number of years. Um, again, we are concerned that 140 square metres in the future may be for uh, a future development. Um, our, our neighbour, Dr Hasty, who stays up the farm track, keeps five horses and he has them in two lovely wooden structures that are probably smaller than 140 square metres and they're more suited to the, to the environment. Um, I would also stress that uh, a site visit would be very beneficial because you would actually be able to see the site and maybe hopefully understand where where we're coming from. Um, can, can you just answer that particular point just now? The, I think it's an important point. Uh, we, we can't actually carry any uh, site inspections uh, because of the, the, the virus uh, yeah. the restrictions that are on us at the moment. Well, we were uh, hoping that after the 26th, which is where I think everything's supposed to get a bit better, if, if um, after the 26th, if, if I'll bring in Ian Henderson, the case lawyer on that one. Ian. Thank you, convener. Yes, uh, in terms of chief, uh, the Scotland's chief planner's guidance, uh, the view is that site inspections, and that would be a physical inspection of the site and not combined with a hearing session, but just purely a, a, a physical inspection of the site, can be carried out if the decision maker considers it necessary. Uh, that uh, the, the guidance also suggests that decision makers look during the coronavirus period to consider whether there are alternative approaches to familiarising themselves with the site, such as looking at plans, photos, etc. And it's also very clear that uh, any inspection of the site would need to be carried out in strict compliance with physical distancing requirements. So it is, it is possible, but uh, it's one that would have to be very carefully managed and it wouldn't uh, result in a hearing on site. It would simply be a, an opportunity for members of the committee to see the physical characteristics of the site. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Okay, am, I, am I able to add anything else or?
Unmute, David. Approximately 60 seconds to wind up. Okay. Um, a, site, a site visit would be, oh, would be essential if it were at all possible. Uh, Garvald Cottage and Redwood Lodge sit within 30 metres of this proposed site. Um, and obviously, if you could look at Dr. Marsden's report and everything else that has been sent to consider this application. Um, and the question of the septic tank chamber that is actually in the field or, and the other one belonging to the applicant. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for, for listening. No problem. Thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, we have a deputation from the developers as well. This one. Is that correct? Yeah, convener, we've got Andrew Benny, who's the agent for the applicant on the call. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, my name is Andrew Benny. I'm a director of Andrew Benny Planning Limited, and I'm pleased to make this short presentation this morning in support of the application lodged by my client, Mr. Mr. Matthew Masterton. Uh, before um, launching into the presentation itself, I must, however, express the some grave concerns about the lateness of the information presented by the two objectors this morning, uh, which provides my client with no ability whatsoever uh, to provide a, an informed, appropriate response to a number of the issues raised. Um, setting that aside, um, as is confirmed within the report of the council, by the Council's Director of Planning Services, this application relates to the erection of an outbuilding and the associated associated formation of an area of hard standing on land within the wider boundary of the overall land holding owned by my client. The building would have a floor area of 142 square metres and measured to its ridge would stand 4.6 metres in height and would be finished externally in green colour profile sheeting set above grey painted block work. A small degree of site reprofiling would also be required to create a level platform for the proposed building which would be set into the slope at the at the lowest level on the site and also to allow for the formation of a new turning area. This building would be used for the stabling of horses owned by my client and the associated storage of foodstuffs and related equine equipment and also for the storage of equipment used by my client for the maintenance of this wider land holding. The report by the direct, Pencil's Director of Development Services identifies that the proposed development requires to be assessed against the terms of LDP2 policies PE14 countryside, PE18 landscape, and PE19 biodiversity and geodiversity. The report also identifies that supplementary guidance SGO1 development in the countryside, SGO5 biodiversity and geodiversity, and SGO9 landscape character assessment and landscape designations are also of relevance to the determination of the proposed development. The report also sets out a detailed assessment of those matters which were raised by the two within the two letters of objection which were received in respect of the development. Having considered each of these policy and considerations in detail and having also uh, assessed also the matter raised within the two letters of objection, it is the Director of Development Services' overall conclusion that the proposed development is in accord with the terms of Council's policy, sorry, the Council's LDB2, and that there are no relevant material considerations which would justify the refusal of the application, and that as such, it is recommended that the application is granted. I agree, I agree fully with the terms of the Director of Development Services assessment of this application, and would commend the terms of his report thereon to members. And to this end, I would wish to highlight the following points. The scale, siting and design of the proposed development have been assessed as having, uh, as, sorry, have been assessed as not giving rise to any significant adverse impacts on the rural environment, with the design of the building being in keeping with that of typical modern farm buildings, numerous examples of which can be found within the surrounding area. Secondly, the proposed development has been assessed as not giving rise to any significant landscape or visual effects with the site of the proposed shed being discreetly located within its wider landscape setting. Thirdly, 
The size of the proposed shed is significantly smaller than many agricultural buildings which can be erected under permitted development rights and lies at a suitable distance from the ejector's property to ensure the safeguarding of the wider outlook from that property and also to avoid any significant or overbearing impact on this property. An, update of budget, an updated Badger survey has been submitted in support of the application, which can, confirms that Badgers do not present a constraint to the proposed development. And on this point further, I would uh, simply add that that particular updated Badger report uh, was prepared uh, by a suitably qualified, extremely well experienced ecologist, and I have absolutely no doubts as to the path made within that report, notwithstanding the points to the contrary made by Mr. Foster this morning. The proposed development will not affect or otherwise prejudice any existing legal rights concerning matters of access to either of the objective properties. And finally, having sought specialist advice, it is confirmed that there is no reason why a suitable landscape mitigation scheme cannot be prepared, this being irrespective of the presence of otherwise of drainage infrastructure within the vicinity of the site. I could I thank members for their time and listening to this short presentation, and I would be pleased to answer any questions which members may have. Thank you. Sorry, that, that concludes this presentation on behalf of my client. Thanks. Okay, thank you for that. The, uh, did members have any questions for any of the three speakers that we had? Yes, no more? Yep, thanks, Convener. Just a, a quick question for, for Bernard, if I may. Obviously, we've, we've listened to the, the two objectors and the information that's been provided. Sorry, Convener, it's questions to the objector and the Mr. Benny, not, not to officers. Yeah, that's a fair point. We, uh, although I will just point out, Mr. Nemo uh, has an experience in the planning matters. So that, that is technically correct, uh, Alan. Okay, I'll leave it in the meantime. Okay. Anyone else? Mr. McClucky? Yes, uh, it's for the objectors. Obviously, they say that the three households um, in close vicinity to the planned application, and one of the um, houses is got obviously stables ex um, already. So when the Badger survey here says that the barges are foraging all over the area, were there no foraging in where they built the their stables and that? Um, so that's my first question. Okay. Mrs. Vaughan or Mr. Foster, uh, can you pick up on that question from Councillor Nimmer? Councillor Bucky. Uh, okay. Residences we are talking about, this property is not down the farm track, it is a neighbouring property which is further away. It's 500 uh, metres from here. From here. It's, it's not down here. It's not down, the, it's not in the, this residential area of the three properties. I was simply trying to compare the neighbouring properties. Um, stables. Stables in to relation been, to what has been asked, to what is being requested here. Basically, so, the other stables is a really traditional stables and it's got six horses in it. It's got stable doors, it's wooden, it looks like a stable. It doesn't look like a commercial shed. The applicants don't have a farm. We keep hearing this thing about agricultural buildings. It's not an agricultural building. It's not this, actually to do with farming. This, yeah. Sorry, the closest farm that has a building like this is one kilometre away. There is no buildings like this near here. We don't have, we have traditional buildings that do not look like a, an industrial estate. Yeah, I think the question though is was, was with regards to the Sorry. attitudes of, of uh, badger welfare, right? whenever other other sort of under the way. We, we do uh, have yeah. a shed, but the, the badgers actually live underneath it. Yes, we have a shed. We, right. we have a shed, and the badgers live underneath it. It's actually badger sets under the shed. 
the swallows live in the shed oh. because of the, the slats on the front of the doors. You know, it's, it's completely different. It's a wooden shed. Anyone else? Can we, can we have another question? Uh, obviously, in relating to that, I just I just find it strange that, that that we don't want to build in an area where the forage and and obviously the objectors are saying that they've got barges under their shed, you know. Um, but that's uh, for for a different one. The other bit is um, there was questions asked about the validity of the the badger report um, yeah. and stating that the council officer has got a grade two qualification. And I would like to try to compare that. Have any idea? We you know because we're criticising one as as a as a council officer's got a grade two certificate, but we don't know what grade the the person who done the badger study has. Obviously, we've been told by the applicant. Maybe the applicant should should answer this. Um, what standard would we, would we expect from from that? Um, I in my past spent about ten years daily every day going out ferreting. And I'm an expert in badger sets, fox sets, and and rabbit sets, you know, because being there every day, every year of my, my my life was all over central Scotland, and I know that rabbits make scrapes the same as badgers make scrapes, and so do foxes make scrapes and looking for worms and other things. So uh, what I'm saying is, because somebody sees a scrape, um, it doesn't mean to say that or a run, um, because foxes navigate the same path and that's why these inhumane people used to set set um, snares for them um, and no, use uh, right. so I'm I'm okay. get to the question okay i'm asking the question that what what grade or what standard because it has been referred to has compared with yeah. the the you know the one applicant well, 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 we get the officer to, to answer that point uh, in, as part of as of her Presentation. Anyone else? Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, David, um, sorry, it was just to pick up. Um, I was trying to signal before John came in there. It was just a, a very similar question. Um, it was disappointing to hear an attack uh, made by the objective on, on, on this company. And my question, and it, it may be that uh, the officer will tell us more about it, but have we used this company before? Uh, and indeed, as John has already asked, uh, how qualified are they? Are they a, a well-known company? Um, as I say, it just seemed to be they're not here to defend themselves. Uh, and they um, certainly got uh, a sustained attack by Mr. Foster. And, you know, my sense of fairness says that um, we really should hear something on behalf of um, the, the company who did the original Badger survey. Okay, Mr. Mr. Benny, can you clarify that? If I could just say that the, the updated Badger survey wasn't carried out by the original company, it was carried out by ecologists uh, who were brought in um to provide the update simply because the original um company wasn't in a position to um complete that survey work within a reasonable time frame now corner ecology is a practice that i've used uh, over the last 20 years and i have absolutely no doubt as to their ability and experience to completely or to competently carry out badger surveys of which they've carried out numerous surveys on my behalf and I have to say, this is the first time um, that I've heard anyone question their work. Um, that having been said, the council in their capacity as planning authority haven't questioned their work. Um, what we're seeing is uh, the competency of that work being questioned by an unqualified third party. So I am not unqualified. And I would simply commend the terms of the report to committee this morning. Thank you. Yeah, point, point made. Uh, Nicole, you can yeah. have the answer you got. Well, yes. do, do, do the council officers have they had any dealings with this company before? I'll oh, ask them to, to, to outline that at the uh, when they make the report. Okay. Right. Okay. Anyone else? Mr. Blackwood. Mr. Blackwood. Back to the, this, uh, the, the Badger reports. We've got two. 
two uh, budget reports from two different uh, groups, and it seems strange that we've, they're, they're so far apart. I mean, uh, it's just unusual. You would have thought they would have been at least somewhere in the same line. Just beg your belief them. Who do we believe? Thank you. Mr. Um, all I would add on that point is um, the information presented by Mr. Foster this morning falls well short of being a professionally prepared budget survey. Um, if any credence is to be placed on that particular report, and in complete fairness to my client, we would need to have sight of what is being said uh, to allow my client an opportunity to provide an informed response provided by the college is appointed by my client to take forward the updated badger survey. Um, thank you. That's a fair point, and and I mean, I mean, I respect, respect both parties to, to say that their 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 badger report is a correct one. Uh, what I will do is it would, it would allow as uh, as members of the committee to seek advice from our own officials. Perhaps I'm not here today as a leave or expectation uh, of the the the, the position. Uh, is anyone else have any? Thanks for my Thanks, convener. I think uh, what we're uh, alluding to here with the different members and what they've been asking is that we're. I'm quite concerned that we have got conflicting reports here this morning, and also conflicting reports on the use of uh, the structure once it's uh, built. And um, obviously, the objectors ha highlighted the report from um, from. A Qualified, um, I think it was it was a um, marine and a, a biologist is some sort. Sorry, um, to say that the actual structure isn't fit for purpose for what what the applicant is claiming that's going to be used for, and there's been a, a change in the past. So I'm I'm kind of at the stage where we need to gather the reports. We've had a lot of extra information given to us this morning, and a. Uh, and maybe defer this uh, to a future planning uh, meeting because there does seem to be an awful lot of can I, can I stop you there? Can you you? Yeah, it may well be that would be the outcome, but at this point in time, the officer hasn't produced a, and spoken to, to the, the report from the council. Uh, can I ask in the applicant uh, exactly what this building is going to be used for? Sabini? The, the use of the building is as, as it is as specified in the application, which is for the stabling of horses, the storage of associated equine equipment, um, and put simply the parking of a tractor. As is stated clearly in the application submission. And can I just clarify from the objectors then uh, the as part of their um, statements that. They believe that this is not the case. Going by the report that they that they stated, you're on mute. Well, Mr. Foster, well, Mrs. Bond, you're on mute. Well, Mrs. Vaughan. Doctor Marsden's report, um, when has stated that no machinery using fuel or no hay should be actually kept in the same quarters um, as the horses. She said that the materials are unsuitable because of condensation, inadequate. The building yeah. itself does not show any means of um, ventilation um, for horses. There's no windows, slats, doors or anything. We have we, ha we do have concerns about its use. So I can I just say that if you look at the photographs I've sent, they're very similar to the shed that's being asked for. Photographs show sheds that are used for businesses. There's a variety of businesses. We're concerned that these will be used. Over 10 months, nothing about this shed has changed. Two applications for 10 months, nothing has changed. The same roller door, the same metal sidings, the same metal roof. They've insisted they've never compromised in terms of trying Mr. to reduce Mr. the size Foster, of the we'll, we'll go back over all ground uh, with us. Uh, I would like to, to end this session and uh, with yourself and move on to the next one, which is uh, officers.
So you can stop here. You're just under. Prior to that. I'll be brief. Can we not? Some of the council McHugh and uh, other people in the committee, as a bit, of, he says, she says, uh, we we'll have a report from a qualified ecologist. We we'll have uh, <clears throat> notes from a conversation with. Uh, a council employee, uh, it would be very uh, helpful if this information was uh, taken exactly from the person instead of notes taken from uh, a conversation. Uh, thanks, Convener. Okay. Can we ask the planning officer to 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 this uh, item and uh, give the report? Thank you, convener. This application seeks full planning permission to erect an outbuilding and form a hard standing area. Uh, Mr. Benny has already. Um, Confirm the, the size of the, the building, its height, the external finishes, and the proposed intended uses of the, of the shed. The application site consists of a portion of an open field within the countryside setting to the west of Denny. There is a small cluster of three dwelling houses and outbuildings in the vicinity. Uh, turning to the consultation responses on the application, uh, no concerns uh, were raised in those responses. The Council's Roads uh, Development Unit um, has noted there is no indication that the proposal seeks permission to operate a commercial equestrian facility. On that basis, there would be no increase in traffic anticipated. The Council's Environmental Protection Unit has advised that noise need not be a determining factor in considering the application. During consideration of the application, two letters of objection were received, and you've you've heard from those um, objectors this morning. Uh, the concerns raised in those objections is summarised in section six of the report, mm -hmm. and include concerns about impact on amenity and outlook, impact on landscape character, concerns about the design and use of the building and whether it would be fit for purpose to keep horses. And um, as, you'll, as you've already noted, potential impacts on ecological interests, uh, in particular on badges. The application has been assessed uh, against the terms of the local development plan and is considered to comply with, with, the, with the plan. Mm -hmm. um, the need for a countryside location linked to the rural use of the land is accepted. The scale, siting and design of the uh, proposed building is considered to be acceptable and uh, no issues were identified in the, the Badger survey report, uh, which accompanies the application. The material considerations in determining the application are the Council's non-statutory supplementary planning guidance, the consultation responses and the public representations. Those matters are uh, set out in detail in the report uh, before you today. The concerns raised in the public representations are assessed in detail in the report. Uh, in conclusion, the application is considered to accord with the local development plan for the reasons uh, detailed in the report. It is recommended for approval subject to appropriate conditions. Uh, and it is not considered that there are any material considerations to justify refusal of the application. Uh, recommended conditions are set out in the report numbered one to six. I just okay. further note there was a uh, reference uh, in, uh, by, by one of the objections in the deputation to uh, Fiona Wishart, who is one of the council's outdoor 
access officers um, visiting the site uh, yesterday afternoon. We had initially, um, or quite a while ago now, re uh, received some some comments from Fiona uh, in terms of this proposal. Um, her comments at that time were, uh, as long as the um, proposed development works were out with uh, 30 metres of any of the, the badger sets in the area, and provided that the necessary mitigation measures uh, were followed, that uh, the works would be uh, in compliance with the with the relevant laws, uh, which relate to the to badges. Um, at that time, she didn't raise any any concerns um, at uh, the loss of a a small area of the field um, for for use uh, for for foraging by the badges. Obviously, we've we've been made aware this morning that Fiona uh, carried out a, a site inspection. Yesterday afternoon, um, we've only become aware of that this morning, so we haven't had an opportunity. Also, bearing in mind that Fiona is now on, on leave, so we haven't had an opportunity to uh, to seek further uh, comments um, from Fiona um, following on from her site visit yesterday afternoon in terms of whether uh, she would wish to raise any further comments or uh, raise raise any any concerns in terms of um, what she. Uh, what she observed yesterday afternoon. Um, okay. Thank you, Camina. Happy to take any any questions. <clears throat> yes, the uh, it seems that no one is, is satisfied with the, the issue of of, of uh, budget budget provision. Uh, the the lateness of the the, the letter uh, with the other information from the objectors, as as, as wrinkled the, the the developer. Uh, or his agent, and uh, I can understand that. Equally, the contrast between one survey and another, as has rankled the, uh, the 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 uh, objectors. Uh, so I, I would move that uh, we continue this item to the next meeting of the council, which time we allow the Fiona to be contacted and Fiona to, to update their report, a producer report. Uh, at the council's request, and they they also give the, the developer opportunity to uh, consider in more detail the, the objections made by by Mr. Forster and Mrs. Bond. Yeah, of thoughts and happy to second that, convener, Councillor McHugh. You're on mute, John. I was actually going to say that um, my hand was up before Councillor McHugh, but um, as I say, as I'm happy, Councillor Blackwood has called in for a number of reasons, and as I say, so their questions still need to be answered. So we need these. Are, these are new information that's came up yesterday and we've no option but to continue to hear from Fiona um you know with the statement um, so I'm happy to move happy to go over the continuation. Anyone otherwise may need can you know can I move aside visit? Uh, uh, it was my intention to to, to because of the the, 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 the what the information was coming out today. Uh, to to visit the premises myself, but uh, can I ask our, our legal advisor uh, what the position is regarding the site inspections? Thank you, convener. I think as I, I mentioned earlier on, um, what what wouldn't be possible at the moment is uh, a hearing on site, but it is possible for decision makers, where they consider it's necessary. Uh, to have a, a site inspection and to look at the physical characteristics of the site. Uh, as I mentioned, the Scotland's chief planner has recommended that we look at all, all the approaches available that might avoid the need for site visits, but if it is felt necessary, it can take place, but it would need to be very carefully managed and it would need to be carried out on a basis that would meet all the applicable physical yeah. distancing requirements as a result of coronavirus. Thank you, convener. Yeah. We wouldn't be able to, for example, take the, the minibus. 
uh, north could we get tight enough in a huddle, huddle if there's any traffic uh, coming in the other direction, then uh, we can speak about the, the traffic. I think it would be the 32 uh, inputs into to this particular issue. I think it would be very difficult for the, the, the site inspection to go ahead on that basis, on the basis of what we've, we've had before. And the, uh, I'm in the committee's hands. Bernard. Thank you, convener. It was just to say that uh, we do have photographs of the site uh, and they this could be displayed uh, for members if um, if that would help uh, rather than visiting the site. Yeah, it would certainly help. It helped also for the photographs that were produced today. Uh, that can be uh, provided today if you wish, and we can share those. What I mean is, is June, uh, where well, this application has been considered. We can do yeah. that. Sorry. Anyone else? No one otherwise minded? Well, uh, I would uh, tend to agree with Councillor Blackwood, as we know that restrictions have been eased a lot for the tw 26. Um, it's not the first time that we've been out in sight and there's only been a number, a small number of people on the, the minibus, but we can get a larger bus. And as uh, Mr. Henderson says, that if we we ensure that everybody complies with social distancing, et cetera, I don't see why we should not start site visits again. I think it would be very appropriate, but that's, that's my conclusion. Thank you. Okay, well, if that's the general consensus, and uh, no objection to that. Mr. Murta. Con convener, can I maybe just make a quick suggestion? I really don't see any need for a bus of any sort to be provided. Can members not make their own way in their own vehicles? And that would save any problems in that way. Yes, that's a fair Good point. Good idea. Fair point. Can we not? Uh, sorry to, to interrupt. Yeah, it's just. Uh, uh, I, I've got a note here that we've got a motion to continue the matter to the, the next meeting to allow further information to be provided in relation to Badger activity in the Badger reports uh, yeah. and to allow the applicant an opportunity to consider the objections received. That was seconded by Councillor McHugh. Can I clarify now, is there general agreement that added to that would be uh, a, a, a site visit? I, I see some shaking of heads. I'll ask Ms. Murta, the, uh, she had her hand up. Uh, it's, it's useful, Mr. Henderson, sort of uh, uh, preempting my, my, my point and again to come in and, and support in essence of what Councillor Nimmo was saying. We did have a previous application where we, in effect, continued the matter and as part of that continuation, uh, members were uh, invited to go, <clears throat> excuse me, and and view the site at their, their leisure. And I know that that was slightly different circumstances because it was a town centre location and we were all able to kind of walk to it from, from the building. However, I think that in a compromise situation, if members of the committee are, are all comfortable with the concept that we, we go in our own time um, and that if we do need transport assistance, then we can ask the committee officers for um, a way uh, of assisting us individually in that regard, um, but that we find a way before the continue before it comes back to committee, that we will uh, individually go and, and look at the site and perhaps um, following this meeting to assist us with that, the officers could provide us with the, the pictures and the plan so that when we do go, we are looking at the most salient places and, and not missing any of that information. But you could contain that. I was going to suggest that that could be contained within your motion convener that we just continue it, but that in the intervening time, uh, we do so and officers provide us with information to be able to do that in the meantime. Yeah, happy to go on with that. Anyone else? Convener, could I, I just interject at this point? I think it's very unfortunate that a council employee went on site the night before she goes away on holiday or a break or whatever she is without putting a report back to the committee. This has been the confusion here. And rightly so, we, we must go on site. That's that's only about right. But there's a total confusion here, and the spanner has been flung in the works. Mainly, it's come because a council employee went on site, which is nothing wrong with that at all. 
But it's very unfortunate that if she haven't done that, she didn't contact any of her colleagues to tell her what to give us, give them a report on how they felt. And so maybe maybe in the future that that could be looked at. And just a general advice note to to uh, officers. The other thing about everyone going down to the site, and I, I, I'm aware of a site in, in the town centre where that happened, but there were people went in and asked and spoke to the the owner who or the applicant at that particular time. I always think it's best, if we're going to be going on site, that we'll all go together and then we hear, and if the applicant's there or the objectors are there, that's fine, I've not got a problem with that. But it means that we're all hearing the same information because if we all go independently it could come back that we've all got different ideas and what the information is so that's my thoughts on it Camina. that's your comment the i'm so, sorry mr benny but uh, can he bring you back in at this point it's, it's, uh, thanks for for a uh, determination is is now uh, any other members that's not spoken? Professor Bowes. Professor Bowes. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, I think I'll, I'll not go over what's been said and what hasn't been said, but I think it's probably fair um, to, to support what uh, Councillor McHugh uh, has put forward. Um, I have got a lot of sympathy with what Councillor Goldie has just said about um, individuals going. Um, and the only thing then that would mean that you would need to leave the site visit probably until uh, COVID is uh, allows, which could be a number of months, if not if not longer. Um, I I know we did the, the single one, uh, and I think that's probably the most practical. Uh, that, that you make your own way up to have a look. It's probably the most practical. I agree with Councillor Gold. I think that we that taking everybody on the their honour that the that we don't start to engage um, with, with somebody else is that, that wouldn't be correct either. But other than that, to, to take the site visit to a long uh, to be which could be six months, it could be nine months before you could organise uh, a site visit. As as I agree with Councillor Gold uh, in what he said. Okay. We summarise what has been agreed then. Thank you. Thank you. We have a motion to scale. You're on mute, Ian. Yes, I'm muted. Just pardon me. Pardon me. It seems to happen once every meeting. I'll try not to let it happen again. Thank you, Councillor Murta. Um, it was just to, to summarise that we have a motion by uh, Councillor Alexander, the convener, seconded by Councillor McHugh, and that was to continue the consideration of the application to the next meeting uh, to allow further information to be provided by officers on Badger activity and Badger uh, report information and to allow the applicant an opportunity to uh, consider the objections received. And added to that was that uh, in the intervening time, uh, members may visit the site individually and officers can support them with appropriate information uh, in order to, to do that. Uh, what I'm not entirely clear on at the moment is if we have an amendment. Uh, and that would have been, I think, by Councillor Blackwood, which was a request for a, a site visit of the, the committee. As I mentioned earlier, it wouldn't be possible to hold a hearing on site, so that would be to look at the physical characteristics of the site. But I think your intention was that the committee gather together at the same time. However, that's achieved on the site to, to see the site with officers in attendance. And I presume that uh, that was in addition to the, the convener's requirement in relation to information on the badgers and uh, dealing with the objections received on the part of the applicant. And I think that was seconded by the provost. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so I think we, we actually do have a division on that matter, convener, if, if you're happy for me to uh, take a, a roll call on that basis. So the, the motion was, as I've just mentioned, uh, the, the convener and Councillor McHugh's motion to continue uh, for the further information with uh, members 
being invited to visit the site individually and the amendment by Councillor Blackwood uh, and seconded by the Provost was the same, but the site visit element would be uh, on the basis that all members would be together on the site to view the physical characteristics. So on that basis, uh, Councillor Alexander. Oh, sorry, sorry, uh, Mr. Anderson. I mean, when I said site visit, it was, it was it, within the COVID rules, obviously. Which you, it, it, you, absolutely you really thank spoke you. about, you know, when it's just certainly a suggestion we do a site visit with a uh, with a hearing on it. I know that's not acceptable. So what I was suggesting was a site visit within COVID rules. Yeah. Right, thank you very much for clarifying that, Councillor Blackwood, and a note to agreement on the part of the province there. So it would be a site visit of all members on site at the same time, uh, but in a way that meets physical distancing requirements and compliance with corona, coronavirus rules. Thank you. Uh, so uh, turning to the roll call vote, Councillor Alexander. Provost Buchanan. Amendment. Councillor Blackwood. Amendment. Councillor Bowes. Motion. Councillor Goldie. Amen amendment. Thank you, Councillor Goldie. Uh, Councillor Hughes. Councillor Hughes. Motion. Thank you, Councillor Hughes. Councillor Kerr. Amendment. Councillor McHugh. For the motion. Councillor McClucky. Amendment. Councillor Murta. The motion. Councillor Nicol. For the amendment. And Councillor Nimmo. Amendment. So it's five votes for the motion and seven for the amendment. The amendment is duly carried. Thank you, convener. I'm not sure if you're on mute convener or um, just not talking. I was going to ask whether it was possible to have a five minute comfort break. Yeah, hang on, Member Sue. Yep. Agreed. Five minute comfort break. Agreed. Okay. Thank you. The request has been made by one of the local members to address uh, the committee. Unfortunately, she can't be here personally. She has written a uh, submission before the committee, it's Councillor Michael John. Uh, and they uh, also have agent for the grantee staff. Yes, convener, we also have deputation requests from uh, Nancy Wilson, an objector, and Colin Burnett, the agent for the applicant. Okay. Uh, uh, over here, indulgence. We hear the, the submission made by Mrs. Michael John. You Michael John first, and then Mrs. Wilson second, and thirdly the developer. Is that agreed? Agreed. Okay, but can you doubt the Mr. Michael John's submission? Thank you, convener. Yes, this is uh, a submission that's been uh, provided in writing by uh, Councillor Miko John, and I, I will read it out now. Uh, I write in relation to the above application. I'm sorry that I'm not able to attend the committee personally. While we are hopefully entering our recovery phase of COVID-19, with the importance of support and stimulation of the economy as a priority, it must not be to the detriment to the local community. At the time of building Central Retail Park, there was extensive discussions with local residents, particularly in Galloway Street, as the nearest neighbours and, and adjacent to the unit that is subject of this application. In order to take their concerns on board, there was careful choice of the types of retail, taking into account opening hours, delivery and numbers of anticipated footfall and assurances given to the residents at that time to limit the impact. 
Since then, we have seen the numbers using the central retail park significantly increase, and there has been an impact on the residents of Galloway Street as a result. The unit in question is one which is located closest to residential properties and just at the entrance to the park. And to be honest, if it was anywhere else within the park, it would not have the same levels of concerns, but I do not feel that this is the right location for what is being proposed. While there is no drive through planned, there is concern that should this be given the go ahead, that would be the next stage and would then further impact on the residents. The type of business that was previously carried out from the unit had a much lower footfall, open shorter hours, generated less deliveries and litter. Of concern to residents are noise, as it is planned to be open early morning and well into the evening, 10 p.m. Increase in litter, antisocial behaviour, increased traffic and potentials, overspill at peak times, taking up residential parking and disturbance that they are not subjected to currently from deliveries. Over the years, we have seen the retail park evolve with other food and restaurants facilities, which are located at the furthest points away from residential properties. We have seen a significant increase in numbers using the retail park and access in and out can become congested with tailbacks onto the main Grahams Road, as well as Queen Street Oblique Thornhill Road. While a coffee shop will not increase the traffic significantly on an already congested area, it will add to the number of vehicle and negative impact on our environment with increased carbon emissions, which we should be seeking to continually reduce. While this may seem like a relatively small impact, it compounds the negative impact on local residents who already have had to live in close proximity to businesses where rubbish, noise and antisocial behaviour are experienced. I would again state that I feel that the unit being considered is the wrong place for a coffee shop, particularly the extended opening hours from 8am to 10pm, seven days per week. <coughs> and would ask that the committee give consideration to these comments as part of their deliberations. Thank you, convener. All right, David, I think you're on mute again. <laughs> I mean, if you see anything. Mrs. Olsen, can you hear me? Are you waiting for me? Sorry, yes, Mrs. Olsen. I was waiting for somebody to invite me. Right, that's okay. what I'm doing. Um, you, you, you have 10 minutes. Uh, okay, thank you. you. have 10 minutes, then maybe questions from members. You okay, have thank you, Campina. Um, right, okay. I, I am representing representing the residents. Um, it's not myself as a, a single objector. There are 20 houses in Galloway Street and from those 20 houses we received 16 of our signed letters returned to us um, which we submitted. Now I understand that's gone into yourselves as a petition so it may look as if it's just myself that's objecting but I can assure you it's not. There's a lot of um, upset people, shall I put it that way, within Galloway Street at the thought of a food outlet, coffee shop or otherwise being situated in the vacant Carphone warehouse unit. <clears throat> we believe, and by the way, I don't have any document, documentation to evidence this, but we believe that in circa the year 2000 that there was a survey conducted and that the residents were assured that no food outlets would be located within that area. Our main objective, or rather objections, are the noise levels that will be generated, but we are more concerned about the traffic and the congestion that we currently have. And as Councillor Meeklejohn has said, that probably won't increase the, the number of traffic. 
But what we're concerned about is people will, and, and it's human nature, people will go into Starbucks. They will sit in the car park and they will have music blaring from their cars as they do. Now, this particular street, and it was before I moved here, um, fought long and hard to have the cruisers and the, the boys and girls who did the run around in their cars moved. Um, we're now concerned that they may return. We, we know as well, though, that Falkirk Council has an ambitious target in cutting carbon emissions, etc. And this is not, the, the retail park is, is not a healthy place to be, whether it's peak times or not. The cars and the congestion around the retail park at times can make it really quite difficult for the people within Galloway Street. And I, I noted <coughs> that, <coughs> excuse me, Councillor Michael John had said that sometimes there is an overspill and the agent for um, Starbucks has said or pointed out there are <coughs> 1,600 parking spaces within the retail park. This may be so, but we in Galloway Street are used as a private car park. Now, I've got a couple of photographs that Karen has that can put up to let you see what the parking is like within Galloway Street. And I know that's not directly a planning issue, but it's a residential issue and it impacts on our lives constantly. And <clears throat> there's also a safety issue involved in that. If um, the, the top photograph there shows from my location along to the end of Gallery Street, as you can <laughs> clearly see, that these cars are parked right on the end. Now, in the location to the left of that, as you're looking at that, there are two cars parked in what is a keep clear space. That keep clear space is there so that if emergency vehicles, or even the bin lorry for that matter, come along, they can turn there. There's no way they can turn. And if, if there was a serious fire in any of the flats in uh, Galloway Court, Life potentially could be lost by the time these cars were moved. The bottom photograph shows the parking of cars, and you can see the Carphone Warehouse building there. Now, these cars are people that are either customers in shops in Graham's Road or working in Graham's Road. There's only one of the cars there that is not a non resident vehicle. In actual fact, that photograph was taken some time ago. During lockdown, we don't, we haven't had those amount, uh, that amount of traffic. But since the the hairdressers, in particular, around the corner, wrong to earmark one business, but um, their clients park in the street and they can be gone for hours. It impacts on us all. We can't park in our own street at times. So, moving on from the photographs and back to the fact that we feel that Galloway Street is underrepresented at this time and that the, the council needs to do more to protect the citizens within Galloway Street. Now, I noticed that the agent for um, Starbucks or the franchisee has gone to the Falkirk local plan and has quoted from JE10 that food and drink uses will be encouraged to locate within commercial centres. But is it not the responsibility of Falkirk Council to look after the welfare and the safety of their citizens as well? He also quotes that Starbucks will pay or will be paying £3,000 per month in business rates. The average council tax in Galloway Street is 1600 It's actually over that. So, Starbucks is going to generate something like 36000 Galloway Street generates 32000 And these houses have been here for 131 years. 
And we, as residents, most of, most of these houses, in fact, I think all of them now are owner occupier. We spend a lot of time and effort maintaining not just our houses, but we also litter pick in the street, which is a constant issue in Galloway Street. The, the people people come from the retail park having purchased snacks or, or foods elsewhere. They eat it coming over the retail park and they drop their packaging in, in Galloway Street. Starbucks will be no different. And the other thing that I, I feel we're concerned about antisocial behaviour and the agent has, has assured that training would be given to the staff of Starbucks to monitor and to deal with any antisocial behaviour. I don't think that's their responsibility. Do you know the staff should not be putting themselves at risk to deal with any of that? There's also an assurance that the retail park security will be monitoring the, the situation. Are they going to be there from six o'clock in the morning to 11 o'clock at night, which was their original um, intention to open? Interestingly, that has been cut, um, I believe, to nine o'clock at night. But the agent has also stated that the busiest times for the coffee shop is between 8 a.m. and 10 a.m., 12 p.m. to 1400 then why do we need to open to nine o'clock at night? I don't understand that. And the volume of traffic that may not be generated by Starbucks, but is certainly not going to be helped by people coming in and out of the retail park. We can't get out of the retail, or, or our own street at times, so it's very difficult to get in and out of our own street. Again, probably not directly involved in the planning application, but it's still the environment that we are living in. And we as, as a whole in Galloway Street really would look to the council to look favourably upon our objections and to move the coffee shop elsewhere. There are other empty units within the retail park um, I, I don't know what the answer would be, maybe a one-stop shop, how about that, with parking for tenants and citizens in that area. But we just are adamant that we don't want this. We, do, we don't think it's going to be safe for us to have that there. And the other concern is that should this application go ahead, that then changes the class of that business. If, and it is an if, Starbucks decides to move, who then would come in to that area? Would it be a, a Indian restaurant or whatever? It would be open to any other food outlet. It's just, it's the wrong, it's the wrong place. It just is the wrong place. Um, I don't know this is not very professional, but then I'm just a citizen. Um, and we we are concerned that the the amount of traffic is certainly, the traffic in Falkirk as a whole seems to have increased of late. The infrastructure in Falkirk I, I don't know what the answer is to it, but the infrastructure seems to need some more planning, um, money thrown at better roads, circling the town or whatever, I don't know. But the, the amount of traffic that you sit in to try and get out of the street and through the town doesn't get any better. The emissions <laughs> from idling cars doesn't get any better. Ms. Wilson, Gallery Street have that all the time. Can I shake it? Sum up. Yes, you can. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your, your contribution. Uh, we have the, the agent for the developer. Yes. Um, can you identify yourself, sir? Can you hear me, convener? Yes. Hello. Yes, uh, Colin. Colin Burnett. I'm the agent for the application. 
and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to committee today. Um, Councillors, this application is primarily about investment and jobs. The existing shop unit has been vacant for over a year, and we're very fortunate to have secured a new operator in the current economic climate. The proposed operator is a Scottish company called Burton and Speak, based in East Lothian. And Burton and Speak have commercial license agreements with Starbucks Coffee UK to operate Starbucks coffee shops in Scotland. The company is an experienced and responsible operator. They currently operate eight Starbucks coffee shops in Scotland and are opening another four this year. The proposed coffee shop at Central Retail Park represents a £500,000 investment in Falkirk. The proposal will create 20 jobs, eight full-time and 12 part-time positions. This includes a full-time manager, a full-time assistant manager, two full-time supervisors, four full-time baristas and 12 part-time baristas. There will be no zero hours contracts. Martin and Speak pay national living wage to all age groups. Around 60% of Burton and Speak staff are under 25 years old. Coffee shop jobs are a great way for young people to get on the employment ladder and often provide a gateway to other jobs and careers. Councillors, this is particularly important right now because of the effects of the pandemic on employment generally and on young people's job prospects in particular. Committee, there's never been a more important time to secure the 20 jobs that this proposal will create. This is not a particularly sensitive location for a coffee shop. The site's been in commercial use for 20 years or so. It's one of the busiest parts of the town, right on the Grange Road roundabout, right beside the main access to the retail park, right beside Tesco and its petrol station, which can open 24 hours a day and currently open 6 a.m. to midnight. If this was a sensitive location, the council would have restricted the opening hours of the existing shop unit on the site, but there is no restriction. The existing shop unit can open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It could be a convenience store, an off license, or a Greg's or a Subway, for example, with no controls on opening hours. The proposed coffee shop will only open from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Busy times for coffee shops are 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. and noon to 2 p.m. So rather than increase the activity at this site, as alleged by the objectors, the proposal will actually reduce the hours of activity compared with the existing planning permission. The coffee shop will close three hours before Tesco and well within the hours when there is already activity in the area, traffic on Graham's Road, traffic entering the retail park to visit Tesco. To be clear, this is not a fast food takeaway. It is not a drive through and will not become a drive through. A coffee shop is not a use that generates noise, odors or antisocial behavior. The proposal will mainly serve existing visitors to the retail park. There will be no increase in traffic compared to the permitted shop use. There'll be one milk delivery per day and three or four other deliveries per week. Each delivery only takes around 10 minutes or so, and deliveries are made by rigid trucks, not articulated HGVs. Deliveries will only take place between 7 a.m. and 9 p.m. Currently, de deliveries to this unit are allowed at any time, day or night. There'll be two or three refuse collections per week at the usual times for this retail park, so no increase in noise. The operator will keep the site in a clean and tidy condition Litter is unsightly, unhygienic, upsetting to local residents and can deter customers. So Burton and Speak has an effective litter management plan involving litter patrols that is implemented at every site. Typically three patrols per day, 50 meters in all directions from the site with effectiveness reviewed and revised where necessary. Parking provision meets operational requirements. The roads development unit confirmed that parking is satisfactory. There is no evidence that retail park customers park on Galloway Street. That's unsurprising given the retail park has 1,600 free parking spaces for shoppers. If non-resident parking was a problem on Galloway Street, 
the council could have introduced the residence parking zone a long time ago. So in conclusion, councillors, the application has been carefully considered by officers for five months. It's been found to be acceptable by officers in the roads development unit, the environmental protection unit, and the planning department. It's recommended for approval by the director of development services, and I hope that you will support the application today. So that there's 500,000 pound investment and these very important 20 jobs can be secured and this prominent vacant unit can be brought back into active use. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So we, uh, do you have any questions for either of these speakers this morning? Yes or no? Yep, thanks, convener. I've got a number of questions for the the objectors. Uh, it was mentioned that there's 20 homes in uh, Galloway, Galloway Street. Now, I'm just wondering about the number of private cars involved with these 20 homes. On average, you're maybe looking at something like two cars per household. They've all got to be parked somewhere. Uh, I don't know if all these properties have driveways, whether they have off-street parking or what. But uh, I'm surmising that there's maybe a number of these private vehicles parked on the street as well. There's possibly an impact with commuters using the railway station who don't want to pay the parking charges at Grainson. They could be parking their cars on the street as well. And my third point, uh, convener, is just to try and find out if there's been any police involvement regarding parking in Galloway Street in the past. Thanks, convener. That's my three points. Yeah. Um, these, are, these, questions, these are questions basically for the, the, the officers at this, this point in time. Okay. Uh, I'll bring them back in uh, the, uh, once they've the, the moved the report and put it, perhaps we can pick up any questions there. Is it, was there anything that uh, the objectors or the uh, agent could, could clarify in the meantime? Um, if I could, uh, Councillor Alexander, um, yeah, some of some of the the people in Galloway Street do have two cars. We do have um, what, what is generally described as etiquette. We would park one car if there are two car families outside our homes, if possible, and the other goes on to the other side of the street. Most people are employed within Galloway Street. Therefore, the cars are moved during the day. There's, there's not many resident, residence cars in Galloway Street during the day. We do have, as you mentioned, people that park and go to Grahamston and leave their cars. We've, we've had in the past people that have actually left their cars in, in Galloway Street and gone away on holiday and come back and pick them up from the train station. We have people from Costa Coffee that park in Galloway Street. We have postmen that park in Galloway Street. We haven't had police involvement as far as I'm aware. The only police involvement that we've had was when two of the cars were broken into in Galloway Street. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you for that. Thanks. Thanks for yes, the answers, convener. I think that answers the questions I raised. Thank, Thank you. you. There's a couple of questions to the applicant. Uh, indicated it wouldn't be a drive-through, and also I also got the indication it wouldn't be a takeaway uh, service. But surely, if I walked into a coffee shop and asked for a coffee takeaway, I'd be uh, they, they would sell me one. That's one question. Another one was, is that the only unit within the retail park that you looked at as a possible venue for setting up your coffee shop? Thanks, Avina. Yeah, Councillor, um, in response to the question about it being a takeaway, um, the point I was making is it's not a hot food takeaway, um, which can sometimes be associated with amenity concerns. You're right that people can take a coffee away from a coffee shop, but it's not a hot food takeaway, you know, where there's <laughs> cooking processes. I know the resident mentioned that it might become a, uh, a, a some sort of takeaway outlet. That's not what the proposal is. Um, in terms of alternative locations, um, this is the only suitable location for a coffee shop um, on this site. 
uh, you've got to judge the application on the basis of its merits on this particular unit, not whether it could be located anywhere else as well. Okay, happy with the response? Yeah, thanks. Give you know. Anyone else? Give you know, I've really got a question. Can you hear me? I've really yes. got a question for yourself. And I'm mindful, of course, and there are problems in Galloway Street, and that's, un that's unfortunate, very unfortunate indeed. But there is a coffee shop just up up, <clears throat> up the road directly in line where the at the other entrance as you come in uh, from Graham's Road over the, over the bridge. There's a coffee shop being granted permission there. There was also a change of use to a coffee shop when uh, right on the corner, oh, I'm forgetting where I went to school now, but uh, in, in the pub right, right at the corner of Meeks Road, that's recently had permission. And it's really on the economic point uh, because everybody is always entitled to look after their own area. And it's admirable that people do that. And I, I congratulate people that do that. But there are 20 jobs here, as has been said. It's not a good um, projection for the Falkirk when the right at the entrance to the retail part there's an empty store. That's ju that just isn't it? Doesn't it look the thing? And it's just no handy at all. So you're basically when you're selling your economic responsibilities as well as conveyor of economic development. What do yeah. you think about the twenty jobs? Well, you certainly get more opportunity, the opportunity to hear what I, th I think about them. The uh, but the. Just, just, point, just, no, just a point, point could, no, just a point could be a, no, no, sorry, at, no, 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 no,
when people choose to park in Galloway Street because they don't want to walk from the retail park. That's that's the main objection to that. If the if the retail car park wasn't there, we wouldn't have this issue. Right. My my last point, um, my last question for for yourself, and uh, I'll finish with that is that the you also mentioned the category of the planning um, is different for a coffee coffee shop, so we need to amend that. That used to be the case for betting shops in the high street in Falkirk, um, but members took a decision to allow that uh, change of classification because the properties were all lying empty. Um, so what would what would be the preference for here? Because if they don't increase gay the jobs and gay um, let an applicant uh, do something in the shop, would it not be lying empty? Thank you. Yeah, and uh, I do I do sympathise in the fact that we are well we we give the impression that we're trying to block people getting jobs and that is not the case at all. We just feel that another use for that building would be better for the environment round about Galloway Street, Galloway Court. Um there there are other vacant units within the retail park and I don't understand why they're not suitable when there are 1,600 car parking spaces available to any of the units that go into the retail park. These jobs could be located in any of these other units, pure and simple. And, and it's, it's the idea that the the change of use, making it available as a food outlet, leaves it open in future for any other company to move in should Starbucks move out. I'd like to thank that, the, the objectors for their, their answers, convener. Um, as I, I say, you know me, uh, I ask hard questions for all applications, um, but um, it's no, no picking on the, the objectors. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Can I ask the officers then to introduce the report? Is the planning thank officer? You. Yeah, thank you, convener. So, as you know, this is application P20057 full. It's for a change of use from the current class one shops use to class three for food and drink use. Uh, that's for unit N, as we've heard there, in Central Retail Park, Falkirk. Unit is located at the main entrance of the retail park. Uh, it's a standalone unit uh, with main elevations facing towards Graham's Road, the retail park entrance, and the road that connects uh, towards Galloway Street. Unit has its own self contained dedicated parking area, and to the north is a small landscape strip separating the unit from Galloway Street, um, which is of a well established residential character. The unit is of a fairly modern design and is accessed by road, which comes off, as we've heard there, the main retail park entrance, um, and that road also serves Galloway Street. The unit is currently vacant, has been for some time, um, and it was last in use for, as say, Class 1 shops as car home warehouse. Um, it is, as noted, now proposed to alter to Class 3, that's for food and drink, and as we've heard, it's for Starbucks there, Chopper as a cafe. The application was called to committee by Councillor Meeklejohn due to proximity of residential and the adverse impact that that would, uh, could have on local residents mm -hmm. by uh, way of noise, increased traffic and litter. In terms of site history, uh, this can be viewed within the report. Uh, there's nothing specific um, in relation to the current proposal for the site. In terms of consultations, the Rose Development Unit was consulted and had no objection to the proposal. The Environmental Protection Unit was consulted and considered the proposal would be acceptable subject to conditions in regards to any plant equipment noise or any delivery times. Um, however, it was considered that in relation to delivery times, uh, this would not be reasonable to condition and therefore informative would be more appropriate and has been added to the report there. Um, in terms of community council, uh, there was no comment received. Um, in terms of representations, there were nine con uh, contributors. Uh, that includes one petition which had 16 signatures against the proposal. Uh, the issues raised can be seen within the report. In regards to Falkirk Local Development Plan 2, uh, the relevant policies relating to the proposal were policy RR. 09 Parking, GE08 Commercial Centres, GE09 Town Centre First, GE10 Food and Drink. The policy assessment can be seen within the report, and there were no issues raised in regards to the assessment. 
In terms of the material considerations beyond the local development plan, this was seen to be the assessment of public representations um, and considerations in relation to coal mining legacy. Uh, the assessment is contained within the report, and again, no issues were raised. Um, overall, the proposal was therefore considered to be acceptable and was recommended for approval. Uh, subject to condition. I would just like to add uh, to committee that in relation to the, the current unit, um, I would say that the current unit is looking to be changed to class three because it's to be operated as a cafe, obviously with people sitting in as well as obviously some takeaway element. The class one use, however, just now can still be used for certain food elements. Um, the likes of a Greg's or a Subway could operate out the unit. So it's, it is a commercial unit at the moment, um, and as I say, there could be still onerous uses, uh, more onerous in the cafe use or less, um, just depending what retailer could move in. And as I said, none of that would require permission under the class one. So the class three is specifically, obviously, because it is changing across to the cafe use. Okay, thanks, convener. Okay, thanks for that. The, uh, there's been a challenge for me to state my views and then tell a member to, to come back on them. Can I just remind everyone within this committee that the planning committee is non-political. It's not for making state political statements. It's for considering the the, the applications that impact on our communities, uh, either in a positive or negative way. And uh, so I'm quite happy to give my views, uh, as always. Uh, but uh, I hope it will be uh, accepted in, in the the manner in which they've given, uh, which is straight down the, the middle. Convener, could I just could I just say that that isn't a challenge that I gave you. I've no intention of challenging you in any way in your position, but it is reasonable to suggest that as you are the convener of planning and the convener of economic development, that you give a comment on those twenty jobs. That that's not a challenge. Well, is that Mr. your Yogi, responsibility, Mr. Yogi? This is this is what's a challenge and what's not. But the point is that this is the planning committee. Uh, decision, decisions are taken here uh, that uh, are non-political, uh, non-party political, and uh, which uh, are for the benefit or otherwise of the community in terms just, of the just, impact that they have. Thanks for that, um, Camina. But just for the record, may I place on the record, I'm not making this political. I have no intentions of making it party political. I think it's a very fair question to ask. However, if you didn't want to respond, that's fine. I've not got an argument with that. Well, okay, fine. We'll leave it at that. The, uh, in terms of the, the application itself, can, can members uh, of the of members of the council, uh, as well as officers of the council, recall a previous application on this site some considerable time ago? It wasn't on this site, uh, convener. There was an application for a uh, Tim Hortons drive-through, um, which was no, further no, to no, the before that, long before um, that. Well, be yeah, there were uh, many, many years ago. Uh, the retail park uh, would have been well before my time. Uh, they wanted to put in a hot food takeaway drive-through, I think, as well for a KFC on the site, which was in the past refused, um, as far as my aware. On that, they were they uh, basically older applications per site, but it's not. It would be a different class use. Um, I should clarify that as well. That hot food takeaway is a different class use from a, a class three use, which is for food and drink uh, use on the site. So uh, they are. It would if, if this was granted class three use, and someone wanted to operate it as a hot food takeaway, they would need another change of use. It wouldn't fall under the the current class three use uh, if that was changed to such. Yes, but the principle on that particular site uh, relates very much to, to the, the application. Yeah, the class one, what I was trying to refer to previous at the end of um, my, my short statement was that food and drink can still be used in a class one. It just depends how and the types of food use. For example, a Greg's, Greg's and Subway generally, because they sell the majority of their sales are cold food for takeaway. They can operate as class one, um, so it's the current uh, as a commercial unit under class one at the moment. So it can certainly be used for for food elements. That um, it just depends what type of food element, um, depending and it would depend which class it would then fall under. So because they wish to use it as a essentially as a cafe is the primary use for people obviously sitting in, um, it would fall under class three, which is food and drink, rather than the class one, 
food element, which is the likes of Greg's and Subway, because the majority of their foods are cold food for takeaway off and consumption mm -hmm. off-site. So, so the class one use doesn't mean that the, there could be no food uses on that site. Um, and as I say, class uh, hot food takeaway would be again a different class use because of generally because of the the, the various issues they have with a hot food takeaway mm -hmm. in terms of smells and um, obviously traffic and and usage. And what class classification would that fall under? Uh, hot food use is, is too generous, so it's in a class of its own. Um, yeah. so you... Okay, the, uh, the the issues about the Gallery Street in terms of the uh, the, the the population of Gallery Street and the impact that the vehicles have on the roads. The, the point that Mrs. Olson made with regards to the, uh, the the movement of people in terms of work during the day, sleep during the night. Uh, Gallery Street is a is, is valid. That uh, anyone who, who visited Gallery Gallery Street uh, during the day we would see a very different street from from the one at night. Uh, the uh, but the one at night is is the is the concern uh, with regards to this particular application. Uh, it would mean that, for example, that uh, that. Uh, the, the terminal hour of, of, of 10 p.m. that uh, the uh, as has been proposed uh, would address an impact on, on someone's uh, civic and right to 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 to, to live in a quiet uh, and non-contentious uh, environment. The uh, this couldn't be considered in any way to be quiet or non-contentious. Uh, the uh, there is. There's a, a, a major problem within that. It's been highlighted on a number of occasions, one of which was when the, the Tim Hortons uh, looked to, to develop the site. Uh, and when it comes to jobs, you know, if there's an empty unit, that's a potential for, for jobs. It doesn't mean to say that uh, the first the company that comes along and says, I want to open that, uh, is going to be the best company. Uh, for for the wider picture, which is not just the jobs, uh, but the uh, well-being of, of the, the residents, because if you look at the the application, the, the look at what's been produced by the officers in relation to the, the map uh, of of Gallery Street, you can see just how close Gallery Street is to to the. The, the, the site itself, and that has to be taken into consideration. Uh, those mental health has to be taken into consideration as well. And uh, if there is a nuisance, a noise nuisance, uh, then they, uh, it wouldn't be caused by, by the employees of uh, Starbucks, I'm going to add, but employed by the, 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 uh, the, the clientele. Of, of Starbucks, so I think that uh, this year twenty jobs is a slight red earn because Manchester will go out and they will try to to uh, locate and identify a business uh, that would fill that particular void. Perhaps we would hope in a more satisfactory manner uh, than uh, has been achieved to date. Uh, but uh, uh, with us. I've, I've no doubt whatsoever that uh, on the balance of it, the 20 jobs have to be taken into consideration, but the, the premises are still there. There's still the opportunity for, for the Manchester uh, to, to bring in someone else that's going to be more suitable uh, for, for the location so close to uh, houses. Uh, so I would formally move the rejection of the application on the grounds that Council uh, Nico John and myself. Uh, as two local members of the uh, of outlined. Anyone else? Uh, Councillor Kerr. Uh, thanks, convener. Uh, I take in good night this week what, what you're saying. And my sister, my brother in law used to live in Gallery Street, so I understand the the problem with the parking as they were there when the retail park 
was uh, Bill has already highlighted by Councillor Mafuki. If somebody's got a tax and insurance in their car, they can park anywhere as long as it's no causing an obstruction. So I, I take nice as what you're saying, but I didn't agree with what the first bit about the parking. It would be good if people left that street to the residents of Galloway Street, and I would be happy if that happened. But the law tells you if your car's taxed and a valid MOT and insured, you can park anywhere. So I would put an amendment that we go with the officer's recommendation uh, to grant the plan permission. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, convener. A um, couple of questions on this, um, uh, and this particularly to you, Stephen. Um, <clears throat> it says uh, there is no uh, additional noise receptors. Now, given it was used as basically a showroom, um, I, had, I think I was in there a couple of years ago. Um, um, now it's going to be used for, although it's not actual cooking, it, there will be food prep. Because uh, uh, obviously coffee machines produce, uh, I think most of us have been in and seen seen that amount of steam. So I'm, I'm assuming that there's going to be uh, additional ventilation put in, and, and therefore um, there'll be machinery handling that ventilation. I do remember we had an application further down Graham's Road, where I think the, I think the whole of the committee had actually asked about that, and they were concerned because it was close to um, domestic. Uh, th th there was a lot of houses uh, in the local area. Um, David had spoke earlier on about Tim Hortons, um, and I seem to remember the Tim Hortons in Stenhouse Muir, which is actually in a very similar uh, situation, and that it's uh, very, very close to houses. Um, we actually did put restrictions on deliveries. I think we even put directions. They, they had to come down uh, Trice Road Come in there, they weren't allowed to come along Main Street to, to reduce the, the traffic side. Obviously, I know you can't restrict the directions, but I'm sure there was. Um, it, may, it may have been advisory, but 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 I'm sure there was some information on uh, how how and where it was going to be. My bigger concern, and I, and I think Mrs. Wilson, who I thought did a very good presentation, um, uh, is about the littering. Now, I appreciate that the, the company are saying that they'll do a certain amount of litter picks in, in an area. Um, and we are saying that we obviously council officers could be there and um, we can take action if it's not happening. However, if it's, if it's happening outside the line of their development, I, what actual power will we have to go back to um, the source, surely that would be actually the public. Um, so, so therefore, I don't know that we'll be able to control the litter problem in it. Um, that 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 does give me a concern. So, if you can maybe answer the bit, but the, the first couple of bits that I did, and then if you don't mind, convener, I'll come back in after that. Yeah, there's there is um, proposed. To be in terms of machinery, um, as far as I'm aware, it would be two small condenser units for air conditioning. Um, but we have conditions that are obviously noise restriction for those, just like any standard equipment on any of the buildings, um, and to ensure obviously that it wouldn't affect any, any neighbouring properties there. Um, the Tim Hortons obviously in deliveries. Tim, Tim Hortons is a different type of operation, obviously that was proposed. Um, uh, so I can't really compare it directly to that deliveries. They weren't seen to be too onerous any of the deliveries, and we have put an informative one rather than a condition um, relating to deliveries, uh, because as I say, it wasn't seen to be uh, for us to, to be able to control in any great aspect, obviously. Um, and the deliveries that were noted by by the business weren't seen to be to be any more onerous than any other class one use that could currently go into the store at the moment uh, with that. 
Um, in terms of littering, littering is obviously something we take into account. We've asked the, the business, uh, I've submitted obviously details of the, that particular business that's going in, um, that has a franchise for Starbucks, has their own management plans for littering. There's not really much more in terms of for, for myself that we could ask for in relation to that, obviously. We have to expect that people hopefully do do not litter and when they do obviously within the zone of the, the building um they do have a, a, a obviously a litter control uh, management plan for that um beyond that I, I wouldn't be able to to comment on obviously okay so on the littering basically we couldn't enforce it anyway um but, but it's all good faith uh, and i appreciate that um I'm afraid that, that, that uh, and again, listening to, to Mrs. Wilson's uh, concerns in particular and listening to what the convener has said, um, I will happily um, second uh, the convener uh, in his motion. Anyone else? Mr. Blackwood? Yeah, convener, can I ask uh, Stephen a question? Uh, this is a class one shop and we're Proposing to move it to a class three, which is a uh, food and drink coffee shop. This application refused it, it will remain a class one. So, is that open to any uh, company along a fast food as a fast food outlet and would be given consideration? In terms of the class one use, um, it would just remain as class one um, if it didn't get permission today to obviously alter to class three. Um, you wouldn't be able to do a, a hot food takeaway because hot food takeaway is a, again a different class use. However, you would be able to use, do it would without any planning permission. They would be able to use any other class one use. So, in terms of food outlets, class one uses uh, within class one, you would have the likes of Greg's, for example, is a good one. Anything similar to Greg's, similar to Subway, these businesses all fall under class one use. So that wouldn't need to come to us at all to 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 have that. They could a Greg's or Subway could open in that unit without any planning permission, um, and obviously they could have all the same issues as uh, and beyond that a Class C use um, would have. So as it's just to, to get across to committee as a commercial unit at the moment, it's not it's not um, not within a commercial elements. So that there is all the same sort of um, processes and, and um, material considerations for a class one use essentially um, that could go into that that unit just now without any permission. So there's and a variety of other stores, obviously. You could have convenience stores, you could have liquor stores, um, all these fall under class one. So you could have you could have very it's been a car phone warehouse, which obviously was a lighter type of, of, of um, uh, use, basically, because of the, the way car phone warehouses operate. But again, of, as you know, there's many, many different types of retailers that all work in different ways and in class one. And as I say, it could fall in any, any business could essentially in a class one use go into that. And they could be more onerous or less onerous than the previous use that was, that was in here. Thanks, uh, Stephen. Can you hear based on that answer? Uh, I'd be happy to second Councillor Kerr's uh, uh, amendment to accept the officer's decision. Anyone else? Councillor McHugh. Thanks, Convener. I, I wanted to go back to the, the traffic side of things, and uh, yeah, we all uh, suffer from over parking, given the fact that families have two and three cars these days. But what I wanted to ask, I don't see uh, Mr. Steedman uh, here today. I don't know if he's here or not. Can we issue permits for that street? I was actually thinking, could we create a barrier to prevent uh, people getting in over a certain time? Is there any restrictions we can put on the street? And I was thinking a barrier wouldn't work. So is there a possibility of us then providing uh, permits for the residents, uh, resident permits only for that street? That's Galloway Street. Good. Uh, uh, Craig Russell uh, is in the meeting, I think, so he can maybe answer that question, if you don't mind, Russell. Yeah, yeah. convener, I can give some comment on that. Um, just just to give a, a brief outline, Russell's team 
Uh, Russell has two two sides of his team, the Rose Development side, which I represent, and he also has the Networks side that deals with waiting restrictions and uh, controlled parking zones, residence park permits, that sort of thing. So I'm afraid I don't have the information in front of me regard that, that would answer the councillor's query about residence permits. Um, obviously, the council does have a resident permit scheme at the moment. My knowledge is that that is only within a certain area in the Falkirk Town Centre. I don't know the intricacies of how that could be applied in in this situation here, unfortunately. So you don't know. I was just thinking. The That's right, convener. Okay, I was just thinking if we can some, come to some form of compromise here, because um, obviously the, the parking and the emissions and all that is a, a huge issue for the residents. But if we don't know, then I don't know if we can get that information or not. Thanks, Novena. Anyone else? Mr Hughes. Thank you, Convener. Um, looking at the, the report, <clears throat> um, I'm looking back at the site history in relation to the report. Um, first question, would I be correct in saying that the site history over a period of time there have been applications to move from a class one to class three or whatever, and these have always been refused for whatever reason. That was the first point. The second point I wanted to ask was that the retail park has been in existence for well over 20 years. And the, the class one has never been changed from a class one to a class three or any other specific class in the last oh, 20 years. So I was wondering when the, the retail park was opened and this area was designated a class one, were there any conditions marked down in the original planning um, remit when the retail park was opened in relation to the specific site? In terms of the Hasse uh, Councillor, there, as far as I know, there's not been any proposals for class three. There was a hot food, there was hot food takeaway elements um, that were at the very beginning. This is before this unit was constructed. Um, as far as I'm aware, the Hasse, the, the, the Hasse in the site was they originally planned for this that site to be a food element um, and to have a hot food takeaway like a, a McDonald's or a KFC or similar on that, that area of land. Um, that was that was well before my time. Um, but looking back at the history, it seems to it, it got diffused at the time for um, various uh, reasons. And then a class one uh, unit was put forward. And as far as I'm aware, it's just it's it's always generally been the Carphone Warehouse has been in it for many years and, and a phone shop before there. So there was never any attempt, obviously, until Carphone Warehouse has moved out and um the the retail pack have come as they can do, obviously, looking to alter it. There are other, other class three uses within the retail park, um, and the retail park, the permissions on the retail park do allow for uh, class three uses to be used as far as I'm aware in both phases. Um, there's, in phase two, there are actual class three restaurants, obviously, over there um, as well. And the, you've got um, the likes of McDonald's, etc. Um, over this site, obviously, they've, they've not had anything specifically um, in that that site bar a class one use since that unit was constructed. Uh, and now, obviously, they're looking for it to alter um, over. So it's, there's not been anything, as far as my way, restricting that use on that site. It's just been a matter of the way things have, have sort of been dealt out in the past and, and fall through. Can I ask him um, when uh, when this unit was constructed? I would have to go back and check that kind so I'm quite limited just now to some of the access I can get obviously to older files. Um, but it's well beyond I mean I've been with the council well over ten, quite a few years, over ten years now and it's well before that. Yes. Um, it was it was with the phase one section of the retail park um oh. that was constructed. You, you mentioned um, just just um, I wasn't sure if I picked you up correctly. Um, you were mentioning that in other parts of the retail park there was permission. Is that was that permission built in um, so that other units could change have a change of use? And 
where and obviously I'm trying to think here where where was the permission built into this phase one? Um, the what as far as I'm aware, the, the the second phase of the retail park unit, there's obviously been there's a couple of restaurant uses. There was Pizza Hut originally, there was McDonald's obviously. There was a I think a smaller retail unit got got constructed um, as a later stage as a class three. Um, over this side of the retail park, as I say, as, as far as I'm aware, within the, the uses of the retail park, there is allowance for class D uses to be ancillary to the main uses of the class, uh, you, uh, the, the bulk essentially uses of the, the retail park. Um, so it has, it, it was always intended to have additional, to essentially, food services for people using the retail park. I was just trying to 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 to, to tease out if there were. Um, restrictions built into the conditions of the retail park in relation to the different phases of the retail park? Not that I'm aware. I mean, I would have to check specifically on that, but not that I'm aware of, because as I say, class three uses are, are essentially allowed within the phases. Yeah. What I would say is that there was a mention of obviously some empty units in the retail park, but given these empty units are, are are very large units. They're not what you would normally um, use in terms of square footage for the likes of a cafe or, um, a, you know, a, a class one use like this in terms of the food uses. There, there's a couple of units empty at the moment that are very large units um, for retail use, really, for large retail use. Uh, so, as I say, it's it's not something uh, that you'd expect the likes of a, a Starbucks or similar to 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 go into. Um, as I say, the, the, this is what they put forward. It's, this has always been a class one use uh, since it's been constructed, this particular unit. But as I say, this is now what they'd like to obviously alter it. It's been marketed as far as we for over a year now. Um, and this is the first operator that's come forward for something to go in it. And as I say, it, we've, we've assessed it uh, given the current policies as the report notes. And from our point of view, it's, it has seemed to be acceptable for use as, as a class B. Yeah, I was just thinking that um, in terms of continuity of approach for the last, whenever the the, <clears throat> the unit was built, that it has been a class one, and um, by by use has been a class one, um, and uh, that was all I really wanted to to find out from you. Yeah, as far as we are, the current unit that's there and constructed was constructed as far as we are as a class one unit. And it's never been uh, looked to be changed from its current use. Right, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Convener. Just a, a quick question for Stephen, if I may. Stephen, with the, the central re par uh, retail park no longer being classed as part of the, the Falkirk Town Centre zone, does that impact on the, the, the usage of the units in the retail park at the moment compared to what it was years ago? Um, it doesn't. It doesn't create too much of a difference. There is now further policy we consider in terms of any impact that we would maybe consider it would have on the town centre itself. Um, again, from town centre first policy that's there, we didn't consider that the this would be too onerous on any uses within the town centre itself. What's classed as the town centre now? Um, the the current commercial um, basically use of this site, and now it's under a specific policy as a commercial centre, that again, the commercial centre policy does look to, to put uses such as class D use in the commercial centres. So it's, it is kind of guided by policy um, for, for this type of use, as well as the, the main bulk uses that are associated with the retail park. Okay, thanks for that, Stephen. Thanks, Convener. Thanks, <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Thanks, Kevina. And and uh, partly one of my first questions is to to pick up on that point. And um, obviously, we we all know we're assessing each application on its merits. Um, and slightly uncomfortable with the concept. Um, although we can kind of look beyond, you know, and look at particular material considerations with respect to each application, we're not making an economic assessment from the point of view of I I can't as a planning committee member feel that I have enough information to say that if, if so many jobs were here, like 20 jobs being created, if this changes a particular type of use. Um, but obviously, as a class one use, it also has the potential to create jobs. And also, we don't know if creating this particular type of use um, as a class three takes away from other um, viability of other class three units, whether that's up in the high street or within the immediate vicinity. So um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to make that point clear because I think that having, ha, it having been introduced uh, earlier in the conversation, it, it needs to be to be to be made clear in that way. Um, usually when we are looking at them, I mean, this is a, a cafe and I know that when we looked at particular types of use that parking does come into, for example, if you have so many covers within a, a cafe or a, or a hotel or any of these kind of establishments, there's usually a formula which says this is how many parking spaces you have to have. And though we're all aware that there are, uh, you know, a, a large amount of, of parking spaces within the a retail park adjacent has there been a direct assessment and forgive me if it's if it's in the report outline but i think given the discussion this morning it's worth asking the question in terms of the specific use of this if it changed from class one to class three the size of the footprint and how many tables there are etc uh, what is the assessment from officers in terms of the amount of parking space which is within that particular uh, area of that car park or is it just a part of the, the bigger car park that's consumed within yeah, kind of. So there's, there's, um, so there's six. It's got its own small dedicated car park. Just the, by the way, it's kind of been constructed in the past. There's 16 spaces directly at the unit, but the unit itself is part of the retail park, so it's included within the the car parking for that. And um, because the the, it's it is expected the majority of people using it would be using the retail park as well. Um, but the in terms of spaces, it's all part of the commercial centre. So the commercial centre itself is uh, counted as one. So all the shops in that are looked at, and as far as I'm aware, there's over capacity for car parking and the retail park in terms of what would be, be required through national roads guidelines. Okay, thank you. That's useful for that clarification. Um, Councillor Bowes brought up the the, the Tim Hortons uh, and the situation which which we have and we're very familiar with, obviously within our own ward up at Stennis Muir, and, and I recall that application quite vividly coming forward and. And similar arguments in that although there was a, a commercial centre um, established there and, and indeed it had been expanded that having, uh, albeit a, a different classification and a, and a hot food outlet, the particular location and proximity to residential properties um, was was something that we, we had to consider. At the time, um, and I, I, as I recall, you know, on, on the basis of, of those circumstances, I was very concerned, particularly about um, idling traffic and about the increase um, at that junction, which is was very busy and remains um, indeed very busy. And I think we're probably all very familiar with the congestion in Graham's Road and particularly at that time, the gridlock around that roundabout. Um, and my concern is that in a similar way, it's actually the, the sighting in that location was such a prominent, um, you know, uh, entrance point. Um, that although we we want to encourage uh, you know spending within our within all our commercial centres, um, that the impact that that will have on the traffic at that particular point, um, given that human nature will be that everybody will try and pile into that small uh, bit of of that car park, um, uh, even though you've got the additional uh, beyond that, I think I'd be concerned about the the backlog that that then has. Um, on an already very, very congested and, and difficult um, roundabout and that the impact that then that will have on on residents and you know my previous concerns to some extent have, have been borne out up at the, the Trist Road um, because you, you know sometimes you, you cannot even get in and out of, of that junction at all for the queuing traffic and that it's not that the the overall volume um, but in particular there are certain hotspots and I know that I think Graham's Road is within the top 10 or even the top five in the country for already poor air quality um, and at a time where I think there's a, an acknowledgement that as, as all centres and particularly town centres in the extended areas should be looking at lower emission zones and um, decreasing the amount of traffic and queuing traffic um, into hotspots within those um, and given the proximity to residential that would be a concern so I know that it was said that the environmental unit hadn't raised concerns about that specifically, but has there been, um, I, I wonder what kind of detailed analysis has been done on that in reflection of the fact of Graham's Road already being a, one of the most uh, heavily congested and, and poor air quality areas that we have in Scotland, never mind Falkirk. Can also support um, on that? I think um, from the point of view, I think what I need to, to make clear, obviously, that it's an existing unit. So the likes of the Tim Hortons up in uh, Stenhouse was was a new build. So you, you can consider obviously it's been introducing a new use uh, into that area. This is a current commercial unit that's been designed in with the current road network. Obviously it's been there for many years. 
the class one use that's on it could bring in uses that are less onerous or more onerous than the current uh, proposal for a cafe. Uh, it would probably it would be be basically because it is an existing unit, it would be really going beyond um, the, the scope of this application to consider the likes of the traffic problem on Graham's Road or similar. The, the retail park, the roads did assess obviously the application, and given the the current roads um, that are in place and the access and parking. This was all, uh, all basically to the, the acceptability um, of of the the, the proposed unit. Um, there's, as I say, if it was a new unit being into a new construction, a brand new unit, then we could certainly consider obviously the 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 road network and if we could alter or change anything on the road network. But it's obviously at the moment as an existing unit um, on site, uh, which could have many uses currently, um, which would be have less or more traffic than the cafe. Um, so it's not something that, that really we could um, consider further out in terms of onto the Graham's Road or the, the network as proposed at the moment in terms of the layout. I think, can you, I mean, my concern is that, that we are considering a, a change of use. Um, as we've, we've heard, there's already availability there for a, a retail unit um, of, of various different types, including, um, you know, some element of, of, of food takeaway, um, although not cafe seating. Um, I'm just I'm not convinced that changing this and I think as we all probably would in some ways hope that it would increase uh, people that would be coming because it was of because of its uh, proximity to the road and therefore advertising that, that that's there that and, and that, that that would therefore increase the traffic on that edge. I think we have to consider that and uh, given that there's already an opportunity for class one there, I'm not sure what the case is for changing it to a class three as being the only other type of viable um, business that can go in there. So I'm probably minded to, to support yourself on, on that uh, point also. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Nicol. Thank, thank you, Convener. Um, I was heartened to hear um, what Stephen McClure said there, because to me that really puts it into uh, a, a few sentences. My view, a lot of the arguments we've heard would be very pertinent if this was going to be a new build development. It's not. It already exists. We heard from Stephen that there are a lot of options of what could come here um, tomorrow with uh, no recourse to, to any input from us. Quite frankly, I think some of them would be far worse than what is an op option here. And you know, you always have to be careful what you what you wish for. And some of the alternatives I could well understand would cause more uh, annoyance and nuisance than the possibility of this uh, of this Starbucks. That is not taking away from the fact that there are <laughs> great problems in Galloway Street. There has been problems there ever since this development um, was built all those years ago. Um, it must be pushing on 30 years, I suppose. Those problems, are, I do not believe, are going to be worse because Starbucks uh, arrive as against some mm -hmm. of the alternatives that could arrive without any recourse to, to, to this committee. So I will certainly be supporting, um, I'm not sure if it was the provost, but uh, uh, I, I'm, I know that on this issue, um, I, I think that the Starbucks is a, a reasonable use for this uh, building. As I said at the start, had it been uh, this been proposed, I suspect very much that I would have said no, more, totally unsuitable to build this unit so close to these res residential uh, areas. But that was an argument that was lost. Um, 30 years ago. So uh, I will be supporting uh, whoever it was that uh, moved that this be accepted. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, can I just sum up just one or two points that uh, have arisen? First of all, can, can, can Stephen tell us what's in there at the moment? What's, Sorry, Kai, I didn't hear that. What's, what, business, what type of business is there at the moment? So the unit, as the unit was a carphone. It was carphone warehouse that was previously in it, but that's been uh, it's been vacant for over a year now. Yeah. So there's no traffic flow going through the car, the, the carphone warehouse. Yeah, that, that's accepted. So anything that goes in there is bound to impact on 
the uh, the the, uh, the the site itself uh, in terms of the the let's say it's, it's usage current usage and future usage current usage is producing no detriment the the post usage will cause detriment particularly if it's, it's a high volume coffee shop and we've seen recent trends that have changed the way that we, we now conduct ourselves we go for a coffee now instead of going for a drink for example and uh, we've seen the impact at the other cafes as councillor goldie was right the, uh, the the one at the corner of uh, meets road there's another uh, one in the uh, in the retail park itself uh, just opposite the just down from from the entrance to Tesco's, so there is something that can can can, can be, be can be there with. You, you can look at the uh, situation and conclude, uh, or calculate roughly what impact uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, development would have. If it was gags, if it, if it was uh, a if it's, if it's a coffee shop or whatever. The, uh, we can get a reasonable position in relation to the impact that would have. The, uh, I think I'll leave, leave it at that, Kenzina. The uh, next sort of thing. I'll leave it at that, please. Uh, the uh, it's, it's, it's certainly it's not it's not an easy one. I appreciate that particular point, but this, this argument was 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 well rehearsed uh, by developers. Number of years ago, and the the um, the committee held its held its position. Put the, the, the issues of the the locals first, and the the uh, and we also got past the reporters when it was refused. So the uh, that, that's something that they should take into consideration. Happy to move and uh, go to the provision. Thank you, convener, and just by way of uh, clarifying uh, the motion and the, the reasons that were, were provided, the note that I have is that uh, permission would be refused on the grounds that uh, material considerations would outweigh the development plan, and they would be that the proposed development would have an adverse impact on nearby residential properties in terms of a general loss of amenity. Uh, increases in noise levels and volume of traffic, uh, increase in parking issues, uh, issues around an increase in carbon emissions and issues around safety and increased littering. Does that summarise? Yes, that's Thank you. Thank you, convener. So, so the motion was, as I've just uh, narrated, that was by the convener, Councillor Alexander, seconded by Councillor Bowes. And we also had an amendment by Councillor Kerr, seconded by Councillor Blackwood, and that was to agree uh, officers' recommendations, which are to grant permission. On the, the basis of a roll call vote, vote I'll call over names. Councillor Alexander? For the motion. Provost Buchanan. Amendment. Councillor Blackwood. Amendment. Councillor Bowes? Motion. Councillor Goldie. Amendment. Councillor Hughes. Motion. Councillor Kerr. Amendment. Councillor McHugh. And motion. Thank you. Councillor McClucky. Amendment. Councillor Murta. Motion. Councillor Nicol. Uh, Nicole, sorry. sorry amendment. Thank you, Councillor Nicol. And Councillor Nemo. Amendment. I have noted five votes for the motion and seven votes for the amendment. The amendment is duly carried. Thank you, convener. Okay, thank you for that, colleagues. Item seven is a uh, discharge of uh, 
Section 75 agreement. Thank you, convener. Um, yeah. Sorry, this application is for discharge of a Section 75 agreement attached to a 2009 planning permission for residential flats on the, the site of the old Royal British Legion at Park Terrace in Brighton's. The, the application proposes to discharge the Section 75 agreement, which required the payment of £12,000 towards the provision of upgrading of open uh, off-site open space and play provision, uh, and also that required the, that flatted dwelling houses built on the site under the permission be used as affordable housing only and for no other purposes. Um, the applicants uh, wish to discharge the legal agreement in order to remove title burdens uh, on the properties, uh, affecting which affect the valuation of the properties. In turn, these these valuations can affect the uh, the ability of the uh, owners to to leave our funding. Um, the, the applicants being Link Housing Group, uh, who operate the the properties as social rent flats. Um, it was it's been confirmed that the twelve thousand pounds developer contribution, um, which was originally requested in the two thousand nine planning application, uh, has been received by the council and has, and has been spent in full. Um, it can no longer therefore be um, uh, requested to be repaid to to the applicants. Um, in terms of uh, the discharge of the uh, the affordable housing restriction, housing services have been consulted on the application and have confirmed that they have no objection to the proposed discharge assessment uh, against the terms of uh, Scottish Government Planning Circular 3 2012 also confirms that the, the restriction on the original agreement uh, is not necessary or reasonable um, uh, to stand any longer. Taken into this account and in light of the fact that the developer contributions have been spent in full, and it's recommended that planning committee agree to discharge the planning obligation in this instance. Thank you, convener. Convener, you're on mute. That's us. Is that Councillor Murtaugh? Councillor Bowes? Thank you, Convener. Um, I think the first part of this um, uh, is pretty simple. I understand um, why it's being done. All the concern was were they going to be able to come back and ask for the twelve thousand twelve thousand pounds, but you've confirmed that that's not the case. Um the can you make it sorry, Craig, can you just make it a wee bit more clear? See see the sixteen flats, they're currently being run by Link Housing Association, but for the Royal British Legion. Yeah, would that be correct? What difference is discharging that going to make? Uh, ultimately, the discharge won't won't make uh, a great deal of difference to how the properties are um, managed by Link Housing Association. Um, the the purpose of the agreement, as I said, was to is to allow valuations to be carried out on the properties. I uh, understand there's quite a distinct difference uh, in terms of the valuations that may come back. Uh, if the property has a section 75 restriction on the usage uh, versus if it doesn't have that restriction on the usage. Um, if, if, if it was a case of um, looking for some comfort that the, um, that the properties couldn't then be sold off perhaps as a, as private rent, private accommodation, as opposed to be kept within the housing association. Um, you said that the, there are restrictions in place on housing associations, which 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 limit that quite severely. Um, so I think they would find it quite difficult to dispose of them. And certainly they have they have not made that an indication that that's that's that that's their intention here. Um, their intention is to keep them managed as link housing association properties. And if they were ever disposed of, that would be to another uh, another housing association. Um, I, I hope that clarifies that for you. Thanks, Kevin. That's helpful. You can we to report? Is that my clock in? Yeah. 
can mute John. Obviously, I like to support the officer's recommendation and move it. The, I was there in 2012 and I moved this <coughs> application. I also asked for the contribution to open space and that was provided the part straight away. And obviously, Link House has been uh, very good in working in there ever since. So they've made all their obligations, as officer says, and I've no problem with this application. Good. Agreed, Convener. Agreed. Yeah, item eight. Read. See this one. Joy, Joy, here. I'm here, convener. All right, Joy. Thank you, thank you, Convener. Um, this application is for the modification of a legal agreement at Larbert House Plan and Application at number P twenty six eleven seventy five M. The the um, modification deals with substitution of a plan on the legal agreement and amendment to some of the wording. Um, the the changes to to the legal agreement uh, seek to regularise a foot a footpath which has been built on um, Quintins Hill Drive. Um, in the legal agreement, it was shown as being on the south side of the road, um, but it's actually been built on, on the north side of the road. Um, this application requires to be referred to the planning committee because the original application was determined by planning committee. Development at Larbert House is now at an advanced stage, as some members will know. The revised position of the, the footpath creates no, no new issues that require to, to be addressed. The Roads Development Unit have been consulted and they do not object. They actually note that the road construction consent for the development shows the footpath as the, the as-built location, which is on the north side of, of the road. The location of the footpath has been uh, amended in the planning permission by way of a non-material variation, and it leaves only the legal agreement to, to be resolved. It's considered that the modification of the legal agreement meets all of the tests uh, for, for a planning obligation as set out in Circular 3 2012, and it's recommended that members agree to modify the legal agreement. Thank you. Convener. Convener. Yes. Convener. Oh. Could I come in at this stage and just say that I'll not take any part in the decision making uh, with this item because when the original planning application came for this area, um, I declared an interest because I'm related. Um, my brother-in-law was one of the owners of the, the land. So I'm going to state that just now and I'll take no part in whatever decision is getting taken just now on this item. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Provost. Any other comments? Mr Bice? Thank you, convener. Um, and hi, Julie. Um, Julie, the moving the path to the north side is the right thing to do, because anybody can up to Larbert Lock. If it was on the south side, you need to cross the road, go up the south side, then cross the road again. And um, so it's a very popular walking area. Um, hopefully, my door doesn't go, and you'll find out why, because the two dogs will start barking. Um, but but um, that was the right thing to do. I've got to say the. I have tried, honestly, I've tried with this one. The the modification of the Section 75, the deletion of Part 1 plan, the, sorry, the insertion of the words B and C um, between the words as and C was, I, I still don't get it, and I've read it, I don't know how many times. Is there any more detail you can give us on that? It really doesn't. You're asking me to make a decision on something here, and all I know is, is, is there's letters getting moved about. And I'm sorry, I'm not. I'm not being critical. It just, it just, there's just, I just don't feel I've got enough information there. Um, I would like just a wee bit, or quite a lot more information actually to yeah. see what we're actually moving about. Yeah, I understand that, councillor, and that's why I didn't uh, read the, the the full description of of the application because it is a bit confusing unless you sit and read the full legal agreement. The main thing that's changing and what members need to know is that the plan that shows the footpath being on the south side of the road that's going to be replaced with a plan that shows it on the north side of the road, which is as built and in accordance with the road's con 
construction consent and, and now the planning permission. The other references are, are minor changes to the wording of some of the clauses that referred to the original plan and now no longer make sense. So there's nothing fundamental um, that should be of any concern to members there. The legal agreement also dealt with education and some other access provision and that's that's not affected uh, by these changes. Okay, so, so simply there's no financial implication on it. I think that, I think that, that is correct. I, I think that's probably where I was trying to get to because because where it's I'm I'm going what is the financial implication is if any and obviously there isn't. There's none. In, in, in that case, then I would be happy uh, to accept um, the officer's recommendation and proposal. Anyone otherwise minded? Accept the report. Agreed. 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 Okay, we're coming up to the to the hour mark. Uh, the uh, do we want to continue, or do we want to go for, wait for lunch? I would say, I've, especially for me, I've got to take medication. I, I, it's three hours, and I believe that we should have a half an hour comfort break here for lunch at this time. Agreed. Yeah, this is happy with that. Agreed. Okay, see you back here at one thirty. Thanks, convener. Nine is the manual brick website. Uh, I'm going to issue uh, with regards to, to this was the application. The uh, last meeting with the planning committee, I uh, uh, mistakenly uh, said that the council of Buchanan, Province Buchanan, had uh, attended a meeting with the uh, developers and officers in relation to this particular site. It transpired later that they, indeed they had not uh, either approach officers or uh, contact the, uh, the developer. And so I wish to, to issue a very public apology to Council Buchanan, Provost Buchanan, for that error on my part. <coughs> Convener, um, I also was mentioned that I had a meeting with Councillor Buchanan and the officers and, and that because and I, I stated that I had not, I'd asked a question for officers by email, which is a question every member does in relation to questions, but yeah. I never had any any such meeting either. It was, yeah, I mean, I'm quite happy to include yourself in the, in the, the, the apology. Well, the, the issue is, is between the province and I in relation to, to what was said, I actually said. But it doesn't change the, the fact that I was wrong. And uh, I put my hands up when I'm wrong and, and uh, apologise for it. Uh, convener, could I say, first of all, um, I know that you were in the hospital there and we're all delighted that, 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 that you're out. Um, I'll, I'll just say this, that um, obviously, it caused a wee bit of distress with a statement like that because it's, it's quite onerous and had been contacted by a number of members after it had been said. But uh, I'm quite happy uh, to accept your apology because obviously we're in a situation where these meetings are, are, are held remotely, but then they go on to YouTube. And um, I've had, I would say two or three people that had contacted me regarding that were you given a formal apology uh, this morning, hopefully that will cancel out and it will ensure that everybody realises what's happened. So I, I take this opportunity to thank you for that, sir. Yeah, thank you. Item nine uh, is, is, the, is the manual, uh, the, manual the manual site. The, uh, who is the planning officer for that one? Um, that's that's myself, it's uh, Brent. Right, uh, convener, we've got, sorry to interrupt, Brent. We've got Kerry Maguire, the agent for the applicant, on the call. She's made a deputation request. Right. Yep. Okay. The, uh, the members wish to hear that. Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, Kerry Maguire. I would like to thank members for granting me the opportunity to address the committee. I'm Kenny Maguire, partner agreement civil and agent to the applicant CWC group. I'm aware that this is the fourth time that members have considered this application at committee and the application was last considered in March and a decision was continued to allow officers to discuss the master plan with the applicant. 
We would like to reiterate the comments made by the officers in the updated committee report and confirm that a master plan has been provided for this application from the outset. The application was submitted in December 2017 and was accompanied by an indicative master plan, a phasing plan and design access statement. As the application is for planning permission in principle, the master plan has been provided for indicative purposes only, but does demonstrate the delivery of this site through a master plan approach and in accordance with the general principles of the original master plan for the wider White Cross area and Scottish Government's placemaking principles. As we have addressed members at previous committee meetings to outline our responses in, rel in the relation to the reasons for refusal and the material considerations that justify the granting of planning permission in principle, I do not intend to reiterate these points again. Instead, I will focus on the questions raised by the members at the March committee meeting and information contained within the updated committee report. I can confirm that the applicant and landowner for this site remains a CWC group, and this position has not changed since the application was submitted back in 2017. I act as planning consultant to CWC Group and I'm representing the applicant and landowner today. At the March committee, meetings questions were raised in relation to the deliverability of the commercial, business and industrial elements, and the economic development officer stated that they've not been provided with a business plan from the applicant. The applicant has provided evidence to demonstrate their strong market interest in the commercial elements of this proposal. This application is for planning permission in principle and is currently recommended for refusal. There is a market limit to the commitment that interested businesses will provide at this stage in the process without any planning certainty. A phasing plan has been submitted with the planning application, which demonstrates a commitment to deliver the residential and commercial elements in tandem. The first phase of the commercial element was offered to, will be offered to the market along with the first phase of the residential element. The build out rates of both the residential and commercial elements will ultimately be driven by market demand. Section 7 of the updated committee report states that officers consider that the phasing of housing should be linked to the phase completion and occupation of the business and industrial element, and that this can be secured through planning condition. As previously stated, the delivery of the complete commercial element of this proposal will be driven by market demand. The phase delivery of the housing should not be restricted until the full commercial element of this pro proposal has been delivered. Instead, the applicant is willing to accept a condition that the site is delivered in accordance with the phasing plan that has been provided. This will provide certainty that the first phase of the commercial element will be delivered with the first phase of the residential element. As requested by officers, the first phase of the residential element will also include the delivery of the retail and community aspects. This will bring further employment opportunities to the local area as part of the <coughs> development. We would again reiterate that this application is for planning permission in principle. Um, and the development will be brought for, in terms of the mix of scale, mix of uses and design for the first phases of both the commercial and residential elements will be brought forward through the submission of an application for matters specified in conditions in which members would have the opportunity to comment at that stage. The main sticking point between officers and the applicant has been in relation to transportation and access. Despite three continuations of this application, we have been unable to reach an agreement on this matter. Roads Development and Transport Planning Unit have requested that a two-way railway overbridge is provided by our head roads and that a three-metre wide cycleway and footway with a two-metre buffer is provided along Haining Road. A transport assessment was submitted with a planning application and this was prepared by Alex Steden of Transport Planning Limited, highly experienced and independent transport consultant. The transport assessment assessed the potential impact of the development on the local road network and also accounted for the proposed 200 residential units at Crowner Land. Taking account the cumulative impact of both developments, it has been repeatedly demonstrated that there is no basis for a two way railway crossing and that has been requested by officers. The requirement for improvements to the junction at Myerhead Road crossing the railway line have been discussed with officers at length. The junction has been fully assessed by the applicant. It has been concluded that the signals are expected to continue to operate satisfactorily after the addition of traffic estimated to be generated from this proposed development. The applicant has demonstrated that no improvement works are required at this junction to accommodate this proposed development. The Council's Transport Planning Unit raised concerns over the gradient of the railway crossing and that this is considered to be unsuitable for commercial vehicles. Improvement works to the railway crossing were undertaken in 2015. It is assumed that these improvement works and the gradient of the crossing met with the Council's road standards and the requirements and therefore this is not a matter for the determination of this planning application. The concerns have been raised in relation to increased number of heavy and light good vehicles using Myerhead Road. The site was previously used as a commercial brickworks with significant heavy goods traffic movement. 
Furthermore, the site is now allocated for business and industrial use in the local development plan too, which contradicts the concerns raised by the transport planning unit. The applicant has provided drawings prepared by Ironside Farrah to demonstrate the proposed improvements to Meyerhead Roads. A drawing has also been provided showing that a safe pedestrian and cycle access route can be provided along Haining Road and that this can be delivered within the adopted verge without requiring third party land. The applicant has provided a speed survey to support the proposed safe access route. If members are minded to grant planning permission in principle, we request that consent is granted with conditional requirements in relation to the applicant's proposed off-site improvement works for Meyerhead Road and Haining Road, as per the drawings provided by Ironside FARA, rather than the provisions sought by the Roads Development and Transport Planning Units. Section 14 of the committee report relates to the nature of the Section 75 agreements should members be minded to grant planning permission in principle. It is suggested that proportionate contributions are required in relation to education, healthcare, Lethal and Roundabout Junction improvements and the local bus service. The applicant is mindful of the recent Counterland appeal decision in relation to developer contributions in this area, and no agreement to date has been negotiated with officers. The applicant is willing to accept the general principle of contributions in relation to these local services, subject to understanding the contribution level sought and undertaking detailed discussions with officers on this matter. In relation to affordable housing provision, the applicant supports the policy requirement for 25% of the residential units being provided for affordable housing. In relation to open space provision, given that the site area extends to circa 30 hectares, it's anticipated that sufficient open space can be accommodated on site. To summarise and conclude, the proposal will regenerate a long-term vacant brownfield site and represents a significant investment by the applicant to the White Cross area. The proposed development will generate significant economic benefits for the area during the construction phase and create longer term employment opportunities through the delivery of the commercial uses. The economic benefits of the proposal are a material consideration in the determination of this application and should be considered and given considered weight, significant weighting. It is therefore requested that members determine this application and support the regeneration of this long term vacant brownfield site and investment in the White Cross area and grant planning permission in principle. I'm joined today by Alex Steden of Transport Planning Limited, and we're both happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Rocky. Hey, thanks, convener, for letting me ask. Uh, I've got two questions. The first one is obviously we, we, we hear that it's a material consideration, economic development, but could the applicant kind of tell us what would be a kind of estimate or a rough estimate of the jobs and the, and the build of the houses and, uh, of, and so obviously all the business units? Um, and uh, so during that phase, and what would be the projected jobs once they were all created, shown with the kind of, kind of indications we've got so far uh, for coming in? in? In terms of specific job numbers, I, ca I can't confirm anything at this stage because this is an application for planning permission in principle, and it really will depend on the uses that come forward. The commercial uses allowed at this site are both for class four business and, and class six storage and distribution, as well as the commercial um, retail element within the residential scheme. So it really depends on the nature of those businesses where we can comment on exact job numbers. But certainly that information can be provided as we progress to the detailed design stage with the approval of matters specified in conditions consents. Right, thank you for that. The second question is relating to um, point 13. Obviously, the officers have made a statement, the vertical separation from the carriageway, they're seeing it would probably require a pedestrian safe, safety barrier, which would uh, reduce the the path, um, the width of the two metre path. Um, obviously, I don't like the word probably because if I went on a plane and somebody says we've probably got enough fuel to get to America, I wouldn't be going on the plane. But um, as I said, so I was looking for your your point here. Um, obviously, you've got your road expert there. What is his view? And is this a, a normal thing? Because I've not seen any of these barriers, but I'm just trying to get your opinion of this, this point officers are saying about this probability. 
Uh, Councillor McClucky, it's uh, Alex Nedden from Transport Planning here. Thank you. I did, uh, I did like your airplane fuel analogy there. The, um, the, um, the, the, the reason for the barrier arose because um, there was a drawing in circulation that showed that the kerb was proposed to be 300 millimetres high, so a, a foot in old money. Um, and if, if the kerb was uh, built that height, then the, the reason for the barrier is actually to prevent people falling off it. Uh, so the, uh, but our view is that that is not required. Standard height kerb can be provided here. Um, as Kerry um, referred to in her little introduction, we've carried out uh, separate speed surveys on that stretch of Haining Road that we're speaking about. And probably uh, no surprise to members really, but Haining Road is kind of bookended by the urban limit of White Cross at one end and a 90 degree bend at the other. And that means that traffic speeds on that short section are actually quite low. So the provision of the footway it would be formed in accordance with the drawings that Kerry referred to, uh, standard height curb and no, no requirement for the barrier. Thank you very much for that. That's me concluding my questions at this stage, uh, convener. Anyone else? Provost. Provost. A, a question to yourself, sir. In, in relation to, there seems to be a bit of an impasse with officers, uh, obviously, for transport in terms of what they require and what you believe that they don't require. So that's the first question. You could maybe take us through that. Um, if you could maybe just summary what they're asking for, and maybe you come in with what you believe uh, as an answer against that. The, se the second part is, is that obviously, you know that 200 houses were agreed, albeit through the reporter at the end of the day, and what's, what significance that that development will have in relation to you going forward. Thank you, sir. Uh, thanks, Councillor Buchanan. Um, just going back to the first part of your question, um, that actually relates as well to points that were made by Councillor McClucky during the last um, presentation. Um, what was being uh, suggested by the Council on the, uh, the side of Haining Road that I was just speaking about, so the south side of Haining Road, um, was a separation of footway um, created by a verge. So you would have the carriageway that you would drive on then a verge, which I think was sought to be two metres wide, and then a foot cycleway uh, of three metres in width. Uh, the, the question that Councillor McClucky uh, asked uh, in the last uh, hearing was what dimension of path would that tie into when it meets the existing path at Hainan Road? And the answer to that is circa 1.5 metres. Um, I think the point that Councillor McClucky was trying to make it at that time was well, what's the point of providing a five metre corridor that ties into a 1.5 metre path? Um, it just so happens that the verge that's available uh, on the roadside to the south of Hainan Road would actually permit the construction of a path um, wider than is currently in existence. Um, I think this quite often occurs because road standards are new. Um, and what we're trying to do is retrofit development into a historic road network. So you can't always just apply what the desirable standard is. Um, you, you, you might recall, actually, uh, Councillor Buchanan, that um, an example was given, I think, maybe by Mr. Whittle, um, of new pathing that had been provided to that standard outside Madison Primary School. Um, but that's a completely different circumstance uh, of, of new development and a, and a virgin site, effectively. Um, the second point you asked about was the 200 houses at Crownerland. The, in the traffic work for this development, um, the, the Council's Roads Department issued information related to three developments, uh, the Crownerland development, this development, and also the Gilston development. Um, and they issued that information to all three parties so that all three parties could go away and use the same information in their transport assessments. So the short summary of that is that in our report, we accounted for our development and these other two. And in the Crownerland report, they accounted for their development and us and Gilston. So the extra 200 houses in traffic terms, it's not really an extra 200 houses at all because everybody's accounted for it. So the findings of our report already reflect the, flat, the fact that the Crown Land 200 is included in the calculations. Just one final point through your good self, convener. 
uh, and, and in relation to, to the issue about what's been brought up many times about the, the railway scenario, can you maybe just sort of uh, give us an overview of the issue there? Uh, did you mean that question to me, Mr. Uh, yeah, to, to yourself, yep. Yeah, the um, trying to think of a short answer to this, sorry. But um, at the time of the Edinburgh Glasgow Improvement Programme works, various overbridges along the railway line uh, were lifted in height to allow for the passage of electric cables underneath them. Um, that's what happened at this junction. Um, and as a consequence of that, the gradient of approach to the, the, the bridge was, uh, was steepened slightly. Um, at that time, Falkirk Council were consulted as Roads Authority and raised no objections to what Network Rail, Rail were proposing. Um, in the knowledge that the site at that time was allocated for a component of business and industry and is allocated for a com for business and industry going forwards. Um, and as Kerry uh, alluded to, the site historically operated as a brick wards from the previous gradients. So we have submitted information to the council. It was, um, it, I think it may be contained actually in the committee papers, but the in essence, what we did was we looked at other gradients elsewhere um, in the country, actually, not just in Falkirk, um, looking at sections of road that may be steeper than the section that we're speaking about here, which isn't like, ridiculously steep, um, and compared that to the traffic usage. And what we discovered, the, the example uh, probably most known to members on this call would be the mound in Edinburgh, which is far steeper than we're talking about here, and obviously is used by uh, public service vehicles and goods vehicles without any issue. So I don't really see that the gradient on the approach to the bridge is, is particularly unusual, particularly for modern vehicles, um, and it, it isn't really an impediment. Thank you, sir. Thank you, convener. Okay. Anyone else? Convener. Hughes and then Councillor Chair. Thank you. Councillor Hughes and then Councillor Chair. I was going to, I was going to say, Convener, I'll defer and allow Councillor Kerr to speak before me because his hand slipped in before mine. Okay, okay. but also quicker than my eye. But uh, never mind. Thank you, Councillor Hughes. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, a couple of points for Kerry Ann uh, uh, General Roads gentlemen. Uh, it was myself that raised the last time regarding the three meter two meters and three meters cycle path going on going into the existing White Cross village. And it was Mr. Steedman that informed me that the new area up in Madison at Madison School was an area that reflected what they were looking for. I actually went up yesterday and measured it. Uh, both sides are different. Uh, and there's no three metre footpath up there. Uh, there is a grass verge, and the grass verge thing worries me, because that means maintenance. I and mean, as a council, we're creating work for ourselves. The question is, in your capacity as a roads planner, do you think the three metre footpath or three metre cycle path going into a 1.5 existing path could create hazards. In short, it could do, Councillor Kerr, because depending on how well used it was, it would it mm. could create like a bottleneck effectively where people are throttling down to use the narrower path. Mm. But in essence, I don't think that the pedestrian movement would be so huge as to create that much of a difficulty. Okay. Um, and I think that regardless of whether the site is approved today for its mixture of residential and commercial uses, or, um, and, you know, from my perspective, hopefully this doesn't happen, but it goes forward to become a commercial site in the future, um, then that foot traffic is still going to exist. The site is still allocated mm -hmm. and it still has to be fitted, retrofitted into what is a historic network, making the best use of what is available. 
And what is available is an existing verge on the south side of Hainan Road that could be converted to footway without the need for an intervening grass verge, as you've suggested. Thank you, Mr. Sneddon. Uh, 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 yes, convener, sorry, sorry. One for Ms. Maguire. Uh, with regards to uh, point, uh, point four, uh, where it says uh, PE01 place meeting has uh, suggested that the site will be physically isolated and poorly connected and exposed to disamenities. Does your client feel that that is the right uh, summary of the proposal? Because I'm sure that when people build, uh, developers build, uh, housing estates. The first thing people, when they're buying a house, are not to see what the bus service is or what the bus timetable is. Uh, thanks, Ms. Ms. Wire. If you can answer that question, please. No, I assume that you're making referring to recommendation for refusal reason four and yes, yeah, place making yeah. policy. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah we, would, we would disagree with that assessment. And as I said in my statement, we brought this forward through a master plan approach. So it has been designed to meet the place making requirements um, as providing a mix of uses within the residential element. There'll also be the kind of the open space provision, the kind of retail facility, community facilities that will all tie into that place making requirement. The site we've already talked about, the kind of pedestrian connectivity to the White Cross Village will be connected to local bus service, I believe, as well, given that that's one of the contribution requirements that's set out within the committee report. Um, so we think it will tie in with these place making principles. Thank you very much. Thanks, convener. Okay, anyone else? Any questions for Gary or uh, <clears throat> Thank you, convener. <clears throat> I wanted to ask Mr. Snedden um, a question. Um, I do realise that it has been recognised that um, the brickworks <clears throat> obviously um, took its produce or product <clears throat> probably over <clears throat> the Meyerhead Road. But can I ask you, the bridge was obviously reconfigured and a new bridge effectively was was put in place. Um, can I ask you, I don't know uh, what obviously the weight of uh, the weight restriction is in relation to the Meyerhead Road, but could I just speculate with you? <clears throat> um, a low loader with a, a bulldozer on top, would it be able to negotiate the bridge in terms of weight and also in terms of width? Uh, in short, yes. Um, I don't think there's any impediment to that use whatsoever across that bridge. Right. I was just trying to get a feel for the, because obviously it, when I'm driving over that bridge, my car just, I feel that it's narrow, is my perception of that, that bridge. Yeah, I think, Councillor Hughes, that's probably caused there's a, quite a lot of research about this, but it's really related to the height of the parapets, which makes you feel as though you're kind of closed in a little bit. If you're accustomed with the bridges, which uh, aren't in Falkirk, but in West Lothian, just near my office here, which is near Folkestone, then uh, you'll be aware that there's two bridges here, uh, one across the Union Canal and one across the rail line. Um, the one across the rail line here uh, didn't have to be raised as part of the Egypt Works, but the carriageway on both these bridges is actually narrower than the one that we're currently talking about, and there's no restriction on available width for these, for example, related to development at Philpston Bing, which is for heavy, crushed aggregate use, so uh, quite you know, heavy use. And can I conversely ask you, um, you mentioned that um, the road network was a historical Net network, obviously through White Cross, and I'm just thinking about my same question about a low loader and a bulldozer trying to get up Haining Road. If if the if all the residents part on one side of the road, yeah, uh, would there be sufficient, um, shall we say, space 
for construction vehicles without going on the pavement? Um, well, the short, there's two answers to that, really. Um, one is that the for access to the counter one site, then I think that, that potentially is a, a, an issue for them. Um, from the point of view of this application site, then a condition of consent that's commonly entered into would be a thing called a construction traffic management plan. And in the construction traffic management plan, the routes for delivery of larger vehicles or heavier vehicles are defined. And certainly for this development, I would anticipate that there would be such a plan and that the route would be to, and the, the purpose of these plans usually is to try to get your traffic to and from the strategic road network by the shortest available route. Mm -hmm. And that means the M9. So the route would, would be uh, leave the junction at the M9, which is junction four, I think, um, travel back towards Linlithgow, turn into White Cross, cross the bridge that we've just been speaking about, and enter the site. If you do that, then you never have to drive on Hainan Road. Right. So you're basically Haining Road is um, it's not a typical road in terms of a main road. It's it's I would say it's not typical in terms of a main road. It is typical of other roads in Falkirk um, where there are residents parking on it. I listened to the part of the discussion that you had about the retail park earlier, and I think some of the points that were being raised there are similar to the point that you're making here. Uh, but I certainly wouldn't anticipate that as a construction vehicle route. Right, but just one final question to yourself before I ask a question of Ms. Maguire uh, was in terms of a construction management plan. Um, if the main Haining Road had to be used, would there be cons consultation with residents? Yes, because it would more than likely require temporary suspension of parking, and for example, that parking could be decanted to the site, um, or. If it was a Saturday morning, then there might be some arrangement that would have to be taking place. I mean, this is okay. I'm kind of grasping at this answer, Councillor Hughes, because of um, as, as Kerry explained earlier, it is in principle, and it depends on the 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 scale of the uses that effectively that come forwards. But it's not unusual, certainly, for con con construction traffic management plans usually come along when contractors are involved. Um, and it's not uncommon at all for contractors to set up uh, residence contact groups. Usually the heat has gone out of an application by that time because it's been approved. There are no objectors any longer. Well, thank, thank you for that. Um, Ms. Maguire, can I ask you, as a follow-up to Councillor McClucky's question when he was asking about jobs, and you, you had basically said that obviously that would be dependent on the, the facilities built. Is that correct? Yes. In terms of the, 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 the warehousing or the whatever or the housing. Can I ask you, as a representative of the developer, um, do you have preferred contractors that uh, that you call upon in terms of 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 basically constructing um your developments? They have contractors that they've used for past developments, yes, but in this instance, it's, it, because it's just an in principle at this stage, and we don't know what the detailed design scale is going to be, that there's no contractors being appointed at this stage. Yeah, but my point is that in normal circumstances, that you would have preferred contractors. Do they have contractors, yes, that they've worked with on previous schemes before? And that would basically would probably mean that uh, there would be less opportunity for local jobs. No, not necessarily. They're just contractors they've worked with before, so I'm sure this project would go out to tender when it gets to that stage. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is anyone else? Convener. Convener. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thanks for letting me back in. I, I, I had a question that I asked uh, the the the, um, the roads gentleman, but this question is for Miss um, um, Maguire. She may not prefer to answer this, but in fact, I think it's going to be said that over the period of time that we've we've had this application in front of us, um, obviously you've had an opportunity, Mr. Maguire, to um, not just to, to answer questions and, and and give an overview, but to listen in. Now, the fact of the matter is, is that every time that we have a a, a meeting in relation to this, there more information sort of getting eked out, maybe the word. Um, the last time that this was continued was because at the end of it, after all the debate had nearly finalised, we found that the master plan 
had been uh, significantly put in with other with other information that we're not readily available. I also asked you if you took part in the meeting that Councillor Alexander and officers had with with, with the applicant and Councillor Alexander went to that meeting in terms of wearing the hat of the convener of economic development. But we've never had an update, an updated report on whatever happened at that meeting. It wasn't included. And there's certain aspects that's been coming out in the past two or three meetings that we should have had and a full a full report that came to us at the very beginning. Now I might put you in a position, but the fact of the matter is is that You've given us more information today, you gave us information the last time, but the fact of the matter is that we didn't realise that there was significant information that had been given by the applicant or his agent to the council, if you know where I'm coming from. From our perspective, that we've there was a full package of, of information submitted with the plan application, including indicative master plans and a whole suite of technical information. That is all available on the, on the planning portal. So that operation has all been in the public domain since 2017 when we lodged the application. Yeah, but, but what I'm saying is that it was all so much relevant information that's come out was not submitted in the reports that came forward to us. That's what I'm saying. Thank you very much. Professor, uh, can, can, can I just respond to that, uh, please? Fine, thank the, you. Uh, the reports that have come to, to, to the, this committee followed on from the things that were developed at the first meeting. You're, you're correct. There's, there's been four particular meetings, meetings where the uh, the information given to 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 uh, members has, has has gradually increased. Yeah. And uh, the uh, there's been amended reports sent through for consideration and approved by this committee. Uh, with regards to to the, uh, the outcome of uh, the uh, the meeting with with the company, and also with the in relation to the, the commitment of of our authority, as, as well as the uh, the, the, the uh, developers to, to produce a master plan. And you're right in the sense that uh, my understanding of the situation it was that. Uh, the master plan is what was what we were waiting on. If it's in, and the you know, and checking through the papers and the the uh, there's a there are changes to this report that uh, have been have been carried out from the previous report. So I don't think it's it's, it's, it's true to say what you said in, in relation to uh, the the meeting with economic development. The, there's an opportunity at any point in time to speak to myself or, or officials with regards to the economic development planning or whatever, uh, uh, whatever area of, of uh, service delivery that, that we have. And uh, this is a, an area that uh, I would hope we would get the support of all of us in this committee and uh, there would be a, a unanimity going forward. I know it's a clear picture in relation to what protects the council's uh, uh, protects the council's situation, or necessarily what the, the, the developer has said. Convener, no. could I say with all due respect, the fact of the matter is is that you, as the the convener of economic development, mm -hmm. had meetings with officials and. The, the applicant or the applicant's agent. You know, the you fact think, is that you, I've already think, stated that that I did not go to that meeting, although I was invited because I didn't think it was right. I think that I would have had to clean myself out of the, the, the decision making process and advise Councillor McClucky as well. Now, at no time have you came forward because that's outside this committee, but at no time has you have you came forward and gave the committee an overview of what happened at that meeting. Which I believe that is, although I believe that there is a conflict of interest here because that you're wearing these two hats. But the fact of the matter is that we never got an update on the meeting, either from you or anybody else. Thank you. The, the fact is, the Council Buchanan, you did, and it was, it was contained within the reports that, uh, that were considered by the, the committee. 
Uh, no time d during the uh, discussions, either to the uh, full council, either uh, the, the planning committee, or uh, at the uh, the, uh, the pre meeting that takes place in every committee, I was included. Did you raise any concerns along these lines? And uh, you know that, that, that surprises me a wee bit, given your your, your contribution to this afternoon. Well, it's no my place, convener, to, to pick you up on the fact that my own personal opinion is that you can't wear two hats. There's a conflict of interest there. I don't. I just want to see the business of the council going through. I don't want to stop the business to having goes and looking political or whatever. But the fact of the matter is, is that I do believe, and I've seen you brought the, the issue up. I do believe that you cannot wear a hat as the e economic convener. And then come into a, a committee after sitting with an applicant and applicants agents, and then taking part in the decision making for the planning convener. That's my personal opinion, and I believe that other people hold the same opinion. You, you wouldn't mind then if I ask a legal ruling on that? Well, carry on. I've asked for it myself. Yeah. Thank you, convener. Yeah, it, look, looking at the the councillor's code of conduct, it doesn't preclude. Uh, meetings with parties. Uh, the, the key messages are that parties don't prejudge an application and that there isn't a perception that they've prejudged an application. Uh, our advice uh, as officers would be that uh, any such meetings are conducted in a way that's fair to all parties, all parties of an equal opportunity, and that it's carried out uh, by way of officers. And I believe that the meeting that took place was organised by officers and uh, attended by officers. Uh, and uh, it would then come down to the point whether or not uh, there was any indication that there was a prejudging of the, the application by any member that may have been involved in such a meeting. Uh, and the understanding from officers who were in attendance is that that didn't take place. My understanding, now I wasn't at the meeting, is that it was uh, essentially a, a listening brief and hearing what uh, the company had to say. Uh, thank you, uh, convener and provost. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me now? That's it. You can be now, yeah. Apologize for that. The, 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 any further questions for the uh, Ms. McGuire? Ms. McClucky? Aye, thanks for letting me back in. It's just that in listening to another couple of councillors there make comment and we're talking about Haining Road. Um, I know that my uh, my family used to sell fire clay to the brickwork, and we didn't have got my hair road. We we came through the the talkway face for man. But um, as as Haining Road, this is to the, obviously the developer. Has Haining Road changed in width? Because I, I remember that for about twelve year, and right up to August last year, this was an LDP one, and uh, we're talking about fifteen hundred houses plus all these developments. And uh, now it seems that the width of Haining Road seems to be an issue. Now, I don't believe that the the road is any different in width. Do you want, is your question coming for yes, the developer? I, I'm asking the, the question for the developer. Right, well, if, if, the, the, if there's been a change in the width, because obviously then um, there was no concern and the LDP one went through with every councillor, every officer, all the reporters and obviously Scottish ministers. And uh, nobody brought up, you know, that there was anything to do with Haining Road. 
But I was just asking that question from, I'll, I'll do the same later on in my presentation to, to officers, um, convener, but I'm asking, this is my last opportunity to speak to the, the applicant. Uh, uh, Councillor McClucky, no, there's been no, uh, no, I mean, uh, if it has changed, it hasn't probably been within my living memory. So it's, uh, there's been no recent change to the Wood Road. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Can I say, honestly, the uh, involved in the report? Yep. Thank you, convener. Uh, just just to, to remind members, this application is for the, the redevelopment of the former manual brickwork site for a mixed use development comprising approximately 400 residential dwellings, associated local retailing and community facilities comprising classes one, two and three, and also approximately 29,000 square metres total gross area of commercial units. Uh, comprising 10% class four business and 90% class six storage or distribution. <coughs> Members will recall that, this, that the planning committee considered the application on the 28th of August, 2019, the 17th of June, 2020, and the 17th of March, 2021. The reports prepared for those Committee meetings are appended to this report. At the 17th of March committee meeting this year, it was agreed to continue the application for further consideration of the master plan submitted by the developer and for officers to have further discussions with the applicant and report back to committee. As Ms. McGuire has said um, in her presentation, the, the application um, is accompanied by indicative master plan drawings. The report to committee uh, back in August 2019 provided detail, detailed comments in respect of the submitted master plan drawings. And those comments are highlighted in paragraph five of the report before you today. In summary, the submitted master plan drawings are considered to provide a suitable framework to inform the detailed design proposals should planning permission in principle be granted. Since last committee, the applicant has confirmed that they intend to commence the first phases of the housing and business industrial elements in tandem, but the completion of the business industrial element would ultimately be driven by market demand. Uh, the rest of this report touches on matters generally previously reported to committee, but I think it is worth uh, reminding the committee of some of those points again. As previously advised to committee, the application is con contrary to the local development plan, which allocates the site solely for business and industry uses. In addition, the application is considered to be sufficient in transportation terms. This is because the applicant's proposals for off-site road improvement works and active travel provision are not considered to be an appropriate standard to ensure that the development would be well connected, promote the use of active travel and walking and cycling to school, provide safe access for all, and maximise opportunities to reduce a high degree of car dependency. These deficiencies were considered in detail in the report to the March Committee. The report to March committee also recognised the potential economic and employment benefits of the proposed development, but did not consider those benefits to outweigh the terms of the local development plan, plan or the identified transportation deficiencies. This remains the view of the Council's Development Management Unit. Other potential benefits of the proposed development are recognised. They include reuse of a brownfield site and enhancement of Armand Castle and Haney Wood. However, such benefits could accrue as much from business industrial use in accordance with the LDP2 designation as from a mixed use development featuring a significant housing element, which is contrary to LDP2. The previous recommendation to refuse the application is, uh, is reiterated uh, in the report before you today. If the committee were, however, minded to support the principle 
of the proposed development, notwithstanding it is contrary to LDP2. Consideration would need to be given to whether to accept the applicant's off-site proposals for My Hedge Road and Haining Road, or require the standard of provision sought by the Council's Roads Development and Transport Planning Units. And it would be competent for the committee to impose suspensive, that is, negative conditions to secure provision of off-site road improvement works and active travel provision requiring third-party land. The applicant's proposals for off-site works and the standard of provision sought by the Roads Development Unit and the Transport Planning Unit are detailed in paragraph 13 of the report. Any decision by the committee to grant planning permission in principle should be subject to the conclusion of a section 75 planning obligation. To secure the matters set out in paragraph 14 of the report before you today. Furthermore, on conclusion of a section 75 planning obligation, the grant of planning permission in principle would be subject to appropriate conditions. This matter could be de delegated to the Director of Development Services, and it is anticipated that the conditions would secure the phased implementation of firstly, upgrade works to Myhead Road to the standards agreed by committee, secondly, an active travel route along Haining Road, Road to the standards agreed by committee, and completion occupation of the business industrial elements, all linked to um, various phases of house completions. But to reiterate uh, our recommendation to committee, having taken all matters into account, remains to refuse the application for the reasons set out in paragraph 18 of the report. Thank you, convener. Okay. We'll put it to questions uh, folks on the floor. Is that look lucky? Thanks, thanks, convener. Um, ov obviously, you know, there's a long history to this application. We look at it, as I mentioned before, it was an LDP1, and as I said, um, supported by all officers, all members of the, of the council. It was supported by reporters and supported by Scottish ministers um, for these 1,500 houses. Now, the reason it didn't go ahead, obviously, was because there was onerous conditions put on to, obviously it was a sir, a major development of housing led and, and the jobs to regenerate that community. But the reason it didn't go ahead was because we gave planning permission for the road had to come from the dual carriageway at that time. And uh, there was restrictions and ransom strips because there was land there out with the applicant's control and the bank would not release that land. Now, they were talking about a huge ravine at that time coming across from the back that was going to take something in the region of 14 million to go in and put up. Now, myself and the provost went up later on, um, or maybe 10 years ago, we went up on site and we asked Rhodes the question, why are they not coming in? Why is there a condition to come from the dual carriageway why are they not coming up from the, the obviously where the railway bridge is, Myerhead Road? And what we, what we were told by officers at that time, that it would be just as onerous and difficult because of the railway bridge that it probably would, would also stop and no go forward. And that was why they were suggesting coming coming from, from the dual carriageway. Now, what we've heard here is that when we ask for conditions onto an application, it's got to be rel relative to the application. It's got to be fair and proportionate. And what we've heard is uh, the the applicant has said that the figures supplied on on the three developments uh, by by Falkirk Council do not merit this railway bridge being being widened. So I do not see that meets the test, fair and proportionate, and, and land and conditions. Would Scott Rail even agree to it? We don't know. What was mentioned in a previous report was something like, oh, a similar thing somewhere else was only uh, two and a half million. 
that that's no we ran some strips and getting grounds and 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 all sorts of things. That was just uh, somebody for customer services, right? That had said that no official special bit. So I don't think uh, what we've heard from the applicant and what we've seen for officers, I don't think it merits uh, obviously um, the railway bridge at this stage going down with the facts with the figures that the Fokker Council has supplied. Um, there's only one objection to this. We also hear, and I've said at the last meeting, it's in local plan two now with, with, with changes. It would have also been in supporting this application in LDP2 had the government not changed the, the rules and allowed us to, to put this White Cross application back in because of a sudden interest in a smaller development like this and moving forward to any the benefits that the community has been waiting for 15 years for and go ahead. And we would have took out, um, obviously, Gilson, 1,300 objections, but the, the reporter granted that. I don't see anything there about the the, the business side moving and that down, down there over all the years when it was in for, for Brownfield. So as I say, um, there is things, you've got to make it fair and proportionate. I do believe that, that this is good value. I uh, congratulate the members who suggested that we get this uh, summary and master plan, and we see it. And we also mentioned it's six that is considered to provide a suitable framework to should planning permission be, uh, be, be in principle granted. So I'm fine with that. As for when we move on to number seven, where it says uh, it comes in, in tandem, the, obviously the applicant it says they want to do the business unit, units and the housing in tandem. I'm concerned that a uh, statement made is when the business thing's finished. You know, there's a number of different business units suggested that would maybe come here from the, you know, it was just an email that we all received uh, many months ago from a, a person interested in buying it. It's not the applicant. Um, so I'm not wanting to relate to it, but at that time there was there was big interest, and obviously if somebody's going to put readies in, there must be there must be a real a real interest in in taking this forward. But if there's a number of different uh, business units coming in, you want to watch the way we word that condition. So because we want them obviously the business units to start with the housing and and move forward. But if there's other business units come, we don't want to say oh well you can't finish that, that last house because You've, you've, you've actually encouraged more business to come to the Fokker area because with COVID not now and as economic development is a, a lifeline to communities. So so we say that things. There was also mentioned earlier on the uh, convener about the the two meter strip um, that officers suggest for down here and then a three meter cycle way. And there was reference that where where else is it in Fokker, and they stated that it was on uh, at, at Madison. That area, that road, is a link road. It's a past part of the eastern access. We are roundabout at the end of it to go a whole different um, ways. It was constructed far wider to a far wider spec. And there wasn't any original houses there. It was it was a new as the, the developer, as Alex said and, and said today. You know, it was done and, and could be provided. So, what we've got to to make is what is what we can deliver within a master plan that can be achieved, delivered for the good of the communities. There's 100 affordable houses going to be done as for application here. The jobs is going to be there, and it was rumoured well over a thousand, as I say, as I had heard, would allow people on a mortgage to go and buy one of the, the houses if you got one of the jobs for White Cross. I've got people who've been coming to me for seven years, seven and eight years, and can't get a larger route. They need another room for their, their family, or they want to move, or want to move back, and can't get there. This would allow them, if they got one of the local jobs, to be able to go back to White Cross and, and move in for the affordable houses. It would also meet the, the people, as I say, as it's travelling all the way over to Slamana here, to your food bank from White Cross, to get food parcels, because if they got a job right and, and a good sustainable job, they may not need 
the food parcels and to come over. So that thing. I've also told you that um, there's illegal dumping getting put over that ground. It's desolate. It's, it's it's terrible looking, and we're here illegal dumping. And I've regularly got to contact um, officers to get in contact to try to get clear up. I was mentioning the. Uh, obviously the, the framework and the proposals about the paths. At present, people can't use the core paths because they get run down with quads and motorbikes, right? Um, as I say, and council officers, as I say, um, can, can witness that because they've, they've contacted me complaining because the motorbikes come on back onto Madison from from this area. And as I say, please, you've been up, up um, constantly. So, th so this new woodland and the development and that is going to make it safer and better. We hear there's a concern about um, this, the, the, what the officers are looking for, for the paths now, because in one small point is going to narrow down to obviously two and a half metres or one and a half metres, right, for a small section. But it was really heard, I raised it at the last meeting, once you go up the to into White Cross itself, there is no cycleway. You've got to pedal on the road. So you've got a, whether it's one and a half metres or two metres um, going up to the, the village, but then it uh, then goes down. There is also a, a, the, the applicant has said in a previous application that there's an alternate route. People taking their children to school is for the parents. It has came up time and time before with the Scottish Government. That it's up to up to the to people who take their kids safely at schools. If people we mentioned here about doing away with cars, we would like that, and we would like that at all the schools. But the fact is that most parents take their kids with cars, and it, as it's their right to do so, they have it. We have got here a condition that the bus gets moved to to come to that area and take him in, so people can send the rain the rain way. Um, with with a the bus, there's also the walking and cycleway. So there's there's plenty of route, uh, routes there for 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 that. And as I say, the master plan gives all this extra woodland landscape is going to make an area, uh, enhance an area, and make it better. Create jobs, create vision, create employment. These are the things that's 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 going to go back. I go on then to the safety barrier, where it says. Probably, now that's in number 13, I believe. Um, probably need the safety barrier. Well, if I say, as you heard for the applicant, where else is it? Uh, it doesn't believe it's, it's required. And as I say, as I, don't, I don't see where, where it is required. Uh, same as everywhere else. I don't see these barriers and I don't see these two metre grass areas up at the inches or Canard or all the things where all these housing up, massive housing applications have been built. Um, as I say, there is a number of conditions that must be imposed, education. Um, I take it most of the, the open space contribution will be will be on site because of the woodland and that. But as I say, if not, we've got set conditions to meet that. However, it certainly does not need. Well, so I'm, to me, I'm happy to accept the the proposal set out by the developer for the paths, uh, the for the for the roads, and it certainly does not need a, a um, two way bridge at this stage. If a subsequent other applications come in, and there's going to be increased traffic numbers, then it, it maybe have to be in the future. But as I say, at the present moment, so I'm very very confident with this. Um, as I say, I don't want, I want this to move forward. I don't want to be put in silly um, conditions that stops White Cross for being regenerated. Because I was attending the meetings prior to being a councillor 13 years ago in White Cross, where the people were all supporting that re regeneration, getting new houses, getting jobs, getting new civic centres, and, and, and making the place a community. And as I say, that's what I'm I'm moving. So I'm happy to um, to move this application forward in line with what the obviously the the applicant has suggested. But other conditions, as I say, would 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 apply uh, with the normal conditions. But as I say, I'm satisfied that um, this is a great application, and uh, the conditions will will, 
will be acceptable. Thank you. Do you want to give a legal perspective? Um, yes, thank you, convener. It was just to clarify, Councillor McClucky, um, if you're if you're moving <laughs> moving a motion, as they say, um, my my note is that uh, you're you're satisfied on matters of access and transportation, as was addressed by the applicant in their proposal submitted to the planning authority. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Um, and I think the benefits you had noted of the development. Uh, which would outweigh the, the development plan provisions are the, the potential economic and employment benefits, uh, the reuse of a brownfield site and the enhancement of Ammond Castle and Haningwood. Yes. They're all material correct? yes, they're all material considerations that are that I think is important and about the environmental size enhancement and um, community belonging to that area, as I say. Many of the people in White Cross Parents worked in that, that brickwork and, and obviously units connected to the, the brickwork. Thank, thank you, uh, Councillor. Uh, moving on, uh, I'm presuming that uh, it would be amended to grant decision with uh, section, to grant. Yes. section 75 agreement. And I think the, the, the planning report sets out uh, the various uh, requirements that there would be for a planning obligation at paragraph 14. Yes, 14, 14 is fine. It's a, a, the problem I had with the other one was suggesting, obviously, the this gramping condition for the, the, the bridge that I don't see. Um, obviously, I thought the, the developer's contribution today answered any concerns I had about the, the need for that at this moment, because we can't argue with the council's own figures and we can't argue with the reporter, the same figures that the reporter just recently have done at the the, the site adjacent at the, just up the road. Thank you, Councillor. And, and I suppose moving on, um, what I was thinking you would be suggesting in line with a, a, a matter that was raised in the report is not so much that there be a grampian or suspensive condition to require the works that the, the Council's road section would be asking for, but the, that there would be a suspensive condition that would apply to the applicant carrying out the road works that they've proposed they carry out to the planning authority. And would you be happy that that be a phasing as determined with the, the Director of Development Services acting reasonably? Yes, very, ha very happy with that. Uh, can I also just on one last point, maybe my planning colleagues would uh, want to come in on this matter. Uh, we've obviously got uh, a, a situation where there's housing and there's uh, industrial commercial use proposed on the site. Uh, and I do recall that the applicant's agent, and I think I'm correct in this, said that they would be happy with a condition uh, that would accept uh, an entrenchment of the phasing as indicated by them in relation to how the, the the housing and the industrial commercial use would would come together i'd be happy with the condition but i'm just i'm just it's a question of the wording of that because i want to see it started and i think to say that one of the points was that the the development would be finished and, and you know the economic bit and, I, and I'm, I'm hoping that it doesn't finish that there's other further developments keep on going but the, certainly the development has to start you know the economic development these units have to get built and the jobs have got to be created but it's a it's an agreement between the, the development services and the, and the applicant for that, that thank working. You. But yes, a condition. Uh, uh, thank you. I, I, I suppose that some thinking I might have is that the director would be authorised to determine an appropriate and reasonable phasing programme, perhaps yes. in consultation with the applicant. Yes. Uh, for the commencement of defined phases of the housing proposed for the site linked to completion occupation of industrial commercial development and a suspensive condition would be imposed to that effect. Does that sound? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I think that's helped to clarify my understanding of what your motion would be. Thank you. Do you have a second there? I've got a motion. Oh, I'll second, uh, Thank, thanks. A couple of questions. The uh, what for the, the legal minds and also for the planners. What position would be best protect the council's situation here in relation to any future section seventy five agreement from that site? Uh, the, uh, the proposal 
remember the motion. Yeah, that uh, effectively we approve the application in principle. Uh, the uh, what comeback does the council have uh, at a further stage if things have not uh, transpired to be as uh, straightforward as we first thought? Secondly, the uh, what protection would the, the council have? What protection would the uh, developer have if there, there was a, a, a rejection of their application today, but told to go away and come back within six months with regards to, to the how they proposed to implement the various phases in the development? Because as you're aware, the, there is no there is no uh, alternative for, for someone or for a developer who uh, has has had their application uh, partially rejected, but uh, not wholly. And also the uh, what was it, final final what protections. Would jointly be uh, for for a partnership within the White Cross area. Thank you, convener. I think there were a, a number of points that were made there. Uh, if the the application was to be refused today, I would anticipate there would be a, a right of appeal by the applicant to the, the Scottish Minister's uh, Department of Planning and Environmental Appeals, and the, the matter may then be considered by a, a reporter. In terms of the, the, the first question you raised, uh, the, the Section 75 planning obligation would obviously be drafted in a, as, as watertight a way as we possibly could, and there would also be suspensive or, or negative conditions that would re require to be complied with by the, the, the developer. In terms of the, the planning aspect around uh, that, maybe that's something that one of the planning officers could pick up on. I think if I'm correctly understanding the position, uh, you may be asking what the position would be in relation to uh, any deficit in roadworks? Uh, maybe that's one I could pass over to, to Brent. Brent? Sorry, I'm not, not entirely clear on the on the question. Can can it just be clarified a bit more? Okay, well, what I'm looking for is is both in terms of the the, the actions that would, that would occur uh, if we rejected the application, if we went with the motion today. Uh, and and approve the application. What would the alternative uh, be in terms of the the protections that would be given to the developer? Uh, should the application be refused? And I think that uh, we 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 got that answer from the uh, Leon. Uh, in essence, yeah. the developer has more protections than than the council uh, in relation to the uh, uh, once it's mainly to to grant. So, what I'm looking for is, is I'd like to see this, this development, and I'm sort of talking with two heads, two two hats. So, like the uh, what what would be the position of the, the, the both both parties in the event of of a uh, decision being taken and not not taken. Uh, the uh, we're looking to compare each of the the two areas. And secondly, or thirdly, the uh, in relation to to section seventy five, what protection does the council have if uh, the the developer was to take the heels in and uh, say no, we're, we're going back on what we said before, and uh, we're, we're certainly not going to be paying any real bridge. Actually, Brent, I could perhaps pick up on the, the latter point there. Uh, in terms of a Section 75 obligation, if a decision was taken today that was a, a minded to grant, then it would require to be a Section 75 planning obligation agreed between the, the council and the developer. 
and I think as the developer's agent has noted, they would have to consider their position in terms of the requirements under the Section 75 obligation. And indeed, one thing that we, we often add into a requirement for a Section 75 obligation is that it be completed within six months of the date of the committee decision. And if that isn't the case, then it would come back to the committee for further uh, consideration on why that was the case. So that's maybe something that Council McClucky uh, could have a look at. Uh, if, if ultimately no Section 75 planning obligation could be agreed, uh, then planning permission would not ultimately be issued. Uh, and uh, in that circumstance, and Brent and Berger can keep me can keep me right. I would have thought that uh, a refusal decision would be issued, uh, which would then allow the applicant the opportunity to to raise a right of appeal uh, with the the DPEA, uh, who, who could ultimately take uh, a decision. Uh, in terms of uh, enforcement during the course of a Section 75 planning obligation, a Section 75 planning obligation is in essence a contract between parties, but with the benefit that it runs with the, the land. Uh, so it can be enforced by the, the authority against uh, the owner and the party to the Section 75 planning obligation uh, so there would be enforcement rights that could be taken forward and they would normally involve application ultimately to the court for a, an action required in compliance with the terms of the agreement. Thank you, convener. Mm, yeah, I mean, the point I'm making here is that uh, irrespective of what the outcome is, the, the, the council's position has, has, has been taken in, in relation to, to Negotiations for section seventy-five, uh, the uh, but also the the fact that uh, the 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 developer has uh, the the cushion of appeal, and then taken off the Scottish ministers. Uh, the the uh, in which case the what would happen. I think also, convener, that uh, there are rights under the legislation for an or, or a party to Section 75 uh, to, to raise an application for modification or discharge. I think we've seen a couple of these uh, applications on the agenda today, and then uh, such applications would just require to follow the appropriate process. Thank you, convener. Okay, the, that doesn't mean to say that uh, the questions or any question that has been asked will, will determine the, the, the final position I would adopt. And I don't really, I mean, I was the one that initially moved to continuation of this report uh, 14 years ago. And I did so because I wanted to see economic development on that site. It's a site that was, was uh, allocated to the local plan uh, that's some considerable time ago, uh, 12, 13 years ago, and uh, was was never developed, which was a pity. I wanted to see some development on that site. Also, what was coming across loud and clear was that the officers of the council uh, were having difficulties in terms of the negotiation with the, the, the company. And uh, equally, we, we, what we had to, to see would be a, a, Partnership, if you like. Can convener with great respect. Are you winding up, or, or what is actually happening here? Because I, I'm not really sure if anybody's following the line here, and I don't want to be disrespectful. But are you winding up, or what is it you're doing? Well, I never moved the motion, so I won't be winding up. So, yeah. I, but so what are you doing then? Well, if you, if you look and listen, and maybe you, 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 you perhaps catch on to, to, to that. Because please convener, please convener, don't be disrespectful. I have been listening. disrespectful, Mr. Goldie. The reason I'm saying so is, is because the, uh, the Section 75 agreement is, is, is crucial. We could cost the local authority a great deal of money, a great deal of resources uh, if, uh, if we are wrong. Equally, the, uh, we could lose uh, jobs if we get Section 75 going in the opposite direction. So, it's, it's, it's a crucial element of, of the whole the whole issue of uh, whether or not 
be going to a partnership with the with this company uh, in, in terms of the the economic development aspect of it. Planning is a separate process. The economic development there, there is clear uh, a, 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 a clear policy directive that pushes us towards uh, the uh, the situation whereby we're going against the, the advice of the officers uh, and the in, in terms of the what's contained within this report. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm looking to, to, to try to get as much information as possible, including what the consequences are, both the local authority and the developer. Uh, that's not being disrespectful, that's, that's, that's being factual. That's it, Mr. Bruce. Thank you, thank you, Kimbina. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me, something must look there. Um, Number of elements in this. Uh, Brent, it's all right if I ask you uh, one or two questions, but I will, it's the hopefully short ones. Um, the industrial side of the development, um, we're talking about being in a number of phases. How many phases is it going to be in? Brent. You're on mute, Brent. Brent, is that better? Yeah, it's better. Yeah, sorry. The the indicative phasing plan that the applicant has submitted, um, noting it's only only indicative, of course, um, indicates uh, two two phases of um, industrial uh, business. Okay. Am I right in understanding from what uh, was was well presented there by the applicants' agents um, that? Phase one is the only one that basically guaranteeing will happen, uh, and phase two will only be driven by demand. Uh, but the housing side, the, the the full housing side will go ahead. Is that correct? Well, I think I think the only the only indication we're being given at the moment is that um, the housing and the business um, first phases would carry out um, at the same time. But um, I think in terms of completion of the industrial, that would be that would be market lead. Yeah, that's, sorry, that, 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 is, that is what I picked up. So so phase two is not guaranteed unless unless the market decide, decides um, to, no. get, to get involved uh, as well. I think I think, um, I think our concern would be if, um, if all the housing progressed, but we didn't see any return on the on the industrial business. Um, Provision, so we we would want to try and safeguard that through through yeah, some phasing I, I, provisions. I, I see why that's why you're putting in the the suspensive on the completion and occupancy uh, side side of it. Um, and in a way, that's almost a, a suspensive condition by uh, the the developer. Um, if we don't get this, we're not doing it. Um, so, but so so I suppose if it's good for one, it's good for the other. Um, at the last meeting we had. Um, I seconded Councillor Coombs, and Councillor Coombs had actually um, supported the Office of Recommendations. And given that it doesn't uh, tie up with the Local Development Plan 2, it doesn't tie up with IR06 for active travel routes, it doesn't tie up with IR05 travel, travel hierarchy, it doesn't tie up with PO, PO1 placemaking. And very, very importantly to me, although it's not in the it's not tied in the recommendations, and I think even the, the mover of the motion has suggest, has said that I think he said is it's not needing a it's not needing a double bridge just now. I think and I don't mean to misquote you, John, but I think that that's what you said. That suggests to me that even he thinks it's going to need one at, at some point. Um, I'm not again, but but I do think it will need it. I'll count the officers. If the council tell us that it's going to need it, I think the cost actually was four and a half million. I think in the, in the previous one, and that doesn't include the other works that are going to be required. All I can see is that that cost is going to come directly to Falkirk Council if we don't tie it up now in a section seventy five, which I think what David was getting at is how important the, the, the section seventy five is at this point in time. I've got to say, if this goes through, 
um, and I understand suspensive conditions are, are being are not being allowed. I will put in a, a, a further amendment if it does go through, because I think the suspensive commission uh, conditions have got got to go in there, not to protect me, but to protect Falkirk Council and the finances of Falkirk Council, um, because all this is going to do is, uh, and sadly, co it costs Falkirk Council a lot of money. It would have been great if it was in a, a better. The, the place that it was in was better than the roads access was great to it, um, but but it's not. Um, that, that's quite clear that, that it's not. Um, so with that, um, I have to. As there's a motion being raised, I have to put an, am an amendment to um, refuse as per um, the officer's recommendations. But I, I am adding into that. I ask people to think about this. This. this this could end up costing Falkirk Council a lot of money in the future. This is this is a significant amount of money. It's not a couple of hundred thousand pounds. Well, we know four and a half million for the bridge, which was told to us, and I'm sure it was the last uh, report that we got, and that doesn't include the other parts on top of that as well. Um, please uh, ask us to think about it. Um, I do, I think nobody might second me. Who knows? Um, but but that's where I am at it. Uh, hopefully, John, I've been uh, respectful enough on what you said. I, I don't. I was in no way mean to be uh, to misquote you or anything on you said. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Convener. Councillor Nemo, then Provost. Yeah. Thanks, Convener. I'll be I'll be quick. Can I just add that on the whole, I would like to see this going ahead for the the benefit of the the local area involved. Uh, but I think we're we're maybe missing the the point here slightly. There's 400 new residential properties earmarked for this area. Currently, there's no infrastructure in place to support these. How is that going to be accommodated? It's all very well saying section 75 this, section 75 that, but there's no guarantee that we would get that money up front. It's probably after the properties are built. So. I would make a plea that there is obviously an issue regarding the funding, uh, and it's how we go about tackling that that's going to be the problem. But I would like to see the benefits of this application taking forward for the benefit of the local community. But uh, I would just like to highlight the issue that the funding and the infrastructure. Thanks, convener. Yeah, good points. Anyone else? Hey, Provost. Uh, thank you, convener. Convener, I'm going to be like an old record because every time this has come up, I've usually been the first one to speak because maybe I've got more, um, as we say, a bigger record with this one being the convener of planning. This has been in. You've got to remember is that this, the application for White Cross for 1,500 houses was in for over 10 years. Now, for 10 years, there were applications came up to the committee then they were held up. Applications come back to the committee. It was held up because you could never ever sign the section 75 because of the problems, as Councillor uh, McClucky alluded to, because the bank and it was, it was problems with getting access, etc. But the fact of the matter is, is that this was what they called a major residential-led re regeneration initiative. There were four special areas for Falkirk: uh, Bowness, White Cross, Lamanon, and Bank North. Now, there's never been one house that's been built there. But the fact of the matter is, there were hundreds of thousands of pounds of council money spent with officers continually working on this application for 10 years. We're not talking about a year or two years or three years. We're talking about over 10 years. Then suddenly, when the Section 75, it was determined that it could never be signed, then the application was eventually withdrawn when members refused the application. What happened then, convener, was they come in, the same company then that couldn't get the 1500, came back in for a site, no in the local plan, for 200 houses in that area. And eventually it was recommended by the officers, first of all, to grant. It was, it was granted, but then there were problems because of the erroneous conditions in relation to section 75 so I went to appeal and they won they won the appeal I'm really really disappointed at what seems to be the negativity of the fact is that we've got an opportunity 
to do something in terms of economic development that would create hundreds, and as Councillor McClucky says, maybe thousands of jobs, along with providing housing for that area to regenerate it. I'm going to say what I said that the night that we did, we went to White Cross. Every single member of the council that was there stood up with the community and said, we want White Cross regenerated. And I think there was the apathy then set in because of the fact that it wasn't going anywhere. It kept coming back to committee, and at the end there, they couldn't get the section 75 agreed. So at the end there, it went away again, then four or five months it came back. And during this period of time, we were getting letters to the Royal Bank of Scotland to see quite clearly to members of the committee, this isn't going to go ahead. Forget about it. But the fact is that we continually put this forward. Remember, 10 years application been coming forward for this site. And the fact is that the people up in that White Cross must have thought, well, we're never, ever going to get anything happening. One of the issues that Councillor McClucky brought up, and I've got to agree with him, is the fact is that in terms of conditions, we've got to ensure that there's no erroneous conditions here that may halt if this application is granted. In terms of the off-site proposals that was put forward by that very credible gentleman, totally, I totally agree with that. And the plans for phasing, totally, totally agree with that. This application, this isn't me standing up and saying, well, oh, I support White Cross. I've stood up for more than 10 years and supported the regeneration of White Cross as I've done with Bonus, as I did with Banknote, and I did with Slomanin that never ever materialised. This application will be beneficial in terms of the, the situation we're going through the new with the pandemic. We heard Mr. Rupi, the um, our economic, economic department for the last time he was here. He wasn't negative. He said that Falkirk's open for business. Well, let's hope we're open for business and let's hope that White Cross gets the application through just now and it's a, it's a way forward for regeneration of Falkirk. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wish to contribute from the floor? Is there uh, anyone uh, from the economic development here? I think Mr. Reid was there. Yeah, I don't know if he's going. Yes, hello, I'm here. What's your, your, your perception of the what's been discussed so far? Um, I'm happy to answer that, but I am conscious that I think Councillor Kerr has been looking to come in for quite some time, convener, and it's just okay. in case it's anything related to I'm, uh, I might answer on, Fine. or unless Councillor Kerr is happy for me to continue, convener. Councillor Kerr? Just continue, Pete. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I don't think I quite paraphrased it as uh, open for business, but certainly uh, Falkirk and the proposal is very much in line with our economic strategy and what we're doing. Uh, but we must be mindful in being uh, in open inverted commas, open for business, that we have to do things in line with the, the planning policy. Uh, and that is where my, uh, my comment on that would begin and my comment on that would end. Uh, the interest that has been shown by the companies that has been expressed to us uh, through a third party and not the applicant. Uh, that interest is uh, showing that there are companies that are keen to come in. The size of those companies, the size of the businesses uh, are varied, the uses are varied, and I suppose uh, it, in terms of any future success of any area of regeneration, it's ensuring that um, businesses coming in are going to look to ensure that they're not going to be impacted by any potential future um, infrastructure issues that would prohibit growth or future investment in that regard. But that is not for me to particularly comment on with regard to this application. That is very much for my colleagues in the planning and the roads department. But notwithstanding that, I, I can confirm that there is uh, several expressions of interest that I understand have been made in the site. Some of those, uh, I, I can't comment any further as to what extent those expressions of interest uh, ha have been taken to, uh, but at this point in time, uh, the regeneration proposals of the White Cross area certainly would accord with our overall economic growth strategy. Uh, 
Interestingly, I would say as well that um, as a consequence of the pandemic, it's very much about community well-being as well as economic growth. So it's about what, what we can offer, uh, what potential there is for our communities in terms of jobs and training, et cetera. And certainly this investment would accord with that. But again, I would come back to my specific comment regarding ensuring that attracting such investment in is supported with appropriate infrastructure. Thank you, Anyone else? Mr. Kerr. Thanks, thanks, Provost. Uh, I'll know go on and on, uh, Provost, uh, Convener. What I will highlight is, it was noted previously by uh, the Provost that 1,500 houses were previously allocated for this area. And it was in the local development plan. I was astounded when it wasn't taken forward to put in local development plan two. Out of the 4,800 4, houses that was in local development plan one, 3,600 were taken out. So, as in doing the plan, the plan's there as a purpose, but it doesn't always bring you the fruits that you're looking for. Uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, convener, uh, having had uh, previous uh, community meetings uh, years ago regarding the when the brickwork shut down, most of the people in White Cross were there, uh, who, who worked there, and Madison, who worked there, Pullman, Bones. Uh, this could inactivate that work again for them. As highlighted by Councillor uh, McClucky, I get notified by residents, constituents for White Cross, who can't get the houses next to their families, uh, this will enable them potentially to be able to do that. Uh, I didn't think, listening to Mr. Snedden, the transport assessment expert, I don't think there will be a new bridge needed in the future. Uh, I think White Cross is serviced by five different entrances to the village. Five different entrances. Uh, and if the when the traffic for the work, if this was passed, uh, is used in a in a way that they can only use one way. Uh, I'm, I'm sure at work. Uh, great. One of the one of the points that sees in the report on a few times, convener, is that uh, the Hainan Road, if it was two metres and three metres, that they're no in possession of uh, land ownership. I think that's very misleading and it should be retracted because ownership planning views isn't irrelevant to plan application. It doesn't matter who owns the land. So it is, it, it, for me, it shouldn't have been in the, in the report. Uh, also, I'm, I, before I, I, I wind up, convener, uh, can I ask, just as Brent, through all the reports, the first, well, the last four, August, 28th of August 2019, there were four reasons for refusal. In June 2020, there were five reasons for refusal. 17th of March, 
four reasons back down to four. Then today, it's four again. Is it because the developers have met one of the criteria that the that it's went down to four again? I'm struggling to recall, Councillor. It's over a very long period of time. Um... We did at some point add in a, an additional reason for refusal because with LDP2 coming in, yeah. uh, the site became solely a, a business um, employment site. Um, we're also operating under um, a series of new new policies. So it could have could have been at some point we, we rationalised the, the reasons for refusal to tie in with the new, the new policy framework that we're okay, operating babe. under. Thank, thank you very much. And just closing, uh, convener, uh, I think the the mixed use will benefit the area, not just White Cross, but the Upper Braes and Lower Braes, and it will bring uh, prosperity to the village. Uh, and I will be supporting uh, the motion. Thanks, convener. Okay, the uh, anyone else? Ian. Thank you for, for letting me in. Uh, hold it, convener. Councillor, Councillor Hughes wants in, and then I'd like to sum up, please. Right, well, I've been waiting for him. a wee while. Sorry? I have been waving for a wee while. My apologies. I've my not apologies. been like the drowning man waving. My apologies. There's just a couple of get, points. Hang, hang, hang on a minute, Gordon. Can we get sorry. the legal, legal viewpoint to bring us up to date? Sorry. Thank you, Convener. It was simply to say uh, two things. It was just to clarify, I think we have a motion by Councillor McClucky and uh, Councillor Kerr. Did you second the motion there? Not yet. Not yet. So I don't think we... Councillor Blackwood. Councillor Blackwood seconded it. Four days ago, or it feels <laughs> feel like four days ago. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Councillor Blackwood. At the moment, we, we have, and it was, it was this particular point I was wanting to flag up, we have an amendment by Councillor Bowes to refuse in accordance with the officer recommendations. I'll and second, was, I'll second Councillor Bowes. Can I also flag up something else, Councillor Bowes? I think I, I got the suggestion that you were wishing to give notice of a, a further amendment. It was just to flag up uh, in our standing orders at Standing Order 25. It states that no member may move more than one amendment to a motion. So I think where you proposed an amendment, you would be precluded from then giving notice of making a further amendment. So ap apologies for that news. Just to try and help things along, of course, Councillor Hughes, who had only moved the amendment, could move the motion. And that, and that would change it all around a bit. Anyone else? Well, that, that, yeah. Go to the vote. So hold that a second. Hold that a second. I haven't spoken yet. On you, Gordon. Um, I was just going to say to um, Councillor Goldie, thank you for, for that interpretation there. <laughs> that was excellent. Thank you. Um, that obviously it's up to Councillor Bowes if he would agree to me just putting my name to the motion and then he could put in a further amendment. If that is acceptable to Mr Henderson, that would be a good idea. Okay. Well, we're just Thank waiting. You. The, 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 the wording does indeed say no member may move more than one amendment. It doesn't say may not second uh, an amendment. Thank you. Right. Okay. Thank you, Dennis. That that was excellent. Thank you. Okay. The, the, what I wanted to ask was a couple of questions in relation to the Meyerhead uh, Railway Bridge. Um, can, in the report on page 13, it says um, an overbridge um, on Meyerhead with an appropriate grading. Could I ask the Roads Department what they mean by an appropriate grading? Uh, convener, in, in in that context, an appropriate grading just means that it's not too steep in uh, you know in, in, in layman's terms. 
um, could I could I then say to you, using my initial uh, um, what, what I used uh, as a, an example would be a low loader with a with a bulldozer on top, trying to get up um, this the the current gradient. Would that cause construction traffic difficulties? <laughs> um. It depends how you quantify difficulties. I mean, the, the gradient of the bridge is one of the concerns that we have with the bridge, and, and, and the concern that we have is that heavy moving or heavy, slow moving vehicles, um, they take a while to go up steep hills. So I wouldn't like to say with any certainty that, that the gradient that's there at the moment would prohibit heavy, slow moving vehicles from, from tackling the gradient. Um, but as I say, one of the concerns we have is that if you have a lot of these vehicles trying to perform that movement, then that's going to have a ripple effect on the remainder of the traffic trying to go the same direction. Well, that, that was the point I was just going to make. And thank you for that, um, because I, I had visions of a whole series of construction vehicles stretching back up up the hill past the Campbell's uh, meat factory or um up to the, the 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 main road up to the the main road and that road itself all the way down into white cross and up to the bridge is a very narrow road in itself <coughs> so if we had a number of uh, construction vehicles um coming that way my view is that 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 would not be uh, shall we say conducive to good infrastructure. Um, would you agree with me on that? I, I would. Um, that, that, that's why we're seeking an improvement to the, the infrastructure that's there. Yeah. Can I also ask, um, in terms of the the the, the railway overbridge on Mirehead Road, would you think that from a, an infrastructure point of view, that um, that having a, a two-way railway overbridge would in fact aid um, the growth potential um, of the area by having sufficient good infrastructure? I don't think I'm qualified to speak on the effect of infrastructure on growth and economic development and that sort of thing. Um, I, th I think anecdotally, if I, you know, if I was looking to purchase a site, I would look for a site that's well served by by you know the infrastructure in terms of you know roads, power, gas, whatever it may be that I'm interested in. Um, but that's probably beyond beyond my re remit to to, no, to, no, to comment well, on that. You. Well, thank you, Mr. Russell. Could I then um, move the same question to economic development? Uh, or to a planner for their view. Hello, Councillor Hughes, it's Peter Reid yes. here. Sorry, could you just clarify again the, the point you were seeking well, me to what make? Well, what I'm making, the point I'm making is that if developments um, don't have good infrastructure, then the the future potential of a particular site it doesn't matter where it is could actually be constrained even although you may have had lots of interest or um or people saying they might be interested in coming into a site but if you don't have sufficient and proper infrastructure whether it is um widening roads appropriate bridges um which which don't actually or potentially uh, wouldn't um, cause bottlenecks. Um, that's what I'm getting at, is the future potential in terms of infrastructure. Yes, I understand what you're saying, and it kind of reflects the comments I just made a few moments ago with regard to uh, the investment of the area. In terms of the existing infrastructure that's there at the moment, I'm not specialised enough to comment on its capacity. I think I must underscore that in the first instance. However, looking at the information that we've been provided in terms of the, the likely uses that will come onto the site, 
notwithstanding the development phase, but you're looking at there being a bottling plant, a soft tissue paper plant, startup units, um, materials, uh, concrete, block, concrete block manufacturing plant, um, and uh, some other uh, training academy as well. These are all going to generate significant uh, traffic. So I would defer again back to my colleagues in planning and transport to ensure that where an area is being master planned to, uh, to ensure that you're getting this, the best economic benefit out of the area, you don't want to be uh, creating a situation where that economic benefit could be constrained because the appropriate infrastructure is in place, isn't in place. Mr. Reid, can I also ask you, um, if in fact, um, Meyerhead Road Bridge um, or the overbridge um, is a necessity for future growth potential. My words, um, would who would actually down further down the line if the the bridge had to be replaced with a, a two way railway bridge, who would actually pay for that? Um. I think that's very much a subject of the planning application. I'd maybe defer to Mr. Whittle on this because um, these areas of weakness within any development uh, would be sought to be addressed within a planning application and the recommendations that officers are making. Uh, so with regard to the bridge and future replacement of the bridge or concern about the replacement of the bridge, if it isn't addressed and the bridge becomes weaker uh, as a consequence of the investment that's made, then it could rest potentially with the council to redress that. However, I will defer to my roads and planning colleagues on that just to verify that point, councillor. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whittle. Yeah, sorry, councillor. It was just to confirm the point that uh, Pete is making there. The planning permission was granted for this development. Um, and then subsequently it transpired that improvements were required to the rail bridge. Uh, the council couldn't retrospectively uh, seek those improvements from the Don't know. Sorry. Sorry, Bernard, I didn't quite hear that. Sorry, I'll, I'll say again, if, if, uh, if planning permission was granted for this development uh, on the basis that's before you today, uh, and then it's subsequently at some point in the future, uh, if it was then uh, decided that some improvements were required to the rail bridge, the council couldn't retrospectively seek those improvements uh, from, from the current uh, applicants uh, and developers of this site. Right, thank you. Um, so, so basically, my concern, if I put it this way, was that with all the, um, it, shall we say, advanced interest in the, the 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 business side, um, it would involve an awful an, a number of heavy vehicles, um, irrespective of whether it's concrete, whether it's um, bottle distribution or whatever. These are these are reasonably heavy vehicles, um, and and my concern was that the bridge would become a bottleneck without the 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 enhanced infrastructure. That was really the point I was making. Would you agree with that? Also, I think as you'll see from the reports that have been presented, um, the comments from the council's roads unit. Uh, to raise the concerns uh, in relation to the level of infrastructure uh, to serve these proposals. So I, th I think that the issues raised there are, are already noted within the reports uh, and in the recommendation uh, for refusal. Right, thank you. Can I ask just one more question? Um, it was in relation to um, Haining Wood. Um, I noticed that within the report it said that um, it would be enhanced, Haining would, would be enhanced, but could you actually define for me what enhancement means? 
I'll, I'll perhaps defer that question to, to Brent. Can you pick that up? Yeah, that, that's fine. Yeah, um, we'd be looking for a um, a woodland management plan so that hanging wood was properly managed in the future. Um, explore opportunities for additional planting, and also potentially a um, enhancement to the to the um, to the roots, the paths that go through the through the wood. Can I just ask one further question, convener? My last question. Um, in relation to Haining Wood, um, to preserve the trees in Haining Wood um, from, uh, shall we say, uh, being knocked down due to inadvertence, um, would, would planning have to put in um, a, a tree order for each individual tree in Haining Wood? Well, I think we would look to secure the um... The retention and protection of the um, existing woodland through the through the planning process, and we'd also um, look to ensure that the wood was actually fenced off so that um, construction activity couldn't adversely affect the, the woodland. Yeah, but in terms of actually preserving trees, is it not the case that a tree preservation order would probably be the the best would also have to be included? Also, Hughes, perhaps I can pick that point up. Yeah. Certainly, um, tree preservation orders are a, a stronger, firmer way of ensuring protection of trees. Uh, right. It's certainly a, a, a firmer tool uh, than, say, a planning condition would be. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank yeah. you, convener. Thanks, Gordon. The uh, yeah. over to you. Can I go again to sum up? Yeah, 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 definitely correct. Yes. Right. Yes, you can right. I would like to clarify a few points here in my, in my summing up, and obviously, um, get rid of a number of red herons here. Obviously, the master plan tells you that the, this application is going to create woodland, don't a desolate, rather than a desolate place it's there. So I don't understand what we're talking about tree preservation orders. There's not been any survey done in the Haining Wood to say if you just said a blanket TPO in them, half the trees might be might be dying as it is. So we've not even been assessed. But as I say, is that'll be a part of the master plan and the things for the obviously to create the woodland in that that is going to be agreed by development services. Um as for to talk about future development about the 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 bridge. Because um, obviously two members have brought that up. What I've already turned around and says is in planning that you've got to deal with material reasons. To get conditions and to get obviously section 75s, it's got to be relative to this application, not where many developments may be coming to more or more houses or, or more things. It's got to be relative to this and it's got to be fair and proportionate. What, we, what you can ask of a developer to do a uh, to pay for the now for somebody else's development in the future if it comes or doesn't it come because we've not got any you know crystal balls and as I say so it, it doesn't meet the test so as I say is to talk about the bridge the figures on the the council's own figures as stated by Alex Van earlier on does not meet the requirement at this stage of the thing mate. and because we're only dealing with the application in front of us we can't look at it as for other points that's came up we talked about what would be the benefits of the application we've already agreed certain conditions we've agreed a, a contribution to improve the capacity of white cross school we've agreed to a, a contribution to graham high school without the contribution to the m9 a roundabout the, the the upgrade of the M9 junction at Lethal and Roundabout couldn't go ahead because it requires the benefit the the contributions for the three sites to contribute to deliver that. So if we didn't pass that the day, there wouldn't be a, an upgrade to that that junction. We've agreed that uh, the service the um, the gas the service and the pay of buskins out to to go into this site, you know, a few hundred yards for the village. So they're going to get an improved uh, service. We've agreed open space provision, but only if it's no mate on site and play provision. Now, 
if it's made on site, then then that there doesn't need to pay the contributions. But the people from White Cross can use that increased play provision that's not there at the moment. As I say, is they're kicking a boy out next to a burden. Um, and as I say, so this could this will definitely be be handed or contribution towards uh, healthcare. Now th these these are are the things that was agreed in the section seventy five. We've talked about the benefits to the past rather than get run down with motorbikes. We've talked about stopping the the illegal tipping. We've talked about the jobs. We've talked about the recovery, the regeneration of the village. Now. I didn't, I didn't see, you know, what the issue is. Also, we talked about when obviously Councillor Kerr spoke earlier on, he said about the 3,600 houses coming out of the local plan. Over 3,000 of them came out in my ward, right? 1,700, obviously 1,500 for White Cross, and there was about 700 who was Slamanin, and then we had, as I say, his lime rigging that. So we had all these houses coming, coming out. To the local plan. What did that mean by taking them out? Gilson went ahead. Twelve years ago, I was hearing statements, and as I say, as I mind um, Malcolm, who's on here today, saying, "Well, when is the garden centre and things going to happen at Gilson? We're still waiting for for it's going to happen in Gilson. We've got but what they did is thirteen hundred objections, right? They put the housing in Gilson. They put the housing in Larbor." That they didn't want. They put the housing in Bowness that they didn't want, and they put housing at Madison Fire Station, which the community didn't want. So there's there's four applications because White Cross was too good and we weren't allowed to put it back in. So that that's that's the facts in the, in creating this. As I say, this is a a, a great proposal. We're also a, you convener mentioned the question: What is the benefits of Supporting this and planning and principle, and uh, and what is the safeguards um, in the future? Well, the benefits would be that um, by saying we're obviously um, minded to grant here of way in principle should plan and present principle be granted, is that the person who has the contact, know the the applicant who spoke today. The person who's offered to buy the site, who has all these connections from people who wants to come and develop the, the industry, the business side of this, can then move forward. If we didn't pass it today, the person's not going to buy the site, and then all the interests are not going to come into the Falkirk area. That's, that, that's, that's the two differences by this application. What is the safeguards? The safeguards is that once the businesses come, Size and scale of these um, units, these um, things that the, that the companies say that they want, will come in in a full application. They'll come in there, and members will be able to adjudicate them and 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 look at them and and get further information. That will allow that to happen. Companies are not going to come in and and get architects up to pay many tens of thousands of pounds to come up with proposals um, and bring them in front of us. If they're not getting a, a plan in, a, a, in principle a, to, to, to go forward. So we're only allowing the, a, a, to move forward to a level to get all the information and, and they seek to get the show on the road and, and make Falkirk a, a better place to live and for the people in that area. So that's that's my, my summing up. Um, as I say, but every member's entitled to their own their own view. And as I say, say, but that's that's my view. Thanks very much, Ken. Okay, Ian, over to you. If there's no one else. Thank you, Convener. Uh, I think it's probably worth kind of taking, trying to take copious notes of matters. I think it's worth reading out uh, what I understand the motion to be in some detail. That was a motion by Councillor McCluckey, seconded by Councillor Blackwood. And please bear with me. The committee being satisfied on matters of access and transportation as addressed by the applicant and their proposal submitted to the planning authority and agreeing the benefits of the proposed development, which are the potential economic and employment benefits, the reuse of a brownfield site and enhancement of Almond Castle and Haining Wood, and which benefits stroke material considerations are considered to outweigh the development plan, 
agrees that it is minded to grant planning permission in principle subject to the completion within six months of today's date uh, of a planning obligation within the terms of section 75 of the Town and Country Planning Scotland Act 1997 in terms satisfactory to the Director of Development Services in respect of one, a proportionate contribution towards addressing future capacity issues at White Cross Primary School, two, a proportionate contribution towards addressing future capacity issues at Graham High School, three, a proportionate contribution towards the upgrade of M9 Junction 4, Lath Allen Roundabout, four, a contribution to fund diversion of the existing local bus service into the site, Five, the provision of 25% of the residential units at the site as affordable housing, an open space contribution at the rate of £1,911 per dwelling house and £955.50 per flat, which will be determined by the amount and type of on site provision, and a proportionate contribution towards addressing local healthcare impacts. Thereafter, on conclusion of the Section 75 planning obligation to remit to the Director of Development Services to grant planning permission in principle subject to appropriate conditions as determined by him. In terms of that, there was mention of a condition in relation to a construction asset management plan and specifically the, the director shall be authorised to determine acting reasonably a phasing programme for completion of the upgrading works to Meyerhead Road and Haining Road in accordance with the details submitted by the applicants and that in advance of commencement of defined phases of development in the site and a suspensive condition shall be imposed to that effect. Lastly, the said director is also authorised to determine an appropriate and reasonable phasing programme in consultation with the applicant for the commencement of defined phases of the housing proposed for the site linked completion occupation of industrial commercial development and a suspensive condition shall be imposed to that effect. And apologies for reading that out in full, but I thought it was probably worthwhile doing so as a matter of import. And then we have an amendment by Councillor Hughes, seconded by Councillor Bouse, and that is to refuse the applicant application in accordance with the officer recommendations. So with that said, I would take a, a roll call vote. So Councillor Alexander. Provost Buchanan. Provost Buchanan. Motion. Thank you, Provost. Councillor Blackwood. A motion. Councillor Bouse. Councillor Goldie. Sorry, I, I couldn't hear that. Councillor Sorry, Goldie, could you, you hear me there? Uh, no, I the motion. Thank you, Councillor Goldie. Councillor Hughes. The amendment. Councillor Kerr. Um, motion. Was that? Apologies, Councillor Kerr. Motion. Thank you. Councillor McHugh. For the amendment. Councillor McClucky. Motion. Councillor Murta. Amendment. Councillor Nicol. The motion. And Councillor Nimmo. Motion. So we have seven votes for the motion, four votes for the amendment and one abstention. On that basis, the motion is carried. I noted earlier that there was a notice of further amendment. Uh, uh, Mr. Um, I, I thought at the time it may, it may, it may go through and, and it seems it will. It will. I've got to ask a question. The problem is it's you, because I know Ian, you deal, no, sorry, you don't write them. You, you, you write what you're told to write, but Section 75 is written in legal terms, so it's, it's probably going back to Bernard. Bernard, is it possible um, to do uh, 
part of the 75 agreement where should the bridge require to be renewed that um, uh, either all or a portion of the cost of it would return back to this development. Chair, what is the amendment that's being moved? Yeah. We've, we've, we've been through the business of the meeting. Therefore, now we've had notice of an amendment. We need to hear what the amendment is going to be before there's any further discussion. Yes, I'm, I'm trying to get hold for an amendment that, that hopefully will be comfortable with everybody. Oh, but it's, I'm not comfortable with it in the sense that the business has been done. Tell us what the amendment is, and then yes, you can the, ask questions. The, 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 amendments, the, the amendment is to add in as one of the conditions in the section 75 that there will be a payment for the bridge uh, should it be required. Fine. Can I also point out that uh, there's never been a restriction on questions being asked by members. Yeah. Well, there's such a thing though as standing orders convener, and you know that. Yes, and standing orders are quite specific in relation to questions. <laughs> convener, through your good self, convener, could I ask a question to see with Mr Henderson whether that's competent? Thank you, Provost and Convener. Uh, I'm just looking through the circular which sets out the, the policy tests that you would be looking uh, to, to comply with in, in dealing with these matters. And I suppose one question I would ask of my planning colleagues is, my understanding is that the, the infrastructure works that were being asked for to be carried out weren't so much related to the strength of the bridge, but to ensure that it could be used as a, a two-way, a two-way bridge that rather than just a one-way bridge. Ian, that's my understanding. I think in terms of the circular advice on section 75, uh, probably the relevant points are that agreement has to be reasonable and proportionate. Um, I think the issue might well come up in trying to negotiate an agreement along the terms that Councillor Bowes is suggesting is where would the triggers be? Uh, what would be the evidence to support um, any contribution to be paid? And what would the level of that contribution be? So it's, um, it's potentially um, along the lines you're suggesting, uh, you could be asking a developer to, to basically sign a blank check. Right. Uh, unless you can quantify exactly the extent of the amount and what works would be required and what the triggers would be uh, that would require that um, those works to be carried out. So I don't know if that helps at all. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I think that helps to clarify matters to, to a degree, Bernard, and I think uh, I have to say, Councillor Bowes, that I suspect uh, such a, a requirement may fail the, the tests contained in the, the, the circular by the Scottish Government. Uh, and uh, I think there would be a degree of competence, but I, I would have to caution that uh, I suspect that may not survive should it be challenged by the applicant. Okay, um, and in that case, and as I, as I was trying to ask the questions before to try and tie that down before before I stated, um, I, it sounds like I don't have much choice. And if we get hit for a, a, a huge bill for for a bridge later, then we do. It's um, sad but true. Okay, Councillor Murtagh. Oh dear. The vote's been taken. The vote's, can vote's I been taken. taken. Excuse Mr. me, I have a follow-up. Well, first question. of all, I've got to ask a question, the yes. legal officer. Stand in order. The vote Murtagh. has been taken. Councillor Murtagh. Stand in order, convener. I'm asking for a legal ruling on that. Uh, th thank you, Councillor Goldie, and thank you, Convener. Um, we, we did take a vote, and the motion was successful, but Councillor Bowes had uh, made an intimation of uh, a further amendment. 
So was that for the amendment that he was just discussing there, Councillor Gold? But it was it wasn't a second did. It, it hasn't been seconded. No other members had the opportunity to come in so far. Well, members the matter. So before, and I, I think there's, there are standing orders. There's also such a thing as manners as well. Um, and I think that unfortunately, um, what I was trying to clarify, I think what Councillor Bouse was trying to clarify is framing the words of his amendment in in a competent manner, which I think. I've come to see a standard practice, and I, I want hope to... you're not suggesting that I'm not mannerly. Councillor like Goldie, young lady, can you yeah. stop interve inter inter intervening in people? You should withdraw it now. Nadina, hey, Mr. Goldie, can you please stop intervening in other people's contributions? I'll, I'll just let the intervention <clears throat> speak for itself. So I think that basically, um, what I would like to see, and what I'd like to ask of the legal department um, in order to understand whether we can have a competent further amendment is that in, in previous applications, we have looked at not so much um, that we can't we can't say, okay, it's going to cost 2 million, it's going to cost 10 million, but we what we do is we specify a criteria. For example, when we have a, a school for a section 75, we don't necessarily know how much it's going to be. We just know that this that the contribution for so many if we have so many children or whatever will be this. So I suppose what Councillor Bowes was was potentially, I think, trying to get to is that whether there was a criteria rather than an amount that we could, if it was required, therefore impose in Section 75. And I do recall a previous planning application that we passed where we didn't know whether a transport contribution would be required um, because it we didn't know, and this was just for clarity at the junction at Tim Hortons, we said that we didn't know whether there would need to be an amount put in because we couldn't at this at that time clarify what the impact would be. Therefore, at a different at a future date, if it was required, we could go back and ask for a contribution on that. So I know that in that case we did have an amount in mind because it was a specific thing. But if the criteria was basically that um a bit more like some of our other contributions that if the infrastructure was required and um, that we could then go back and ask for a section 75 contribution because would it not still meet the test under that side of things and we don't necessarily when we enter into a 75 section 75 obligation have to have an amount in mind and then that that would perhaps safeguard the council against that uh, in, in future but give us a, an ability to frame it in such a way that wouldn't um, legally, um, you know, kind of fill the test. So just before Councillor Bouse withdraws his amendment, can we get some cl uh, clarity on that? The amendment wasn't a competent convener, so therefore he doesn't need to withdraw it. It's no competent. Mr. It's been legally defined as incompetent. Mr. Bow, we'll, we'll, we'll get that ruling. Hmm. Yeah. I think convener in terms of straight wording. Uh, I, I wasn't suggesting it would be incompetent. I think what I was saying is that we, we could try to produce something uh, that may be challengeable in the future, that the, the applicant may be able to raise a modification of a Section 75. Uh, I'm just looking at the policy tests now for a Section 75 planning obligation. Uh, so it needs to be something that's necessary to make the proposed development acceptable in planning terms. It needs to serve a planning purpose uh, and where it's possible to identify infrastructure provision requirements in advance should relate to development plans, which is maybe something that my planning colleagues might want to comment on. It needs to relate to the proposed development either as a direct consequence of the development or arising from the cumulative impact of development in the area. So there would have to be some thought given to, would it be entirely this development that would lead to uh, perhaps uh, a weight issue that would have to be rectified? It needs to fairly and reasonably relate in scale and kind to the, the proposed development and uh, be reasonable in all other respects. Uh, so I think we've got a, a series of uh, tests there. Perhaps my planning colleagues could comment on uh, on how they may be applied. Well, as you've said, Ian, there are a number of tests that would need to be complied with uh, for any wording to be uh, be suitable and acceptable. 
Um, so it's perhaps the devil's in the detail in any um, discussion or negotiation, uh, if that's the route that members wish to take. Um, but it would be, I'd say, a note of caution there. Um, but I think the indication is there that um, it's not necessarily straightforward, uh, the sort of, um, sort of approach proposed there. So just, just to clarify then, because that was my question. So my, my question is, Mr Henderson has not said that Councillor Bruce's um, potential amendment is incompetent. It's just that we'd need to be careful in how we would frame such an amendment um, to make it quite an unusual practice is that we don't at this stage nail down that wording. We leave that to officers within a certain, uh, you know, within certain frameworks and, and say within, within the planning framework, we kind of leave that to you to a certain extent. But the the general principle um, of having this is going through, but a further amendment would be that given the recommendations that were put before the planning committee by officers in the first place, that we have an amendment which enables planning officers to go away and, and look at that specific issue about the bridge, which I think was one of the things which which was brought up so much and which was the subject of what Councillor Bass was trying to put forward. I do not second such a thing. I think maybe Councillor just to, just to add a planning obligation is an agreement between two parties. And so perhaps the other point there is that uh, any agreement would have to be joint uh, between the council and the applicants as well. Convener. Convener, with your leave, uh, I, I wonder if uh, an approach may be in that circumstance to consider uh, an amendment, a further amendment, be a, and dare I say, a continuation to allow officers to consider and no. perhaps have discussions with the no. applicant. No. Uh, no. Uh, my fear. The, the apologies, the convener is having difficulty with his laptop at the moment. Uh, would it be helpful if we had a five minute recess at this point? I know it's unfortunate timing, but to see if we can get the, the <coughs> convener's uh, computer working properly again. Uh, Mr Henderson, I've got, I've got one word to say about this situation at the moment. We've taken a decision. OK, we've we'll come in. Councillor, Councillor Bowie's come in with an amendment, a further amendment. The fact is, it's no competent. It doesn't matter where you go with it, it's no competent. That's my perfect position. There seems to be a desperation here. That's my word for it. And the fact is that if you're, if you're saying, saying to us that you want a continuation, then we would need to take that to the vote with the committee. Am I right in saying that? Uh, that would be correct, sorry, correct convener, and uh, it's just a suggestion to make to members because I think it's quite a complex matter that's been raised, and I think we would need to very clearly understand what we were trying to achieve with such a condition. Convener, it's okay for an amendment to come in if it's competent, but this this is not the case. You can't have somebody coming in to build uh, extra yeah, 500, houses, 500 houses, 500 houses in the future, by like 20 years' time, and then saying that this applicant here has to pay for a bridge. We don't even know the cost of it and the gradient works. It could be 14 million. So how could you put a price in? And we don't know if ScotRail would even agree because the communications that the council has done with ScotRail so far, and as I say, as I asked for the, the responses, was the fact that they, they don't uh, talk to people in a, in, in, at this stage. So we don't even know if, it, if, if the bridge was needed in the future that they would agree it. So as I say, and yet we're 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 talking here about 
what happens in 20 years' time or that? How, how can you hold this? It's relative to the application, fair and proportionate. And it, you can't ask this developer to pay it. It will rely on if another application comes in for that developer to pay the, the bridge if it's required, if it's agreed and by everybody. So I, I'm just getting frustrated here. Uh, Councillor McClucky, apologies, but uh, the convener's computer is is malfunctioning at the moment. Would it would all be in agreement to a five minute recess to allow us to speak to ICT to try to get that sorted out? Agree. Agree. Fair enough. Fair enough. Agree to a five minutes. minute. I agree to five, five minutes. Minute. Agree. Five minutes. Thank Ian, you. Can that allow for a further amendment to come forward as well in that part, in that point then while we're not here? If it, if an amendment uh, is is carried, then it is available. For, that essentially becomes the substantive motion, and it is available for a further. I think we we need to be careful that we don't sort of go around in in circles to some degree. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Convener. I'm just looking at our standing orders as we speak. So, as I've mentioned already, where notice has been given of a further amendment, that is competent. An amendment is noted as it must be relevant to the motion and it will be either to refer a subject of debate to a committee for consideration, not relevant in this case, to leave out words, to leave out words and insert or add words to add or insert words. But such omission, insertion, or addition must not have the effect of introducing new subject matter into or negating the motion before council uh, or before the committee. So I think this is relevant to the, the subject matter at discussion. It's the terms of uh, a section 75 agreement. So I think it's, it is competent uh, to consider an additional provision. I think once you start looking at the provision, it's a matter of some complexity. Uh, I've just been writing some notes here, and uh, I think you would want to time uh, bound this. So I'm not sure what an appropriate time scale may be. But I wonder if some wording would be something along the lines of if within a period of time, works of repair are required to the bridge, and these are related to the development. And would not have been necessary but for the development, uh, then uh, an appropriate sum, and I'm not sure how much that sum would be anticipated to be, uh, would be payable by the developer oblique landowner uh, to the council. Uh, Bernard, I don't know, or Brent, if you've got any thoughts that would enhance that or. Thanks, Ian. Um, I, I think uh, for me, the difficulty there is is the evidence that's available to us at this time. So we're, we're kind of dealing with a, a bit of an unknown there. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I haven't got any other suggestions beyond the wording that you've just suggested. I think that uh, for me um, generally captures the points that uh, I'm hearing being brought up. Yeah, I suppose it would be a proportionate contribution towards towards the costs would be made by the developer landowner. I think, as I've mentioned earlier, I think that it, that is the potential, and uh, we're kind of working in real time here that uh, the, the developer may be able to make an argument uh, that uh, a modification of the section seventy five could be successful to remove that wording, but that may be for another day. Okay. Well, you've heard the amendment, the proposed further amendment. You've heard that it's competent. So can we... If there's a vote? No, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Second, I'll second. Oh, sorry. Is that you? Councillor Murtagh. Okay. Would you know? Would you know, Councillor Hughes' uh, uh, amendment? No, it's my, it's no, my it's amendment, Jim. Sorry, sorry. So further, my, further my apologies, amendment. My apologies. My apologies. Thank you. Uh, yes, just to to try to sum up, uh, we have now as the substantive, uh, or we have as the motion, 
uh, and that is uh, in Councillor McClucky and Councillor Blackwood's original motion, which is now the substantive motion against which the further amendment. Uh, so I'm not proposing to read out the, the motion again in uh, its full detail, but the amendment is, as we've just discussed, that within a, a and it would be for the Director of Development Services to, to define the detail, but within a defined period of time, if works of repair are required to the bridge and these are related to the development and would not have been necessary, but for the development, uh, the developer oblique uh, owner would pay a proportionate contribution towards the cost uh, that would require to be paid for carrying out these works of uh, repair. Uh, so on a, the basis of a roll call vote, uh, Councillor Alexander. Abstain. Thank you. Uh, Provost Buchanan. Motion. Councillor Blackwood. A motion. Councillor Bowes. Amendment. Councillor Goldie. Motion. Councillor Hughes. The amendment. <clears throat> Councillor Kerr. The motion. Councillor McHugh. For the amendment. Councillor McClucky. Motion. Councillor Murta. Amendment. Councillor Nicol. For the motion. Councillor Nimmo. For the motion. We have seven for the motion, four for the amendment, and one abstention. The motion is duly carried. Thank you, convener. Okay, thanks for that, colleagues. The uh, item 10, election of the dwelling house uh, at the air for Mr. Tom Smith. Do we have any deputations requests for this? No, convener, there's no deputations for uh, either of the last two applications. Okay. Can we hear a report from, from Mr. Brown, please? Thank you, convener. Um, this application is for planning permission and principle. It proposes the erection of a single dwelling house within the rear garden area of number six Fairfields, uh, just to, off of the Moss Road at Earth. Um, the proposals include the creation of a shared access road between number five and number six Fairfields. Uh, members will note that item 11 on today's agenda uh, is a very similar application, which relates to a similar proposal for a single dwelling house in the rear garden of number five, Fairfields, uh, which is a property that would share the access road. The consultation process on this application uh, has not generated any objections from uh, standard consultees. And during the course of the application, one letter of representation has been received an objection to the proposal. The terms of the objection uh, received are outlined in full within paragraph 6.1 of the report. Uh, and addressed in paragraph 7b6 to 7b13 of the report. Whilst a number of different issues are raised by the objections, uh, the objection received, the main point uh, referred to is it relates to the, to the fact that the proposal is contrary to the development plan. Uh, indeed, it is accepted that the proposal is contrary to the development plan, uh, primarily in relation to country, the development in the countryside policies, um, whereby there is no support for the form of development proposed. In this instance, however, it's felt that the um, weight should be given to material considerations in the form of the characteristics of the site and the surrounding area. The application site is located within a, a well-established area of garden ground, which benefits from well-defined boundaries. The land to the south of the site and within Stirling Council's boundary has been extensively developed in recent years, which has in turn altered the character of the area consider considerably. The area now reads as an established grouping of uh, buildings within the countryside at this location. The proposal would essentially represent a rounding off of this grouping of buildings at this location and would not contribute towards sporadic development in the countryside. The proposal, whilst contrary to the development plan, would not set an undesirable precedent for future development in the countryside and is, considered to, uh, and is not considered to undermine or erode the strength of the development plan in this instance at this location. As a result, the officer recommendation in this case is to grant planning permission in principle. Thank you, convener. Yeah, thank you for that. I, 
Any questions in, from the floor? Any? Thanks, Marta. Laura. Yeah, thanks, convener. Um, as you were saying, uh, Kevin, this is in um, my ward, but only just, uh, in fact, only just within the Falkirk Council boundary and over the, the other side is in Stirling. So one of my questions is that when it comes to consultation, and obviously this is a Falkirk Council and advertised to the Falkirk Herald and all that kind of thing, you know, in our planning processes, what is the situation for, for the other, for, consult, for those in the Stirling um, boundary? Do they do they get notified? Is there a process just to make sure that there's been complete transparency from that point of view? What is the process here? Neighbour notification is carried out as standard. Uh, there's a buffer essentially drawn around the site, and um, with uh, the ability with the any adjoining landowners notified. Um, I don't have the details in front of me. This this application may well have also been advertised in the local press as well. It should have been, um, given the the lack of adjoining neighbours to the north, for instance. Um, so the, the, the process is standard as it, as it would be um, for an application which was um, well within the Falkirk Council boundary. The, na the neighbours have had an opportunity to comment on the application. I suppose my, my concern is also, it's not so much just from a neighbour notification, you know, that regardless of how close they what, what district they would be, you know, the, 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 the meterage wouldn't change. But um, this is a particularly complicated bit of strip of ground because it kind of goes the moss road it intersects it goes in and goes out it goes in and goes out of both the ward and obviously the Falkirk and Stirling council area which we know to our cost through the road repair situations which occur constantly um and i think that my concern is is to make sure that um all all appropriate views are are, are gathered but it's also because the road because of the situation on the road and i certainly if this was a if this was a, a brand new application for a brand new settlement, um, I would be asking very serious questions of roads officers in terms of suitability for siting uh, any kind of housing on that part of the Moss Road, and indeed have traffic surveys at the moment that are, have been come back because uh, road safety and and speed um, and visibility are all issues. And I think the thing is that because there are a number of houses there already, um that adding a couple of houses doesn't, you know, it's one of these things we've had these in other applications where, um, you know, say, well, if it's already there, um, is it really going to add a significant amount of volume? But um, my concern um, is that residents regularly read how, how, how dangerous they feel that, that that turning is in the first place. And therefore that's a consideration. Uh, what did the roads colleagues in general, I mean, I think I'm quite interested to know if, if this had been, a, you know, if this was a new, application what they would think and is it just that because there's an additional such a small scale that it, it doesn't figure what the roads think of the lost roads and the will to live oh still here still here can you hear me okay can hear you. Yeah. take my camera a minute to wake up there um our, our comment back to planning on this application was pretty standard for rural development um or you know of, of sort of small scale housing in, in the rural setting and what we said was that the vehicular traffic generated by a single dwelling house would be unlikely to significantly affect the public road network however the development could introduce or increase pedestrian traffic on moss road as there's no footwear lighting provision in the general area the introduction or intensification of pedestrian movements on moss road would not be considered to be in the best interests of road safety yeah i, I tend to agree I, I, I understand what mr brown was saying about it not setting precedent because it's like it's it's like finishing you're saying it's finishing off an existing site so it's not if we it is against the policy on housing in the countryside um, my concern is that given it's against local development plan policy i'm not sure what actually does override that you know the, the need to have additional housing in this area and i take the point that it might only round it off but it's still extension for not no reason that i can see why um it overrides what's in our local development plan. So I'm very reluctant to, to support that. So I wonder why, if Mr. Brink can kind of develop why he thinks that there's there's a lot more ground around that area. Um, and there's also this the sort of, there's another road to the side as well. Um, and I suppose it's what 
what guarantee is there that if we just add another and add another? Because the reason seemed to be that, well, it's now an established site. So, you know, but if we take that out in every case of housing in the countryside, we're just going to end up with creeping on and adding on and adding on everywhere. And, and I think that's something we have to be really careful of. Yeah, I would agree. And I, I think that um, there's no doubt that this is a, I suppose a finely balanced proposal um, in, in the sense that it is contrary to the terms of the development plan. Um, the thoughts in terms of the material considerations and the amount of weight to give to those um, relate, as I said previously, to the amount of development that's happened to the south within the Stirling Council area, but also to the, to the characteristics of the site itself. It's well defined um, in terms of its boundaries by, on, on obviously, on the, the eastern side of it is the existing Fairfields development. On the south is the the the, the Stirling Council uh, boundary area, which has got um, houses developed on it. To the to the west is a, a I think it's an old um, mineral railway, which has um, got planting along uh, its length. Um, and then to to the north, there is actually no further housing development at all to the north at that at that section. So I think any the only the only other potential area that you could see it potentially spilling out and uh, and and encroaching further within the countryside was if we were to achieve, uh, receive an application for something else to the north. In that case, I think that would represent a form of ribbon development, which is is is, is quite clearly um, at, at odds with the, the the terms of the development plan there in terms of what we're seeking to 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 to. Um, protect in the countryside setting. Um, I don't know if that goes to any way to, to, to shed some more light on your concerns. To be honest, having, having obviously quite detailed knowledge of, of the area, there's, there's actually a number of developments as you progress up and, and they tend to dip in Falkirk and then Stirling and then Falkirk and then Stirling. So it, although I, I can see that it's not necessarily going to join up on that site, my concern is that the Moss Road and given that the, the situation with the Moss Road that by saying, well, if you then say, well, this one's got three houses or two houses and then the next one and the next one, that it is going to set a precedent or it is going to set an, in a chain. And for that reason, I'm, I'm minded to move refusal because I don't think that um, the mitigating factors that override the development plan policy have been sufficiently met from my point of view um, to, to, to be comfortable with us just with us overriding it, basically. Okay, the uh, so you made a refusal. Yeah. Anyone do I just support that? Yes. The uh Councillor Kerr. Thanks. Thanks, convener. Uh, I think nice this is what uh, Laura saying regarding uh, and she made a, a great point at the start where that the if this was a, a new development with near the houses with about it you would be very severe doubts. But there's a red house there. This is one more house. Uh, I'm quite satisfied with uh, Kevin's uh, gave us a reason to defer for the local development plan. So I would okay. put an amendment in that I'd support the, the, the officer's recommendation, convener. Okay, we've got a motion to support the officer's recommendations. Moved and seconded. We have a seconder for, for the, the motion, which is to... Councillor Goldie. You're mute. I'm happy to second the amendment in a mannerly way. Thank you, Convener. Anyone else? Can I second Councillor Murta, please, in a refusal? Because there is another house coming up in the next application. Councillor Nemo, Convener. Can we have a party? Party? just ask a, a question? It's just on the back of what Laura was saying earlier on there. When it comes to developments that are right on the, the border, 
how does Stirling Council notify of notify us and the, the local people? How do they notify them of a development that's coming from Stirling? Do they have to come through Falkirk Council or do they go to the residents direct? In instances where an application straddles the, the, the boundary, um, there would have to be um, a consultation between the two authorities direct between the planning authorities. For applications which are um, within a singular council area, um, uh, the, the normal neighbour notification procedures uh, apply. Uh, in this instance, for instance, the, there's an, an application immediately to the south of the, the item 11 uh, in the Stirling Council area from 2019, whereby the, the neighbours around about the site were, were notified of that, but, but Falkirk Council as planning department weren't commenting on it. Right, so Stirling okay. Council would notify these people direct by letter. Yes. Right. Okay. I was just curious. I wasn't sure how the, how that went. Thanks. That's a good question. The um. Uh, Convener Councillor McHugh. Councillor McHugh, yeah. Just going on for what Alan was saying there. Does that mean that there could be development on the Stirling side that we don't know anything about? So that's further uh, houses within that road. I would hope that, that would be not the case. Uh, Karen, do you, you anything you want to add to that? Um, uh, it would be, I think, within Stirling Council's uh, uh, choice at that point to whether to co consult us on the application. I suppose it depends on proximity and scale of the development. Um, I would need to check what the, the, the regulations were in terms of neighbour notification for another authority, depending on the scale of development and so on. But the neighbour notification process would, would apply ir irrespective of where the boundary sits. Um, so that the, the, the neighbours to, to each site would still receive notification of the application and have the ability to comment to whichever uh, local authority it was that, that was assessing the application. Okay, not over that. Okay, anyone else? Have we got the vote? Ian? Thank you, yes, convener. Uh, we have a motion by Councillor Murta, and I'll just read out what uh, I understood the motion to be. The motion is that the committee agree to refuse the application as the proposed development is contrary to the terms of policy HCO5 housing in the countryside of the local development plan two and Scottish planning policy and it is not considered that material considerations outweigh the development plan. And that was seconded by Councillor Bouse. We then have an amendment by Councillor Kerr, seconded by Councillor Goldie, to grant permission in accordance with officers' recommendations. Uh, Councillor Alexander? For the motion. Provost Buchanan. I'm going to grant. So is that the amendment? The, the amendment is grant as per officers' recommendations. Thanks, Provost. Thank you. So that's amendment. Uh, Councillor Blackwood. Amendment. Councillor Bowes. The motion. Councillor Goldie. Amendment. And Councillor Hughes. Motion. Councillor Kerr. Amendment. Councillor McHugh. Motion. Councillor McClucky. Amendment. <coughs> Councillor Murta. The motion. Councillor Nicol. The amendment. Councillor Nimmo. Amendment. I have five votes for the motion and seven for the amendment. The amendment is duly carried. Thank you, convener. Yeah, thank you. Final item. Is a similar item to, to that one. Thank you, convener. Yes, this this item is essentially the sister to the to item uh, ten. Uh, it's an application again for planning permission principle for a single dwelling house within the rear garden of number five Fairfields this time round. Uh, again, located to the to, to the side of Moss Road and Earth. 
Uh, the proposal includes an access road, which will be shared again with the, with the property to, to it's, it's immediately adjoining neighbour number six. Um, as with the previous item, the consultation process uh, hasn't generated any uh, formal objections from consultees. In terms of representations, this application has generated the receipt of one neutral letter of representation uh, during the course of the application and similar to the previous app, uh, application. The, the uh, has also received one letter of objection, the main focus of which, uh, once again, being the, the non compliance with the development plan. Um, the application again is uh, assessed as being contrary to the development plan. However, as with the previous item, um, the, the same material considerations apply in this instance, uh, and it's felt that these material considerations outweigh the, the, the the development plan in this instance, uh, and with this in mind, the officer recommendation is to to committee is to grant plan of permission in principle. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone on the floor? Can I um, just say, I, I don't wish to put the committee through another vote or prolong the thing when when it's the same essentially the same item uh, situation as before. Just that perhaps Mr. Henson, no, we've noted um, dissent or or before. Just to have the same concerns in in respect to this application as I did the previous. Um, in terms of the local development plan, housing in the countryside, and particularly uh, road safety uh, and setting precedents. So, if the committee can just record that rather than having to go to another vote, I'd be grateful. I think at the moment, uh, convener, we, we don't uh, actually have a motion one way or another that can be the basis of a general agreement. Well, I'm been, not going to move it. Who's been suggested? Is that uh, the concerns be transferred over, but not moved as a motion, just transferred and noted? Uh, are all members of the committee agreeable to to replicating agreed. what happened in the last item? Agreed. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much for your attendance, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, look forward to the next one.